Good morning, everybody. Lovely to see you all here bright and early uh, this morning. They, um, we're here for a day on the future of the UK economy and economic policy, and it's great in that context to see a lot of very friendly faces in the room. I can even see the back row here for the, the naughty ones. They, um, so it's lovely to see lots of friendly faces here. They, um, there's one face, of course, that we won't see, and I'm sure many people in this room, I'm looking around the room again, people that would have been expected to see, but we won't see Alistair Darling, obviously, this morning, who we lost last week. And um, we, there were lots of lovely things said about him and written about him over the course of the last few days. I'm not going to repeat those things, and I'm sure lots more will be said about that amongst you all in the coffee breaks uh, later on. But one thing I was going to say on the topic of today and it's one of the key lessons I took away from working with Alistair over the years, is that economic policy isn't some abstract game. It's not about your fancy charts, although I'm going to show you lots of those, I promise, in a second. It's not about your theories. It's about the bread and butter of people's lives. Then when he was worried about the banks back in 2008, his first thought was always, what happens to ordinary people who can't go into the shops and make the payment for, those, for their goods that day for the weekly shop. It was those kind of things that were the core and the front of mind. He was much more interested in that than he ever was in the abstract discussions of fiscal rules. In fact, I can see several people in this room who were thrown out of meetings with him as chancellor on abstract discussions of fiscal rules because he wanted it to stop, the, um, uh, the, which is probably a good lesson for all of us. But don't worry, we're going to come back to those abstract fiscal rules um, uh, later. So I just wanted to start there and say, keeping that in mind, keeping that the objective ultimately of economic policy is ordinary families' living standards, their jobs, their homes, their quality of life, that is what it is about, the, um, and that is what today ultimately is all about. So that's what I wanted to start with. The, um, uh, my name, by the way, is Torsten Bell. I'm the chief exec of the Resolution Foundation. The, um, this is the welcome to the day. You're shortly going to get a welcome from the Resolution Foundation, from the LSE, and from the Nuffield Foundation, that's what you call inflation. That's only one welcome in 2020 prices, the, um, but that is what you are going uh, to get shortly. Just to give you a bit of heads up about what you're going to get from the day as a whole, the, um, we're going to give you some headlines in the first full session about what is in the final report of the Economy 2030 inquiry ending stagnation. I hope you've all picked up a copy downstairs. If it does damage to your back, you have signed a waiver uh, and you can't be suing us later. And then we're going to break down everything that's in that report in some discussions with some of the leading economic policymakers of our day and then also in session. So you're first of all going to hear a discussion with the Chancellor of the Exchequer, with Zanny minton Beddoes, the editor of The Economist. Then we're going to focus on growth because it would be nice to have some. Then we're going to focus on what it would actually take to get inequality down rather than talk about getting inequality down. Then, yes, you will be allowed some lunch because life's tough. Then... Uh, and in fact, you won't be allowed some lunch at that point. Then you will get to hear about um, uh, getting the course down. Then after the lunch, you're going to hear from the leader of the Labour Party, Sir Keir Starmer, again with Zanny. And then lastly, we're going to touch on a slightly unusual topic at these kind of conversations, but one that is central to the work of the Economy 2030 inquiry, which is economic change, which has become absent from too much of our economic policy debate, what is the kind of economy we're trying to build, how are we trying to shape it, and where do we look like we're going in the future, uh, and then we're going to wrap up uh, and have a coffee. Hopefully that's what you're all vaguely expecting from today, and I'm hoping that the inflation of the number of speakers doesn't diminish their quality. Every single one of these panels is stuffed full of people that I would come along to hear them individually give a lecture, so I hope you're going to enjoy that. I won't introduce them all today, but there are lots of them along with the named ones uh, here, you've all got the pamphlet naming them uh, on. The, um, and I'm hoping that the quality of those speakers and hopefully the quality of the book that we've been handing you all is a reflection of why there's such a brilliant quantity and quality of the audience here today. But it's also a reflection of how big the problems facing the country are. Like, nobody thinks the last 15 years is what success looks like. But through today, I think it's important we focus not just on the problems but on the solutions and on Britain's strengths. The exam question for this project is how do you harness those strengths rather than how do you just get more depressed about the solution. So we're going to focus on that and we're going to focus on the big picture. What are the big choices that you need to make as a country? What are the big trade-offs? Yes, what are the constraints, but what are the opportunities uh, too? So to kick us off, you're first of all going to hear from Clive Cowdery, who is the man that founded the Resolution Foundation because there was an absence of hard-headed economic analysis focused on the living standards of lower middle income 
households. And then he's going to bring up Alex Beer, who has been a huge support from the Nuffield Foundation for this project, obviously financially. Anyone else wishing to support the Resolution Foundation financially is also very welcome uh, today. But Alex has been the leader in that regard, but she's also been a huge support for this project intellectually. And then you're going to hear from Steve Machen, who's the director of the Centre for Economic Performance, who's our partner on this project. And there could not be a better partner to have had both from him and the entire CEP team over the last three years. So, Clive, over to you to kick us off. Here's some photos. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to formally welcome you to the start of today's conference. Uh, and I'm just casting my mind back over the last two and a half years. We do have a very ambitious agenda today, and it builds on the work of the last two and a half years of, of our inquiries uh, researchers. Today, we need to make the move from identifying problems to coming up with and committing to realistic solutions for Britain's stagnation. You know, two and a half years ago, I recorded the launch video for this particular inquiry uh, in an empty room at home because, of course, we were all under COVID restrictions. That is to say, unless you were partying at number 10. As I look forward then from that two and a half years over the last period of time of work, our last moment we gathered together to think about how this work was going was around 15 months ago and was in this very centre. And we launched our interim report. And those of you recalling it will remember it had a rather sober title. It was Stagnation Nation. And the reason is because what we did at the inquiry is we divided our work in two. We spent the first half of our time together studying the real root causes that stem from Britain's economic history as to why we have ended up where we are today and tried to take an assessment, a sober assessment, of where we sat in relative terms against other countries. Those of you that were gathering your coffee downstairs, just as we were coming into this room, will recall seeing charts down there reminding us of one of the key findings of that interim report, at which we showed that a proxy for Britain's economy, a country made up loosely of, of Germany, France, the Netherlands, Canada, and Australia, compared to our own productivity and levels of inequality, had streamed ahead of us in the last 15 years, and that a gap had developed. And what we stated in this very conference room some 15 months ago was we wanted to find a way now that we understood the size of that gap in closing it. And so what we've done in the last 15 months is focus specifically on practical, as Torsten referred to them, hard-headed trade-offs and choices that our country is going to have to make in order to address that gap. So it's a real pleasure now to stand in front of 500 living, breathing souls rather than just a, a video camera uh, and talk about how we can move forward on the basis of real economic study and industrial policy. The insights and the proposals that you will hear outlined here today are the distillation of the 70 reports that we've published over that two and a half years. It's also the outcome of scores of events that we've held and countless conversations that we've had across the regions and the nations of the UK. We've been talking with the public, we've been talking with policymakers, and we've been talking with civil society at large. It's left me with a view that we are a rich country. That's not just an economic statement. There are countless groups working in towns and cities across our country that I did not know two and a half years ago who are working on issues of, of growth, of transport, of housing, of the quality of jobs. And we've had the benefit of engaging with many of them over this last two and a half years. Now, this whole inquiry, given the size and scale and ambition of it, has come out of a major collaboration between ourselves at the Resolution Foundation with the Centre for Economic Performance at the London School of Economics, and as Torson said, generously supported with foundation, by the Nuffield Foundation uh, in our work over the last two and a half years. So I'd like to thank both of those organisations, you'll hear from them in a moment, as to their re rationale and motivation for getting involved in this inquiry. We could only pull something of this scale off because of the strength of our partners. I'd also like to thank the Resolution Foundation's inquiry team. Some we added for this work over the last two and a half years. Others were part of our main team's mainstream staff that have been part of Resolution Foundation's mission for the last 18 months to improve the living standards of low to middle income households in Britain. Thank you all for your hard work. Uh, and also, of course, our superstar commissioners, those who work very, very hard to comment and critique. I was surprised, given the size and scale of the names we were able to get to work with us, how many of them turned up for absolutely every debate and discussion, uh, some of them uh, from abroad. 
Finally, I'd like to thank our expert advisory group. We're very keen on rigorous academic work at Resolution, and therefore we subject our work as we are developing it to commentary from others. And so an expert advisory group has worked alongside the inquiry for the last two and a half years, where subject matter experts have both commented and critiqued our work. And of course, many of those people have also written some of the 70 reports that, uh, that you've seen published under the name of the inquiry. Now, this inquiry has taught us a lot. It's taught us a lot about our economy's past. It's definitely shaped, sharpened our understanding of the current, present challenges we have as a country and the very clear, decisive choices we're going to have to make in what is actually a decisive decade for Britain. As we said in the last time we gathered here together 15 months ago, we have now had around 15 years of stagnation. If we fail to act, that will become a quarter century and possibly that relative decline will become irreversible. That is not the case today. This decisive decade needs grasping, and needs grasping with a sense of grounded optimism, realism, but grounded optimism about the future. So my ask of you today is please that you share your own thoughts, that you engage with the proposals in this report, and that you find a way to help us take this agenda forward. Please do enjoy the conference. I'll be returning at the end of the day to summarize our key findings and make sure that we all commit to the, the path ahead. Uh, before I do that, let me hand over to uh, Alex Beer, the welfare lead at the Nelfield Foundation. Alex. Thank you very much, Clive, and uh, welcome from me as well. The Nuffield Foundation, where I work, is delighted to be funding the Economy 2030 Inquiry, which is one of our large-scale strategic grants. Now, in case you're not as familiar with the Nuffield Foundation as you might be with the Resolu Resolution Foundation or the London School of Economics, we are an independent charitable trust with a mission to improve the lives of individuals, families, and communities through the research and innovation that we fund. We also founded and co-fund the Nuffield Council on Bioethics, the Ada Lovelace Institute, and the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory. Now, when the initial application for an inquiry into the British economic model was first made to us four years ago next week, its premise was that the institutions, mechanisms, and strategies that seek to underpin growth and shared prosperity in the UK were unmoored. That despite the economy's ongoing strengths, the country lacked a clear sense of how to succeed in the 21st century, including how to adapt to change. The challenge, as it was framed in the proposal, was how to adjust to leaving the EU, transition towards net zero, the stagnation since financial crash, and the demographic challenge of an aging population. We funded what became the Economy 2030 Inquiry because the scale and ambition of its programme of work aligned with our aims to address the big policy challenges and to influence and inform social policy during a period of rapid change and uncertainty. In 2020, during the application process, COVID reared its head, but how little we knew then about the further, to, further shocks to the economy and to society that we would subsequently have to face with war in Ukraine and the cost of living crisis. These have all further demonstrated the weakness of the UK economy, which is felt by us all, but all the more keenly by those at the bottom of the income distribution. Now, I doubt the team garner much pleasure from being quite so prescient about the need to fix the UK's economic model. Their forensic research has since highlighted stalled progress, precarity in the labour market, geographical inequalities, low investment, and fanciful thinking about trade deals. Some of these findings are complemented by other work that the Nuffield Foundation funds. The IFS Deaton Review exposes the many dimensions in which inequalities exist, including gender, ethnicity, and health. And looking more specifically at how the labor market might change, we have the Pissarides Review of the Future of Work, uh, supported by the Institute for the Future of Work, and Skills Imperative 2035, led by the National Foundation for Economic for education research. It has been great to see the shared learning from across these grants. The inquiry's focus on inclusive growth could therefore not be more timely. 
It has delivered a clear and coherent vision for a long-term economic strategy, which, as we've already heard, um, has people and places at its heart. Because while we've pride ourselves in supporting rigorous statistical research, you know, as Alistair Darling would have said, it's ultimately about people and their lives. And the inquiry made sure that it never lost that focus. They sustained regular engagement with people across the UK, and particularly the citizens of Manchester and Birmingham. The inquiry's findings highlight the importance of sustained investment in skills, of good jobs and labour market regulation, and a social security system that doesn't let people fall even further behind. It provides the keys that could unlock the huge potential of Britain's second cities, and it does not shy away from the trade-offs that this entails. I'm really looking forward to the discussion of the UK's challenges and opportunities in the sessions that follow, which I'm sure will provide the Nuffield Foundation with plenty of food for thought as we develop our funding priorities for the next five years. This project has vindicated our approach of backing big, ambitious ideas, and we're open to doing more. I would also like to extend a huge thanks to everyone that's been involved, to Torsten Bell, Steve Machen, the teams at the Resolution Foundation and the Centre for Economic Performance at the LSE, who have worked so incredibly hard and made this possible. I also had on my list you know, the Commission, the advisory group, uh, and all those that have provided specific research and expertise along the way, and not least the many individuals who engaged in a personal capacity, sharing their lives and hopes and fears for the economy with the inquiry. Thanks also to those that are going to be contributing today, including you all both here and online. I encourage you all to think in terms of the framework for the future that the inquiry provides. The report could be used to pick a mix, a variety of potential policy options, but that is not the point. Success will be achieved if future governments can be persuaded to adopt a holistic strategy for the long term that is as serious about reducing inequality as it is about promoting economic growth. Ultimately, that would set us on a route to shared prosperity for the UK. Hope you enjoy the day and over to Steve. Thanks, thanks, Clive and Alex. Um, uh, it's, it's been a very exciting uh, uh, journey, I think, on uh, working uh, on the Economy 2030 uh, inquiry, uh, which is the joint venture that's taken place between CEP and the uh, Resolution Foundation over the past uh, two and a half years. It's been a real experience, I think, with challenging aims and actually a rather different uh, and much wider reaching uh, uh, research project compared to a lot of what we've done over the years at, at, at the LSE. Um, I'm pretty sure it will deliver on our bread and butter activities of publishing, uh, top, uh, publishing in top academic journals. Um, but that's really uh, not the only thing it's all about. It's produced a much, much uh, uh, more practical set of outputs, I think. I think it's been a fairly unique uh, uh, path-breaking collaboration. Uh, and uh, I think it's been rather different to other research projects. And I'm really very grateful to Nuffield for actually giving us the opportunity to do this because it's been very different from many other kind of uh, research ventures that certainly I've been involved with. Um, so underlying the inquiry has been a main motivation about the ineffectiveness of, uh, of policy to tackle or maybe halt or maybe even reverse the economic stagnation and inequality that's ca characterised uh, the last 40 years or so. Um, in this country and elsewhere, elsewhere in the world. Uh, the idea has been, I think the prime idea has been to try and think about a means to uh, improve uh, Britain's economic model uh, in that light uh, by being very evidence-based and by trying to think about the way in which uh, there's been a relative failure uh, of many policies over the last uh, 15 years of stagnation and over the last 40 years of uh, reaching higher inequality levels uh, than, 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 than were present um, back then. Uh, so the project had two phases, just very quickly. Phase one was about doing lots of new research uh, on a large number of issues, including growth and its drivers, inequality and economic change for people, places and firms, international trade, the labor market and the tax system, and spatial inequalities, amongst others. Um, uh, you, you, you know, um, it's kind of... Uh, 
produced a lot of, uh, a lot of findings. Uh, you can see uh, the phase two was then moving to the kind of policy questions and trying to think about a more coherent way of, of, define, of defining policy. You can see we're necessarily, and it's necessarily chunky, uh, the report that, that, that uh, Torsten was saying might give people back problems if they, if it, certainly if they pick up two of them uh, going through. So phase two is tried to, take, to go forward with a project in a very ambitious way, I think, to try and think about how we can develop a better evidence-based and more credible policy setup to improve outcomes, uh, certainly for the rest of this decade up, up to 20, 2030, uh, and, and trying to think about how, how we can do this. Um, I mean, it's, it's um, you know, many, many of the observed changes we've seen in terms of inequality, uh, and economic stagnation, uh, both in terms of wages and productivity, real wages and, and productivity, have, have, very, have very much gone too far. Uh, something needs to be done. Uh, and this has become even more pressing, and I'm, I'm, I'm a bit sad to say that it's rather overdue, well overdue, that we're actually trying to think about these things. It would have been nice had we done a 2020 uh, inquiry before, had we thought about uh, uh, doing that. Uh, but that's, um, you know, it, it's very important that we need to think about how we can reverse the declines that have been so damaging for the economy uh, in, 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 in the past uh, 15 years with stagnation and the past 40 years with uh, very uh, unequal uh, living standards. Okay, so the equality, so just, just to wrap up, the, the inquiry has been a deep probing investigation, and I think it's underpinning research activity uh, and the, hopefully the development of a realistic and credible strategy framework for doing economic policy design and implementation is a really important move to try and um, push things forward uh, and, and try to develop a better uh, promise for the UK economy. Uh, it seems to me that it doesn't stop here, of course. This is an ongoing process. We really need to go. And I do hope, and I really believe it can, this can be true, but the legacy of the inquiry is going to be a UK economy uh, that successfully delivers growth and better, uh, less unequal living standards, both for the rest of the decade, but also beyond uh, 2030 as well. Uh, I'll wrap up and hand back to Torsten now, who's going to uh, lead the proceedings. Right, the, um, uh, I know it's been traumatic. You've turned up at a Resolution Foundation event. Nobody has showed you a slide. This is a clear breach of trade descriptions and all the rest. Don't worry, there's a lot of slides coming. Everyone, there's a large book. You've got 300 pages. You've got 76 slides. I'm not got charts even. I'm not going to show you all of them, but I'm going to, in this session, just give you the headlines of what is this strategy. So the policies, the individual bits of policy to underpin bits of it are in the book, and we're going to cover those in the session. But this is a chance just for us to step back and say what overall is the book trying to uh, say. So for, I'm going to do not much on the problem, because hopefully most of it, everybody in this room and watching online uh, knows. And if they don't know because they work on these kind of issues, they know because they live in a country going through those issues. The, um, uh, but briefly to rehearse, the economy used to grow. It isn't growing as much anymore. So this is showing you 10-year uh, growth rates of GDP per capita. Uh, hot, you know, maybe declining slightly, but basically hovering around the 25% mark per 10 years over the course of most of the 1970s through to 2010, and then cratering after the financial crisis. The, um, now, one thing I will say, maybe if I'm in Bath or Bristol, uh, is the degrowth has got what they wanted. Yeah? The, um, I'm going to go through most of the parts of the country and be rude about them over the course of the next... <laughs> But the degrowth has got what they wanted. The thing I then say to people is the lesson should be that is a very, very bad thing because GDP per capita is not some abstract measure. I know it's very fashionable to say whose GDP is it, who cares. The answer is it's all of our GDPs because this is what happened to wages as a result. The um, wages today, the same level they were when we went into the financial crisis. To make that even more concrete, if anyone's still thinking, no, but this, this growth thing is overrated... This is what it's actually done to actual wages. Northern Rock goes bust. Actually, just after Northern Rock goes bust. No growth since then. Had we carried on growing at the rate of wage growth we saw before the financial crisis, average pay would now be £10,000 higher per worker. When you go into a cost of living crisis where you're paying £1,000 extra per household for your energy, you could have done with that £10,000. There is a large part of the motivation. When people, when people say growth doesn't matter, maybe it doesn't for them. It definitely does for the country as a whole. 
Right, it's not the only thing that matters. And one of the key insights from this project is that the intersection of slow growth, which is mainly a feature of the last 15 years, half the productivity growth seen across advanced economies. Yes, advanced economies have slowed down, but we've slowed down more than everybody else. We are world beating at that. The, um, that intersects with longer lasting high inequality. This is showing you one measure of inequality, the Gini coefficient. We're not going to talk about what that is, I promise. I'm also not going to talk about the bumps around in it, even though some of us care about those a lot. I'm just showing you that income inequality in Britain surges during the 1980s into the early 90s. And despite what you sometimes hear from uh, some parts of lefty academia world, it's not constantly rising since, it's just too high. It stayed roughly the same since ever since. The, um, the most unequal large economy in Europe. And the most important thing is to put together that high inequality with that slow growth. And it gives you this, what we call the toxic combination. And it's toxic for lower middle income households. So first complicated chart, just focus on the middle for a second. It's showing you <coughs> relative incomes of middle income households relative to the UK in, in Germany in blue, the Netherlands in whatever that is, yellow, France in red, and Italy in green. I've added Italy to make us all feel better. <laughs> the, um, but broadly, French households, middle income households are now 9% richer than middle income British households. German households are 20% richer. It's not 2%, it's 20. And we're showing you this because I think most people think of those countries as things we're similar to. But we are not anymore. Then add in the high inequality, focus on the left. The typical poor household, tw bottom 20% this is talking about, in Britain uh, is now 27%, sorry, the typical poor household in France and Germany is 27% higher than in Britain. That's about 4,500 pounds on their incomes. Again, why can't people cope with the cost of living crisis pushing up the cost of essentials and energy bills? Because they're much poorer than their equivalents in France and Germany. They're not a bit poorer, they're far poorer. That is why, if you care about inequality, you should care about the lack of growth. If you care about the lack of growth, you should care about the high inequality. We've got to deal with both of them. To make that concrete, poor, poorer Britain in 2006 spent about half its budget on essentials. When we went into the cost of living crisis, they were spending nearly 60%. So the margin of adjustment of cutting luxury spending had already been reduced before we headed into a cost of living crisis that is basically a cost of essentials crisis. That's why you end up with food bank usage going through the roof. The margin for adjustment is just not big enough in a country that isn't growing and is not sharing that wealth out. We're going to come back to this issue later. Right. The, um, then one of the things we've been pushing ourselves on in this project is to say, look, we're not just going to write another load of papers about a lot of things that we already write lots of papers about. I mean, we are going to do that, obviously. But that's not all we're going to do. The, um, we're going to force ourselves to say, what does it tell us? How do you think in terms of an economic strategy? What's different about an economic strategy from another economic policy paper or another diagnosis of something in the labor market? I'm just going to flag some things about the way in which we've approached that. The first is to talk about what we've not done. The, um, so part of the danger for Britain even after we've all accepted things aren't going great, which I think basically everybody has. I don't think anyone, there's a reason why Rishi Sunak is telling people he's the change. There's a reason why Keir Starmer later will, I'm sure, tell you all he's the change. It's because nobody thinks the status quo is tip top, right? The question is, are we serious about changing it? And a lot of the problem is that we are not serious. So there's some examples of not serious here. The, um, we're not serious either, because that's a bit harsh, everyone. This is a serious conference. The, we're not serious because we think that silver bullets will solve this all for us. A few tax cuts, or quite large tax cuts, that will sort it. Then, or we think, I really want the net zero transition to happen. I'm basically going to tell myself that will solve all the other problems as well. Worried about inequality? Do the net zero transition. Worried about slow growth? Do the net zero transition. Now, we should probably save the planet. So I'm assuming most people here would like us to deliver on our net zero credentials. We should do that. It needs to be central to an economic strategy, but its main effect on GDP levels is to change the nature of GDP. More investment, less consumption, rather than to raise the level of GDP, or indeed to crush it, as some of the uh, now rebranded cynics who don't deny net zero but just say everything's impossible and can't be done. The, um, yeah, and that is a danger, because if you think that, you don't deal with any of the other problems. Then just to be unfair on business, while I'm being unfair on people, like, there is a lot of money to be made in running ESG conferences. Anyone from a business been to an ESG conference? Yeah, it, they need stopping. The, um, 
a load of people sit down in a posh hotel and tell each other, if we just report on things really well, really good reporting, environmental, social, the rest, then inequality will go down. As if some of the like economic, I mean, I'm not a Marxist, but like economic structures do matter a bit, and so do pounds and pence in people's pockets. You don't get inequality down by a load of posh bankers sitting in a conference centre, unfortunately, for the bankers. They, um, so that is not what being serious about an economic strategy looks like. So what have we done instead? Focus on path dependency. You're not writing an abstract economic strategy for any given advanced economy in any given time. We're focusing on Britain in the 2020s, Britain as it actually exists, and Britain as it could plausibly be. And those are tough tests to put on yourselves, right? It's not about wishing you were like somebody else, another country. That's also true as people, by the way. I know that's hard to accept, but we are who we are, and you can't change it very much. The, um, then we focused on trade-offs. We've tried to elevate those and be clear about the trade-offs we're wrestling with, and we're trying to offer you a strategy. So that means showing how things join up. How does your tax policy fit with the fact that you'd like to have some more investment and help you pay for it, for example, but lots of others? Okay, then, so that is how what we think we are trying to add value on. Right, then the short version of what I'm going to tell you about is there's three basic elements to this. How do we get serious about raising growth in an economy that's not growing? How do we get serious about reducing inequality in a country that hasn't managed to do that for the last four decades? And I think most people have kind of decided it just can't be done. High inequality is just like the weather. It's kind of, you know, what happens? We'd like it to stop raining, but we've met Britain. It doesn't. How do we do uh, that? And then lastly, how do we bring considerations of economic change back into thinking about economic strategies? Because the only real discussion of economic change nowadays in Britain is, oh my God, it's really fast and scary, which as I'm going to come on to, is nonsense and deeply unhelpful to how we think about where we actually want this economy to go. Right, growth. Be nice to have some. The, um, here, the wishful thinking is different from Liz Truss. The wishful thinking space in this area is often either saying, look, I just like it in the, I liked it in the olden days. Everybody went out to work in their manufacturing plants, and they came home satisfied, obviously by everyone they mean white men uh, in some parts of the country, but they, they don't say that bit. They, um, that isn't a good grounding for an economic strategy, because we are not going to turn ourselves into Germany, sorry to the Germans, in the room. Countries don't quickly change what they're good at. So the first thing I'm going to talk to you about is what Britain is good at. And Britain is, despite our kind of social awkwardness and embarrassment about it, a service superpower. We're the second biggest service exporter in the world behind the United States. Nobody ever boasts about that fact in British politics. And as I say, you don't change that much. If I look back at the 1980s and look at the 10 products Britain was best at exporting, seven of those are still in our top 10 today. Now, some of, them are, some of those are manufactured goods. Aerospace, um, booze. We are very good at booze. When everyone's, everyone says, like, I want to advance manufacturing, a lot of what we mean is booze. They're, it is very tasty. Advanced? Meh. Um, but it is very uh, tasty. And that is, um, that is important. So focus on the kind of economy we actually are. And then follow where that takes you. So what is unique about high value-added services? I'm talking about services here. I really mean high value-added services. The book touches a lot on non-tradable face-to-face services as well. I'm going to come back to those. But here I'm talking about things that make us some money in the world, which again is a bit of an embarrassing topic. We don't like to talk about that anymore, but it would actually be nice to pay for that gas we're importing at some point. So services, and services does not mean banking. Okay, Our banking exports, don't worry, everyone that's embarrassed about the bank things, that's been going through the floor since 2008, don't worry. Like We're not making any money doing that anymore. So if that's what you wanted, you have got it, it's fine. Cultural services, business services, intellectual property, research, education, like, the thing that stands out in Britain is the breadth of the service strengths. They, um, it's, that is what is unique about Britain. Really embarrassingly, the only country that's a bit similar to us is France. Which I know you're all going to find hard to deal with, but life's full of tough lessons. They, um, right. If you've accepted that that's the kind of economy you are and you're going to be, doesn't mean lots of manufacturing isn't important. If you're in Derby, if you're in Cheshire, you definitely need to, your only route to high productivity activity is going to be your existing manufacturing strengths. But if we're looking at the country as a whole, this is where the action is going to be, particularly if what we care about is employment in those high value added sectors. Whenever anyone says to me, oh, but manufacturing has got higher productivity growth, I will say to them, follow that thought pattern. That's why there's no workers. Right? Why in America right now are we seeing manufacturing investment go up, but no workers? Because manufacturing productivity is high. 
Who benefits from that productivity? Some people in America, but lots of people buying it abroad. The, um, again, no one ever thinks about that. Right, so place. This chart is showing you places across United Kingdom, France, and Germany by their productivity and their size. Size of the blob blobs is how many people. The, um, now, I'm showing you this for a number of things. So trade-offs wise, Britain is unequal. You all knew this, right? The, um, London, large, high productivity for Britain. The, um, everyone else, basically, all other large places below average productivity. Germany, much more equal in terms of productivity. Now, you might look at that and say, I want to become Germany, but you can't for the reasons I said. There aren't enough Germans, there aren't enough capital stock, you haven't got the skills. So that if you're thinking about an economic strategy, there's no plausible route to becoming like Germany because you do need to be a manufacturing country to have that kind of equal spread. Manufacturing goods are much more equally spread geographically. Okay? The, um, France, though, does offer us lessons. As I said to you, France, more similar economy, but unlike Britain, where we row about our, which of our big cities is our second city, the, um, but actually only one comes close if you're looking at productivity, Edinburgh. Edinburgh is the only, only other city outside of London that is high productivity. If we look at Manchester and Birmingham, 2.8 million people each, those are our big second cities. They're large, which means they are the kind of places where high productivity services should be able to cluster. So our question for ourselves is, with that kind of economy, they should be able to be clustering in Birmingham and Manchester, but they are not. And the question is, what are we doing to make sure that they can in future? Because we need more capacity to produce those kind of services to grow this economy. We can't just do it all in London. And as we're going to come on to later, that requires a lot more change for those places than we have traditionally pretended. We're like a bit more devolution, a bit of a levelling up pot, suddenly it'll all get sorted. But as we're going to come on to it, that's not what happens. If you want those cities to grow, which we all should, because Britain needs them to grow, not because they need to grow for their own sake, then it means a lot of change, a lot of investment, much bigger cities, much change transport networks, much bigger city centres. So that is the goal. If that's your economy, service-led, we need to grow these big cities because that is where the activity will take place. Not the only activity that's important in the country, but we need a lot more capacity to do that kind of activity. Right, there is no route to becoming much richer that doesn't involve starting to invest. So this is showing you total economy investment. And if we look over the last four decades, Britain is the weakest investor in the G7, almost on any metric. So this chart is total investment, public investment, 50% lower than the OECD average. That's why you have the second fewest MRI scanners in the OECD. It's why it takes British workers longer to commute than all OECD countries apart from two. If you in, don't invest for a few years, that's fine. Don't invest for decade after decade after decade. At some point, it does start costing you. The, um, and if we don't turn that around, we, there is not any other answer for us. But I said it was about trade-offs. You've got to pay. I'm going to die here. Wait a second. If you want higher investment, it's got to be paid for. It's either paid for by borrowing from abroad or consuming less at home, saving more at home. But this is showing you that Britain's been borrowing from abroad consistently from the last 40 years. Normally, the textbook said that's fine because you're attracting money to invest. But as I've just shown you, we weren't attracting money to invest. We were attracting money to consume. The, um, so that is what the kindness of strangers looks like. If you want to be higher investment, I don't think we should be doing it at the economic strategy level by borrowing more from abroad. The, um, it's time to save at home. Some of that is about household savings. That's about the proposals in this report for higher pension savings. But it's also about fiscal policy. It's about what firms do. Don't think about savings at the economy-wide level as about just about households. The, um, it's a, collectively, you need to save more to allow us to invest. And if you're not prepared to talk about that and to fit that in with your strategy, don't pretend to yourself that the investment is going to happen on itself, because even though the textbooks I know say, yes, 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 pure capital markets around the world, there is a home bias. People do, do in countries that save more do invest uh, more. Then, um, right, and then just very briefly, before the chancellor comes, it turns out having a lot of economic crisis is really, really bad for your public finances. The, um, 
Everyone used to enjoy and row about whether we had 35, 36, 37 percent of debt in the 2000s. Welcome to 95 percent debt. Ignore the 100. This is from the. This is before the OBR revised down their recent. Uh, revised down the recent um, debt levels. So 95 percent is where we are. This chart is showing you, if you take what both main parties say is their fiscal rule, debt falling at some point, right? But then you wake up to the fact that it turns out economic crises do actually keep happening. Hopefully not as regularly, but big ones happen. There's no way we're on a trajectory for debt falling, if that's our fiscal stance. You have to run a tighter fiscal policy if you actually want to see debt falling. The, um, and we are not on track to doing that at all. The, um, and that is, again, join that up at an economic strategy level with what I've just said to you about saving. Because some of that has to happen at the level of the government. Right. Now, it's common to talk about being hard-headed about getting growth. The uh, half this book is about how to get hard-headed about inequality and how to get it down and to avoid wishful thinking on this. So I'm going to show you a few charts that look like this. Don't worry about the numbers for a second. These are showing you income growth across the income distribution. Poorer households are down here, richer households up here. And it's a shape I want you to wrestle with because it's the shape that we're using to drive our thinking through this strategy. This is telling you what happens if you just get growth. Yeah? Again, ignore the numbers, focus on the shape. If you just get growth, then market income, labor markets, capital, rent, the rest, broadly will rise in line with that growth. Okay? But that income is not spread equally across the population. What you will get if you get just higher growth is higher inequality. Because market income is focused on the middle and the top of the income distribution, not at the bottom. The bottom 20% gets half their income from outside the market, mainly benefits. Okay? And those rise in line with prices, not in line with growth. So you, people who say, oh, we just need to get the growth, that's fine. That is important to raising living standards, but it will mean higher inequality, given how our tax and benefit system is structured uh, today. Right, what do we do about it? Two things. We ignore the usual row amongst lefties about we just need to get pre-distribution. Stop pretending you can redistribute. Pre-distribution's it get better jobs, get more higher wages for lower paid workers, we don't need to worry about the benefit system. Or another load of people that say, we can only reduce poverty by doing redistribution. The argument here is you've got to do both. So on the pre-distribution side, we've got to get better jobs, and we've got to make sure they're available in every community. Doesn't, that's irrelevant, what I said earlier about certain kind of activity being in big cities. Every community should have good jobs. This is showing you job satisfaction, folks on the top line, for the lowest earners, since we've introduced the minimum wage. So the minimum wage is a complete triumph. We're basically back to 1970s levels of hourly pay inequality. If you'd said that was possible in the late 90s, no one would have believed you. Complete triumph. Job satisfaction for the lowest earners has kept falling through that phase. And remember, there's a lot of reasons why that might happen. One half of shift workers only get less than a week's notice of their shifts they're going to work. If you're a low earner and you get sick, you live on 44 pounds for the week. The, um, I'm just giving you some examples. I can give you lots of other ones, too. We've got to have a good jobs agenda that goes beyond the minimum wage. The, um, we should keep raising the minimum wage, but we've got to go beyond it. The, um, right, let's say here I'm modelling you a pre-distribution agenda. Keep going on the minimum wage. Keep raising employment. Here I'm modelling half the increase in employment we saw in the 2010s happening again. The book sets out how we think that could happen. What it's telling you, so now look, compare the change between the, per, the pink bars, which was the growth-only world, and the green bars, which is us bringing pre-distribution into the picture. What it does is the minimum wage, the progressive wage growth, shifts the, uh, the income gains to the middle of the distribution. Not to the bottom, it goes to the middle, because that's where most minimum wage workers are. The, um, what helps the bottom is higher employment. And if you want something to celebrate about the last 10 years, the employment gains are incredibly concentrated amongst the bottom 25% of the population. So we need to do that again. Employment gains here, wage gains concentrated in the middle. Yeah. That's what a pre-distribution agenda looks like. But as you can see, the bottom is still going to see weaker income growth if we just... And this is an aggressive pre-distribution strategy that the book sets out. So it's not like we're not pushing on the levers. So what do we need to do as well? We need to care about the benefit system. So this chart is showing you the change in incomes across the distribution. Poorest households on the left, richest households on the right, in red due to benefit changes, and in, in um, green from the pensions changes since 2010. And it's telling you that the poorest households, on average, have lost £3,000 per household. 
It's not 50 pounds, it's 3,000 pounds from repeated freezes in benefits or caps, the, um, and then other changes. If you want to know why you've got record homelessness, if you want to know why you've got 37% increase in food banks last year, right, these are not abstract numbers, these are real numbers about people's real incomes. You've got to fix how you're treating the benefit system. You've got to have not just higher taxes, you're probably all used to versions of this chart now, tax burden heading to its highest level in uh, ever, basically. The um, 4,000 pounds increase per household over the course of the next few years, 37.7, with the exception of some quite good changes that got announced at the autumn statement two weeks ago, we haven't increased the quality of our taxes at the same rate as increasing their quantity. If you're a high earner, you can pay 50% roughly on your earnings. If you're a high income person that takes their money from capital gains, 28% or naught if you're really clever. Our tax system tells James Dyson how should he hold all his wealth? Farms. Why does he hold it in farms? Not because he loves the sheep, because the inheritance tax system says, would you like to have all of that tax-free? I'm just giving you examples. I can give you a long list of other ways the tax system is what you might technically call bananas. We've got to sort the quality of the tax system if we want inequality up, down and growth up. Then, so let's put those changes into our last version of this chart I'm going to show you. It's a progressive set of tax changes, allowing working age benefits to rise in line with wages, not just with prices, and remove some of the most punitive cuts to benefits since 2010, particularly the two-child limit. This is what you get. It is possible, and this is, the, the book shows this in detail, it is possible to have growth up and inequality down if you bring together all of the elements of the strategy. And just to make you confident about that, in the last decade, on the pre-distribution side, we have seen inequality fall. Minimum wage ramped up, employment up for lowest earners. It's the benefit cuts happening at the same time as the pre-distribution working that means inequality hasn't fallen. Yeah? So it can happen if you put the two together. It's not, we're not set with that flat line. We've just got to bring all the pieces together at once. Right, briefly then on change, and we're going to have a whole session on this this afternoon, so I won't talk about it at great length, but it is time to think about it because all we do in terms of economic change is write angsty and quite annoying books about how it's all going really fast, there's robots everywhere, no one's going to have a job, it's all a complete waste of time. Okay? The, um, the problem with that is that it's nonsense. The, um, just to prove it, there's lots of charts like this in the book, but economic change on almost any measure has been falling, not rising. So this is showing you sectoral change, the movement of workers between different sectors of the economy over time, and it's showing you we're now at the lowest levels at least since the 1930s. These are different sectoral measures. There's actually a third one in the book for the really keen, but whatever measure we use of sectors, the level of change between sectors is coming down. That bump up is just the pandemic. That's gone away because we have actually opened the economy again. Change is getting less. Fewer workers moving jobs, fewer firms growing, and fewer firms shrinking. The, um, Young people don't drink, they don't have sex. The whole economy has basically gone to the dogs. Okay? We, need, we should be less angsty about change and want some uh, more of it. But we're not pro-change for its own sake. We're pro-change in the service of an economic strategy which wants to raise growth and cut inequality. Again, the book goes through a lot more of ways in which you can do that. I'm going to touch on one here, which is the shape of your economy. This is showing you the share of consumption that goes on um, goods and services like hotels and restaurants, okay, on the left-hand side across European countries. And on the x-axis, it's showing you the relative price of those things, relative to other stuff you can buy in that economy. So this end, <coughs> cheap hotels and restaurants. This end, expensive hotels and restaurants, relative to other stuff in the economy. And this is showing you how much of it we buy. Britain, we have cheap hotels and restaurants relative to other stuff, not least because housing is quite expensive and we consume a lot of it relatively. And the lesson I want you to leave you with there from this is, the shape of your economy isn't just about technology and all this stuff. We are what we eat, or at least we are, the economy is to a large part what we consume. And the relative price of these kind of sectors, which are low earner heavy, is mainly determined by the nature of the labor market for those kind of works. We have choices. These are not tradable, yeah? There's no international competition for this much, they, um, except for the really rich. They, um, we decide what people pay to go out and eat because it's basically determined by low-wage labor. If you have higher labor standards, you will in time push up the relative price of those kind of things, and it will reduce the level of consumption of those things. That is a choice, but that is what a pro-growth, because these are low-productivity sectors, and we need capacity to deliver the high-productivity service activity I started with. 
Yeah, over time, nothing drastic, but over time. And secondly, this is a pro-inequality strategy. More good work means higher incomes for low-income households who are more reliant on this kind of labor. And it means higher prices for people that go out and eat a lot, us. And countries that do that have lower inequality than Britain. And if you're not prepared to face up to those kind of things, then you haven't got an economic strategy. You've got some economic policies. Um, right, then, just to wrap up, fatalism. Everyone's probably a bit depressed. This is all very difficult. It's all very hard. And all the cynics of you, I can see quite a lot of Treasury civil servants, you've all cynics, are saying, we're quite a mature economy. We're quite advanced. We haven't got that much control. It's just about the technological frontier. There's, a, there's only so much we can do. Let's not overstate our agency. So just to end on a bit of upbeatness, what is the advantage of having done very badly? Catch-up potential. So this chart is showing you uh, on the x-axis inequality across countries and on the y-axis how rich they are. Okay? And it's showing you Britain in the middle, United Kingdom in the middle, and it's showing you most of the places we compare ourselves to are now both richer and more equal than us. Okay? They all used to be, most of them have been more equal for a long time, they used to be about the same as us in terms of how rich they were. They're all now significantly richer than us. Obviously, the Yanks are kind of a basket case inequality-wise, but much richer. The average American is now 60% richer than us. That's why all your friends look shocked when they come to see you. 60% richer. The, um, and remember, we buy our iPhones from the global market, right? It does matter how much richer people are than us. So the question is, you can look at that and get depressed, or you can look at that and say, how about we don't need to become as rich as the Americans, we don't need to become as equal as the Scandinavians, and don't worry, we're not going to. The, um, uh, neither are we going to get their design taste and all the other advantages that come from a Scandinavian choices you can make. The, um, we just need to become a bit richer and a bit more equal over time, or what you might call normal. And just to illustrate that, let's take the five countries I think most people would associate ourselves with. Australia, the Netherlands, Canada, Germany, and, um, and France. If we had the same inequality as them and the same average incomes, not richer than them, not loads more equal, just the same as the average of those countries, then the average British household would be £8,300 better off. That is what we are trying to achieve. That is what success looks like. It's huge. Even if you get half that, that is what a successful economy looks like. So time, my like ending point is that Britain it's time to be a bit more normal. Do it for a long time. Sort yourself out. And that is what a better country looks like. Right, we're going to wrap up there. Thank you very much, everyone. And you're, you're now going to be joined by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt who I think is about to come and join us, and by Zanny Minton Bello. So can we give them another round of applause and welcome them to the stage? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us, Chancellor. Uh, so Torsten has just told us that Britain just needs to what, sort yourself out. So you are, at least for the moment, the man in charge of sorting out Britain's economy. Um, this book... I don't like that, at least for the moment, Manny. <laughs> Can we just rewind and uh, say, um, subject to the next election? Subject to the next election. Blah, blah, blah. Yes. Uh, this book, you probably haven't had a chance to read all of it, but it is uh, really good, meaty, and quite sobering. Um, the headline, Torsten just laid out the headlines, but you know these. Um, basically, we've had 15 years of stagnation. Productivity growth has fallen off a cliff since the financial crisis. Less than half that of our OECD peers. Real wages basically stagnant. Something's gone terribly wrong. And your government, your party, has been in government for most of that time. So I think I want to have most of this conversation looking forward. But I do think it's worth understanding what's gone wrong. And so I'd love to hear your view of why we are in this mess. Why has productivity fallen so much? And frankly, what could the government have done differently? How much blame should really be laid at the hand of government decisions? Well, it's a, a good question to open with. And first of all, I, I haven't read this from cover to cover because it's only been published this morning, but I have read a summary of it. And I think it's uh, a really interesting report that's asking all the right questions. Um, but I think uh, I fundamentally and profoundly disagree <laughs> with Torsten's view 
uh, the, you know, the great advantage of doing badly, which I just heard him use those words, of, of things going wrong, ignores the context. I mean, what we had was the worst financial crisis since the Second World War, which affected lots of countries, not just our country. And since 2010, we've actually grown faster than Spain, Portugal, France, Italy, the Netherlands, Austria, Germany, Japan. In fact, the majority of the countries that Torsten was comparing us to, we've grown faster than them. So I think it's absolutely right to say, why have all of us fallen into this uh, low growth uh, paradigm and what can we do to get out of it? Um, but I don't think uh, this is something that we are uniquely in a bad situation uh, with respect to. I think this is affecting all Western nations and you have to have a plan to get out of it. Okay, uh, we're not going to argue too much about the numbers, but we have been doing significantly worse if you look at living standards over the last 15 years. Just to go back to my question, is there anything that with hindsight you would have done differently? Well, there are lots of things that you learn, of course, over time. But, um, uh, you know, I th with living standards, right, the, and where I absolutely agree with this report is that productivity is key. So the only way in the long run that you can raise living standards is by raising productivity. Now, I don't blame the Resolution Foundation for the fact that they went to print days before the autumn statement, but we did introduce in the autumn statement uh, the most competitive business investment reliefs in the world, matched only amongst OECD countries by Latvia and Estonia with full expensing. Um, this means, and alongside uh, another 109 growth measures, this will increase business investment in the British economy by 20 billion a year. And that is about half the gap with, you know, Torsten looked at the, the countries we like to compare ourselves to. But if you take Germany, France, and America, they invest about 2% of GDP more than we do every year. Um, and those measures, including full expensing, but not just full expensing, the, the reforms to the planning system, uh, the increasing access to the grid for clean energy projects, that 20 billion a year closes about half the gap with France, Germany, and America. In one fiscal event, I think that's not bad going. And so I think we, we are really focused on productivity. Um, but if I could just, while I'm answering that, I think there is one gap here, and I... I do think it's, uh, as we're talking about this report, I think I should just mention it. Um, because um, I, if I was going to choose one country in the world that had the most untapped potential to become the most prosperous 21st century economy, it would be Britain. And why is that? Um, because, first, we are very good at introspection, and this is a very good example of that, so we do ask ourselves the searching questions. But most of all, because... The sectors that are going to grow the fastest this century are the sectors where we are doing really well in. Technology is the obvious one, where we have a technology sector that's double the size of Germany, is three times the size of France. If you ask why it is that we've grown faster than Germany since 2010, despite their higher productivity, it is because we are actually stronger on innovation. So if we could solve the productivity bit, there would be no stopping us. And the reason I think that is, if I, with the greatest respect, could say that is an omission, is because you'd spend a lot of time rightly talking about our strengths in the service sectors. If you'd done an equivalent report in the 1980s and not mentioned Big Bang and the City of London, um, which has gone on to be an area of global leadership for the UK, you'd be ignoring the sector that, whose taxes now fund half the cost of the NHS, because that's what financial services do. So I think you, you have to think about technology, AI, life sciences, clean energy, uh, creative industries, because those are the sectors that are going to be really important for us going forward. Why don't you elaborate on that? Because one of the messages that comes out strongly from the report is the need for a growth strategy. And you, you know, as you say, you unveiled 110 measures. 110 measures is a huge number of measures. It's, I'm not sure, though, I understand what the growth strategy is of this government. Well... In fairness to the Resolution Foundation, that was the autumn statement. So I was focusing on, on the autumn statement last year. It was stabilisation and the battle against inflation. The spring budget was labour supply. That was where we had the childcare measures. The autumn statement was growth. Um, 
I, t I spent an hour giving that statement. I won't do the same thing again. But if I was going no, to say two things, yeah, no, no, the no, strategy. Not the details. The big. What's yeah. the thirty-second pitch? What is Britain's growth pitch, strategy? Then. Thirty-second pitch. Number one, you've got to deal with productivity by increasing business investment, and that is why we had full expensing, uh, and that's why we had those those twenty billion pounds of measures. Secondly, you've got to have a very clear view as to where our competitive advantage is. And the country which has got, outside the United States, the most respected higher education sector, outside the United States, uh, the biggest financial services sector, our strength is innovation industries. And that is where, if we are focused, uh, this uh, conservative administration can give the country uh, a world-beating technology sector, the world's next Silicon Valley, just in the same way that Nigel Lawson gave the country the City of London and financial services. And so that is, I think, you put those two things together, and I think you've got, and by the way, I should add into productivity, it's not just business investment, it's also skills, which is why the Prime Minister's plan for teaching people maths to 18 is really important because, you know, 15% of our school leavers leave school without the necessary math skills. It's only 8% in Singapore. We need to close that gap. So I think you would find a lot of commonality with what you've just laid out in the report. Um, you focused on the need for more investment, private and public. We'll get to public in a second, but let's talk about private investment. The bulk of capital spending in this country is done by businesses. You introduced, as you say, full expensing. That would have got a three, three stars from the report. They said you should do it. You've already done it. Um, beyond full expensing, what is holding private investment in this country back? You've, you've run a business. Why don't businesses here invest more? And what can you do beyond full expensing to, to improve that? Well, lots of things, but um, let me give you uh, three. Um, first of all, labour supply. Most businesses find it hard to expand because they can't recruit the staff. And that's why we are now... But we have, six, we have one million vacancies in the economy. We have six million adults of working age who are not in work. And that's why we announced uh, in the autumn statement some very big labour market reforms, welfare reforms, that are designed to bring many of those people would like to come back into work. And uh, we need to have a system that doesn't write people off if they have an illness or a disability, but says the first thing we're going to do is try and treat you, which is why uh, we're going to be funding a lot more people to do talking therapies um, helping half a million people with mental health conditions because that's an increasing reason why people are uh, leaving their jobs. So that would be one of them. Another is a total overhaul of our planning system. So we said that, you know, what local councils say is that they don't have enough planning staff uh, and we need to remove cost as an issue for them. So we've said that local authorities, when it comes to business planning applications, can charge their full cost, full cost recovery in return for which they must process an application within the statutory period. And if they don't, they have to give the money back and still process it at high speed. So that's, that's a very big one. And then the third one, because clean energy is such a big part of our transformation, we're going to have to double the amount of electricity that we generate as a country. Um, we totally transformed the way businesses are going to be able to access the national grid because um, one of the things that's holding back clean energy investment is people are being told they have to wait 14 years for a grid connection and we're going to shrink, I think we're going to reduce the delays by 90% as a result of what I announced. So those are all really impressive changes. Um, I think across the board people would probably applaud them, but they are new approaches from the government and one of the challenges I think for businesses is the, the frequency and speed with which policy <coughs> changes. I mean, it's unbelievably volatile. I'm going to quote now from the report. Lower level instability since 2010 has included nine business secretaries, four versions of the business department, too many industrial strategies or growth plans to count. Corporation tax has changed almost annually. How can, you know, a government, and, and we've had the same party in power and there's been that much change. How worrying, and you, you, you must deal with this day in, day out. How do you recognize the sense that volatility and policy uncertainty is a problem? And how do you guard against that? I mean, we've got an election coming, but assuming, let's, let's just assume that you, you are in power for the next five years. How do you get a plan in place that people can say, right, we're sticking with this? Well, I think there's a very particular reason why we've had that um, political chopping and changing. I don't think it's a good thing. By the way, you're talking to the, as you know, the longest serving health secretary. I was there for nearly six years. And I think um, 
there are enormous benefits to ministers staying in their post for a long period of time. But um, we had Brexit. That led to a hung parliament. That led to a politically incredibly challenging time where um, the British people had voted to leave the EU, but parliament couldn't agree on how and ultimately to the fall of Theresa May's government. Um, and then we had a pandemic. Um, and these things have led to changes in Whitehall. I hope we can have more stability going forward, absolutely, because I think it is a better thing for policy. So that's the political side. What about the institutional side? Um, as you know, we, we wrote a big piece about the Treasury recently, arguing that actually the Treasury, while it has many strengths, was perhaps institutionally a problem for growth because it was short-termist. How much do you recognise that analysis? Um, I think that the, you know, I, I, I generally find myself agreeing with most of what you write in The Economist. Um, but um, that one I thought uh, didn't, I, I thought it was, a, it was a fair point historically. So I think the Treasury has been historically uh, first and foremost an accountant determined to make sure the books balance which is very important in the international markets because you know, people have to know we're good for our debts and uh, we pay lower debt interest rates as a result of the confidence people have. Um, but I think the Treasury since I've been there, by the way, it's not because of me, but my impression of the Treasury since I've been there has been a very growth-focused organisation. And you know, they started the day after the spring budget, we started working on the autumn statement I said, this is going to be a, a, an autumn statement on growth and very specifically unlocking business investment. That is, what, that is the thing that we are going to try and crack in the autumn statement. And I think they did an absolutely superb job. So I think that now, I think if you, you, know, if you looked in the Treasury, there is an understanding of the centrality of growth uh, to what they do. Now, some people say you should remove the responsibility for growth to another government department, perhaps have a a department for economics or something like that, which other countries do. I would say that the problem with that is that in any political system, ultimately power resides where the money is. And you don't want the department that's responsible for growth uh, to have to negotiate for its budget every year with the Treasury. At the moment, when there's something that's really important for growth, such as you know securing the gigafactory in Somerset that... Um, JLR Land Rover, Tata announced. You know, I think it's very important the Chancellor thinks that's my job to make sure we secure this kind of investment for the UK. And so I think there are very big advantages in having that responsibility for growth uh, where the money is. So you want a powerful treasury, but one that is focused on growth. Absolutely. What about then public investment? And this, this is a, a gathering of largely economists, so they won't mind me focusing so much on investment, because as the report says, it's completely integral. And public investment, 20% of total investment, the report says public investment should increase dramatically towards the 3% of GDP they're saying should become the norm. If you look, and I, you know, the only thing we have to go on for your plans for the next five years where you to have them would be the autumn statement. And if you look there, you actually have real public investment declining. Is it sensible to have declining public investment? Um, I don't think you want declining public investment. Um, and I very much hope we'll be able to get back into a place where we don't have to do that. But I think it's also important to say, Zanny, that in uh, 2020, uh, the capital budget, which is the closest proxy you have to public investment, went up by its highest ever level, by 21% from £70 billion pounds to £100 billion. Pounds. That's it. So we are now spending, in terms of public capital spending, £30 billion pounds a year more in real terms. But it's still, you know, it's risen as a share of GDP, but it's, if you, you've got it on a trajectory, it's gone up, and it's then going to go down. Well, hang on. Just, let's just explain exactly what happened. So in that 2020 budget, when Rishi Sunak was Chancellor, it was the biggest ever increase. Now, I then had to balance the books a year ago. It was an incredibly difficult situation, um, but it was necessary for the markets and it was necessary for the battle against inflation. So what I chose to do was to freeze that capital budget in cash terms, which is not a freeze in real terms. I hope as soon as we can afford to, we can get back to real terms growth, but I'm absolutely committed to public investment. And I think 
The evidence I would give you, if I may, that we are committed to public investment was that, as, as everyone knows, we had a very big challenge with HS2, and uh, the, the project was going wrong. Now, I think in previous eras, if the Treasury had lived up to what you were describing in the article about it in The Economist, we would have clawed that money back to help balance the books in other areas. But actually, every single penny of that 36 billion that we saved from not proceeding with HS2 is being put into other capital projects. So we are absolutely committed to investment in the public realm. And I think the way, how do you get there? You get there by unleashing the growth in the economy more broadly. And that's what I was trying let's, to do in the autumn but, statement. But let's, let's sort of stand back a bit, because this is a report written in 2030. And you, know, you have in, in uh, as Chancellor, at least on the public finances, you have a few levers, right? You've got taxes and you've got spending. And with tw between spending, you can, you've got current spending and you've got capital spending. And I'm crudely simplifying, but basically, you have cut taxes, you have, you, you're going to have public, public current spending falling very dramatically after 24, 25, and you've got net investment going down too. What do you think is the right approach? You've said you want more public investment. Does that mean you want to have you know, even bigger cuts in current spending, or do you want higher taxes? Because you, you kind of can't have all three. Well, you can have all three if you do them in the right order. And I think it's wrong to say... Uh, it's wrong to just describe the package of measures that I did as cutting taxes without saying what those taxes were cut for. So I did two major tax cuts in the autumn statement. One was um, int introduction of full expensing, which the CBI said was a game changer that was going to fire up the British economy, gives us the most competitive capital allowances. All the countries that Torsten were talking about that invest more than we do, uh, none of them have as competitive a regime as, as we do. And just to underline the significance of that measure, um, Rishi Sunak announced a precursor of that in, I think, 2021 with the super deduction. Uh, I then continued it with uh, temporary full expensing for three years in the spring budget. It's now permanent full expensing. Since we started on this journey, since Rishi Sunak started on this journey, business investment has grown by more in this country than America, France, Germany, any of the countries in Torsten's list. So that's one, one tax cut. The second tax cut was the cut in national insurance, um, which the OBR themselves say will bring 94,000 people back into the workforce, full-time equivalent. That is equivalent to filling one in 10 of the vacancies across the whole country. That is a, a totally pro-growth tax cut. So how do we invest in the public realm? How do we make sure that, you know, that our public finances match up. It's by getting the country growing. And this is a strategy. These are tax cuts that will stimulate growth, not in my words, but in the words of the CBI, the OBR, and other independent commentators. So I, I want to get our horizons to, to 2030 again. And I, I'm, because I'm mindful that the report makes very clear that you need a broad strategy. As, am I unfairly summarising you if I... Because I've heard you say, basically, Britain was hit by shocks that others were, so kind of not our fault. Now we're going to have a strategy that is tax cuts and you know, as much public investment in we, as we can afford, but nothing fundamentally different. You don't see a need for any sort of bigger, broader policy changes of the scope that <coughs> this lays out. Well, I, I think that's... That is a mischaracterization. Is it? Okay, it, good. it is. I mean, you're ignoring the fact that we made some very, very big changes in the autumn statement, giving us some of the most competitive business taxes in the world. Um, and you're characterizing tax cuts as a strategy in isolation. I do believe in tax cuts. I'm a conservative. I would like to reduce the, um, the size of the state as a proportion of GDP. But the tax cuts that I'm doing are pro-growth tax cuts that are going to fire up the British economy. And, um, you know, I think what I've done is something that will be transformative in terms of our productivity, which is exactly what this report is arguing. I mean, you know, the report is also very powerful in talking about the regional inequality that we have in this country. The fact that the productivity gap between London and Manchester is 40% when it's only 20% between Paris and Lyon. And uh, the levelling up strategy is square on designed to 
deal with that. And since we started that in 2019, two-thirds of all new employed jobs have been outside <coughs> London and the southeast. So I think that is beginning to have an impact. Um, but I, are there more things we can do? Absolutely. I think in every fiscal event I've done, I've demonstrated that I'm prepared to do big new things, whether, it was, whether it's the childcare measures in the spring budget or full expensing in, in this budget, that will help transform our growth prospects. Just a couple more questions from me and then questions from you. So do get ready because there are people wandering around with, with microphones. One on planning. You, you laid out some very ambitious planning reforms in the, in the autumn statement. You've, you've said very clearly that you think that's an important part of uh, faster growth. But your party seems to be kind of increasingly opposed both to whether it's new pylons or solar farms or indeed house building. I mean, how do you... Can you credibly say the Conservative Party is the party of growth, given those factors? Well, you, every party has to um, manage its own parliamentary party, sometimes getting through measures that are not popular. But look at our track record. In, in the last year for which we have um, house building numbers, which is uh, the year before, well, it's the year ending March uh, 22, uh, we had more new homes completed than in any single year under the previous Labour government. So we have seen a big increase. But what we've also seen over the last five to seven years is increasingly strong environmental protections. And we have got to find a way of getting the balance right between those two. And so we will continue to find ways to reform the planning system. Uh, we are going to see more, um, you know, more clean energy projects in our natural landscapes if we're going to double the amount of electricity we generate. That's a choice that we make as a country, but it's the right thing to do uh, for the planet as well as for the economy. So we are going to see some changes. Um, but I think that, um, you know, what I would say is, the planning measures that we announced in the autumn statement alone are going to unlock £9 billion of annual additional investment. Uh, so I think they were very significant. One more complete different track, benefits. One of the powerful messages of this report is that it is the combination of slow productivity growth and high inequality. And one of the things that has clearly really hit incomes at the bottom of the income distribution has been the changes in benefits that have come over the last 12 years. Do you think, would you agree with the report in, in arguing that there needs to be a fundamental change there for this to be inclusive growth? I totally agree that it needs to be inclusive growth, but, um, and I haven't read the specific bits in that report. I, I would say this, though, about um, what has actually happened. If you look at the, which part of, which group, group of people in the economy have seen their post-tax real incomes grow the most since 2010. It's not the people at the top. Um, it's not the people at the very bottom. It is the people who are working full-time on the national living wage. They have seen the threshold at which they start to pay tax or national insurance double. They have seen the national living wage go up massively, and it's gone up again in the autumn statement. Uh, that group of people has actually seen their post-tax real income increase by 30% since 2010. It's a huge increase. And why is that? Because we want to incentivize people to get back into work, those six million adults who are not working. And in terms of the poverty impact, the people in absolute poverty after housing costs has gone down uh, since 2010 by 1.7 million people, including 400,000 children. Um, and that is because we have reduced workless households. So I think they're all connected. I do passionately think we, we need to be an inclusive society in which everyone has a share in growth. But if you look at some of the uh, societies that are often characterized as being more equal than ours, someone like the Netherlands, for example, um, they actually have lower inactivity rates, higher employment rates. If we had the same number of women in work as they have in Holland relative to the size of population, we would have two million more people in work in the UK. So we would have filled every vacancy in the economy twice over. That's 
true. It's, but it's, it's worth reading that bit because they're pretty, pretty sobering statistics that you know, low-income households in the UK are now 27% poorer than their French and German counterparts. And that gap has widened over the last 13 years. Let's, well, you and I could go on for a long time. Let's hear some questions from the audience. Um, yes, right there. Thank you very much. Uh, Jack Gamble, uh, Director of the Campaign for the Arts. Um, Chancellor, the Resolution Foundation's report today agrees with the government that the creative and cultural industries are a main uh, growth area of, of potential for the UK economy. And the report says that the UK's creative strengths can be traced to cultural openness, high quality creative education, and the role that public service broadcasting via both the BBC and Channel 4 has in shaping the market. Our research has found that uh, there have been declines of 47% at GCSE and 29% at A-level in creative subjects in England. And I notice in the news today there's talk of potentially further reductions in the funding of the BBC. My question to you is, you've said that you want to get growth up first to get public uh, investment up second. But are you not concerned that these real declines, including in public investment, might actually be draining the fuel out of one of our key economic engines? Um, I, first of all, I totally agree with the report that our innate creativity is why the creative industry is one of the five sectors that I've identified as being an area of national competitive comparative advantage. Um, and it, it's interesting. We have, in the last decade, we've become the largest film and TV production centre in Europe. In fact, we may have already been that, but we've extended <coughs> our lead over other European countries. And film and TV production in the last uh, four years, I don't think there's any evidence of what you said, because actually our studio space has gone up by two-thirds. Netflix alone has spent £6 billion in the UK. Um, and we have uh, attracted those industries here because of uh, very generous tax reliefs. But they can see that they can source the skills they need to, you know, to make Barbie or Oppenheimer, both of which are made here. They can source those here. But I think the really interesting thing is that film and TV and creative industries have become an offshoot of the technology industry in the last uh, decade um, because basically it is all, you know, special effects is all about technology. And what you get in the UK is the tech skills and also the creativity come together, you've got a combination of Hollywood and Silicon Valley, which is absolutely incredible. So um, we are absolutely back in them. I would never be complacent about skills. There's always more we can do. And I couldn't agree with you more about public service broadcasting being central to what makes the UK attractive. Thank you. Let's go uh, somewhere in the back there. Yes. Let me come to you. Hi, I'm Juliet from Christians Against Poverty. Um, our recent research has highlighted that we've got 9% of the UK population having debt they don't know how to repay, and we provide debt support, and 50% of our clients have deficit budgets. So just wondering kind of what um, support you're considering, which would help people uh, in emergency crisis situations now to make sure that we don't end up with a debt crisis next. Thank you. I think a couple of things. First of all... Um, we're very concerned about people with mortgages as interest rates have gone up, ending up not being able to pay their mortgages. So I, I organised something called the Mortgage Charter, which 90% of lenders have signed, or 90% of the market by volume has signed up to, which does things like uh, guarantee that all people will be given a year's grace before any repossession proceedings happen, um, enables people to move to the best possible deal at the last moment. Um, and uh, we're still seeing uh, significantly fewer. I think it's still, repossessions are still a, a third the level they were um, just after the financial crisis. So um, I think it's having some impact. But I think the other thing any chancellor has to do in a, in a fiscal event is ask what direct levers you have. So one of the things that we did at the autumn statement was uh, increase the local housing allowance, which is basically going to be an £800 uh, grant to 1.4 million households because we know rents going up is one of the biggest pressures on poorer households. So I think it's a balance of things. Thank you. Yes. Can you just move those back? 
walls when you come to think tank centre for cities. Um, Chancellor, you said that we uh, have a real specialism in, in innovative industries, uh, but have a productivity uh, problem. My view would be that it's those innovative industries that are meant to push productivity on. So just wondering what your diagnosis is between the disconnect between specialised in these cutting edge uh, sectors and yet still having a productivity problem. Um, well, I think there'll be lots of economists here who have studied what the definition of productivity is um, uh, and will be more knowledgeable than I am about it. But I think my understanding of what drives productivity is it's, it's a combination of human capital, things like skills, which is why it's so important that we invest in our education system and why it's such a positive thing that educational standards are going up. It's a combination of business investment, whereas Torsten was telling you earlier, we have traditionally lagged, and that's what the autumn statement measures were all about. Um, it's to do with regional disparities, which is why the levelling up uh, agenda is, is so important. Um, and it's also to do with this thing called total factor productivity, which includes things like your ability to innovate. Um, and I think that uh, we are very strong on that bit, We've been weaker on the capital investment side. And for, for a long time, our education side, we've been very good on the sort of university educated half of school leavers, less good on the school leavers who don't go to university. And I think that is now really changing. I think we've got time for a couple more. So yes, lady there, four rows back. Five rows back, yeah, there, two. Yeah. Francis Coppola, Independent Economist. Um, really a follow-on from the last question I wanted to ask about productivity. Um, much of the rhetoric that we've heard has been about getting more people into work, but I would like to remind you that getting more people into work is not the same as increasing productivity. Um, so my question would be, given that you're the two particular um, policies you've highlighted in your discourse has been full expensing, absolutely, that's a good policy, and a cut to national insurance to get more people into work. What are your strategies for raising productivity rather than just increasing the size of the workforce? Well, um, the, the two are connected, but, um, you know, 94,000 more, the workforce, the national workforce will increase by 94,000 as a result of the national insurance cut, which, as I say, is about one in 10 of all vacancies. Um, and how do we make sure that those people are able to work productively? It's by incentivizing their employers to invest more in capital, plant, machinery, IT systems, so that each individual worker is generating more output. Now, Germany has productivity 15% higher than us, so at the moment, uh, Broadly speaking, it takes Germans four days, what it takes a Brit five days to work. That isn't because Germans work longer hours or work harder. It's because, uh, by and large, German workers have more capital wrapped around them, more machinery, more plant, more automation, which means that they have higher productivity. So that's why um, introducing capital allowances, full expensing, that is more generous than Germany's, is the way that we're going to see more investment alongside reforms to the planning system and other measures. So you need to do them, the two together. One more question. Yes, gentleman there, the turquoise sweater. Thank you. Uh, Chancellor, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm intrigued by our attitude to the economy. I kind of want to touch on that with an analogy. If I think about the first session from Torsten, it's almost like he's described an economy that has a, a, a broken leg. And then I come, come to this session and it sounds like you're my chief surgeon who's telling me, I'm not sure you have a broken leg actually. Um, maybe we don't need to do anything or you know, maybe we need to just carry on as is or maybe we need to invest here or there. To what degree does our economy actually have a broken leg and to what do we do need do we need to repair it before we then have ambitions of prospering highly and running a two-hour marathon. That is a great analogy. And, and you are a marathon runner, no? Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of the perfect metaphor here. <laughs> um, but um, look, I think it's, it's really important not to lose our self-belief. And I think that we are uh, one of the world's best and most brilliant countries at beating ourselves up. Because we have brilliant magazines like The Economist, 
who are good at flattery putting, will get you nowhere. who are good at putting us under a magnifying glass and identifying areas where I'm not sure I describe it as a broken leg, but identifying areas where we can do better. And that is that is a very good thing for us that we do that. But sometimes we forget that other countries also have the things that they need to improve. Um, you know, I have to. You know, I, I've had conversations with European finance ministers who say they wish they could swap our education system for theirs because they look at our universities, four of the world's top 20. Nowhere else outside America gets close to that. And um, we, you look at our technology industry, um, you look at our record on climate change where we've cut emissions by 49%, France has cut them by 23%. And so we do, we've done lots of things really well. Um, we should absolutely be honest about the things that we can do better. Our technical education for school leavers who don't go to university has come on leaps and bounds, but we need to go further. That's why we need people to be doing maths and English till they're 18. Our productivity is still behind France, Germany, and the United States. We need a plan for that, which is what I announced. But what we shouldn't lose is the fact that, you know, despite uh, lots of venerable magazines saying that we're going to hell in a handcart, we always confound expectations in this country, and we always do far better than everyone says. And a year ago, all these experts were saying that the economy was going to contract. You know, the OBR said it was going to contract by 1.4%. It's actually grown by 0.6%. That's a 2% difference in just, just one year. And I think we shouldn't lose confidence that we do some things absolutely amazingly. I know he's controversial in other ways, um, but you know when Elon Musk was here three weeks ago, he said there were only two centers in the world for AI, San Francisco and London. So this is a guy who you know, is spending a lot of money on AI and knows about automation and you know he's 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 done Tesla, and he, he, he knows this stuff very, very well. So we've got a lot going for us. So if we're going to go into um, dealing with the, um, the sprained ankle rather than the broken leg, <laughs> um, then let's do so from a perspective of positivity because we've got so much going for us, um, and, uh, and I think we should you know, have a little bit of optimism for the future because uh, this has still got some of the most exciting prospects of any country in the world. Okay, so let's, as a last question, let's, let's grant you that optimism. I like the sprained ankle uh, analogy. Um, what will this potential marathon running country with a temporarily sprained ankle look like in 2030? Just paint a picture of what, in the, in the best possible case, where all the things that you would like to happen get done, what does the country look like, and what are the three or four things that you would need to do between now and then to get it there? Okay. Um, well, the first thing is, um, you know, we have an election next year, and we have to make the right choice at that election. And, um, and it's interesting, because one of the things that you, you tried to suggest I was saying, I know you don't really think I was saying it, Zanny, but it was a nice try, was that uh, I was trying to say, it's fine to do more of the same. Absolutely not. We're making really big changes. But one of the things that we have won, is won back, is a reputation for fiscal probity. And, it is, and you're, you're going to talk to Keir Starmer this afternoon. It is not possible to meet our fiscal rule to reduce debt in five years and to increase borrowing by £28 billion a year. One of those two has to be false. So I hope whatever the country decides next year, we do not relinquish our reputation for fiscal probity. Um, and then what I would say is, and I think this is the, um, this is the bit where I, I, I totally agree with the economist analysis of what needs to happen in, in politics. Um, it's really important that we're long term. The benefits of those 110 measures, the 20 billion pounds of business investment, uh, they aren't scored by and large by the OBR because most of them will feed through not in five years but within a decade. Uh, the full expensing will increase uh, by about 14 billion the investment in the next five years, but the real benefits will be because uh, you know companies like Toyota and Nissan 
say they want to build plants here because they can see the benefits in the medium and long term, 10, 20 years' time. And I think that what really matters is that despite all the political noise, governments find the nerve to make the long-term changes, the really difficult changes that will make a difference. Um, and, and that is what Rishi Sunak is absolutely committed to. It's what I'm absolutely committed to. And I think as long as we do that, then um, we have got the most amazing prospects in front of us. And 2030, it will be the most amazing economy. I think, you know, it is possible we will hand over a fantastic economy to Labour in 2030, yes. Okay, <laughs> on that note, thank you very much, Chancellor. Thank you. Great, I didn't see the broken leg coming, but that is one of many things. Right, now, you get coffee to reward you for having stuck through this. Don't break your leg on the way down the stairs. There's a lot of coffee stations. And then we're going to be back up here at 11.30 to talk about growth and some of the issues the Chancellor's raised about how do we encourage business investment and the rest. Off you go. Coffee time.
shall we? Uh, let's get going. I'm going to shout while I wait for the mics to come on. Grab your... Oh, you're such... You're a very, very well-behaved audience. Look how quietly everyone quietens down. I'm very impressed with the... Britain may be a low-productivity country, but you are a high-productivity audience that got downstairs, got a coffee, and got back upstairs. That is what forward progress looks like. If we maintain that, £8,300 is ours in seconds. Right, we've got two sessions now on the meat of what is in the report. So first of all, you're going to hear about growth with this brilliant panel on my right. And to introduce them, I'm going to introduce one of the, one of the main authors and architects, actually, of the Economy 2030, Dr. Anna Vallejo. So let's give them a cup. Thank you very much, Torsten, and thanks to everyone for being here today. So good morning and welcome to this panel where we're going to be talking about how to get growth up. We've already been talking about that a little bit this morning, so hopefully it will be nice to develop those ideas further. As we heard, the UK has many strengths, and we set those out in the report at length, um, both in services, in innovation, in high-value manufacturing, but we have had these problems converting those strengths into productivity and growth that is felt by people across the country. So... We know that the autumn statement set out a number of measures which are positive in that regard on business investment. Um, many of those things are things we've talked about in our reports as well. Um, but as, as Torsten said earlier, we can go further and we're going to hear today from our brilliant panel um, about how we can do that. Um, so we'll talk about public investment, how can we raise its level, reduce its volatility, business investment, how can we incentivize firms and pressurize them to invest more in long-term value creation, trade policy, how can we shape that in a way that leverages our strengths and allows us to grow, and cities, how can we ensure that our cities can maximize their productive potential. So to do this, we'll hear from this brilliant panel of speakers. First, we're going to hear from Emily Fry, who is an economist at the Resolution Foundation. She's going to take us through a summary of some of our key recommendations from the inquiry. And then we'll have responses from our distinguished panelists. First, we'll hear from Dr. Swati Dingra, who is an external member of the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England, an associate professor of economics at the London School of Economics, and a colleague of mine, also a member of the steering group for the Economy 2030 inquiry. Sadly, Swati will have to leave a bit early due to some Bank of England business. <laughs> then we'll be hearing from Tom Reardon, Chief Executive of Leeds City Council, where he's overseen a significant transformation of the council and the city, including the new Channel 4 headquarters. We talked about the importance of our creative sectors and the UK Infrastructure Bank. We talked about the importance of infrastructure. Then we'll hear from Dame Sharon White, Chair of the John Lewis Partnership, and previously the Chief Executive of Ofcom and Second Permanent Secretary to the Treasury. And finally, we'll hear from Professor Diane Coyle, Bennett Professor of Public Policy and Co-Director of the Bennett Institute for Public Policy at the University of Cambridge, as well as the Director of the Productivity Institute that had its productivity, National Productivity Week last week. Okay, so it's a big topic and we have very little time and sadly each speaker has only a few minutes. So let's hand over to you, Emily. Thank you, Anna. Um, so this morning, Torsten has convinced us that weak productivity growth is holding back Britain's living standards. Over the next few minutes, and I threaten a few more slides, I'm going to set out a plausible economic strategy to get growth up. First, we need to recognize what Britain's 21st century economy actually looks like. And second, we need to invest in our future rather than living off our past. When we talk about growth, some are unserious in wishing that we were a German-style manufacturing powerhouse. Spoiler, we're not. Um, others in thinking that we are just simply bankers. As we've heard earlier, uh, financial services have been actually falling as a share of our exports ever since the financial uh, crisis. Instead, our route to prosperity is building on our strengths. And for that, we need our domestic and our trade policies to be pointing in the same direction. But our approach to goods trade post-Brexit is at odds with the stated commitment to advanced manufacturing. As you can see in this chart, exports of cars and chemicals are now below their 2018 levels, performing the worst or second worst in the G7. This is because these key sectors have lost their frictionless access to EU markets. The defensive priority is now securing this EU market access for these advanced manufacturing firms who are struggling to maintain their role in EU supply chains. 
tweaks will not address the fundamental issue of a lost EU-UK goods border. Instead, we need a UK protocol. This means building on the current position of Northern Ireland to restore the lost benefits of the EU's customs union and a single market for goods. But there is some real upside and growth potential in harnessing the UK's services specialisms in international markets. This chart shows us the good news that services Britain specialises in, like intellectual property, like creative services, and a range of professional services, have tripled since 2005, growing while goods trade just doubled. Here, too, the UK is much less dependent on the EU market. Therefore, we can go beyond our traditional goods-focused free trade agreements. Instead, the UK should pioneer new services trade agreements, including elements like mutual recognition of professional qualifications with our key advanced economies, places like Singapore and Australia. But we have to be clear that this presents a challenge in that services exports and productive activity tend to be geographically concentrated. At the moment in the UK, that means in our capital city. Britain's twin second cities, Birmingham and Manchester, are far less productive than even the UK average. But with 2.8 million people each, they are also too big to fail, as Torsten told us earlier. But these cities are absolutely miles away from functioning like the highly productive places that they should be. Everyone knows we need to level up, but plans fall far short of either fixing our unequal economic ge geography or getting growth up. To succeed, our cities need a city centre where productive services firms can operate at scale with sufficient housing for a larger, highly skilled <laughs> workforce who are connected by mass transit to the central business district. For example, this chart shows that currently just half of graduates in Birmingham can get to the city centre in a reasonable commute under 45 minutes. To raise that by 100,000 graduates, Birmingham will need £5 billion of investment in buses and in a tram network, at a minimum. To date, we haven't been serious about the scale of this ambition and this investment, which far surpasses any plans today for levelling up. It will also require local people to be empowered to act, and that means more fiscal devolution. And central government needs to do its bit too through public investment. But the major problem we have with public investment, as we've heard, is not only that it's too low, and that's especially given the needs of a net zero this decade, it's also far too volatile. As you can see in this chart, since the 1970s, public investment has been cut time and time again when Britain faces a downturn. This volatility forces departments to flip-flop on their investment plans and results in persistent underspends, even when they have the budgets allocated to do this investment. The results can be seen all around us. Britain has just half the number of MRI scanners per person as the, tradition, as the typical OECD country. And we are falling behind on decarbonizing our homes. To fix this, we need to reform our fiscal rules to secure public investment at 3% of GDP. But also, the Treasury needs to switch its focus to improving the quality, not simply fiddling around with the quality of <coughs> investment. Of course, that's combined, too, with a dearth of business investment, which has left our workers with far too little kit to work with and too few ideas to implement. In fact, the lack of kit that's available to our British workers can explain all of the gap in productivity with our French peers. So what's going wrong? Well, many people love to talk and love to diagnose the UK with a lack of investable projects. But this chart shows that return on investment is not the problem. In the decades since the financial crisis, the UK has actually had higher returns on, on its investment than our peers like the, U like the US, like France, and like Germany. So although full expensing of plant and machinery uh, that the Chancellor mentioned this morning is extremely welcome, we can't think that tax cuts means jobs done. So why is management not choosing to invest? Well, this chart shows us that the UK stands out among our OECD peers as having one of the lowest proportion of firms with block holder shareholders. So that means those that are big enough to want to and to be able to influence firms' decisions. 
It's this lack of willingness to invest that we should tackle. And to incentivize firms to do so, we should increase the pressure from above. So through a major program of pension form consolidation, which we saw some early stages of in, in the autumn statement this year, but also from below. So we need to have workers have representation on these company boards to influence long-term planning. Our firms also need to be able to build. Half of investment is in business structures, and we also need housing near our growing firms. As this chart shows, the UK is the only G7 country to have actually not seen an increase in the amount of built-up land per capita since 1990. And if anything, we've seen a fall in built-up land per capita this millennium. Some say that this might be because we're a dense country, um, but denser countries like Japan have been building in this time. And others suggest that we're really good at protecting our green spaces. But again, Germany has a higher share of protected land and has also been building. Indeed, the issue lies with the fact that 60% of English local authorities don't have an up-to-date land use plan in, in place at all. Every area must have a plan. It needs to take place at a functional economic level, and it needs to bind through the fiscal devolution, devolution we talked about. Our investment overall can also be made sustainable by the introduction of a new uh, growth board. At the end of the day, though, this investment ultimately needs to be paying for and that means it's either coming from overseas or higher domestic savings. As this chart shows, the UK's national savings rate is extremely low, the second lowest in the whole of the OECD. The savings rate of UK households is so low that once we've invested in housing, no funds are left for investment in our businesses. To increase household savings, we should start with a 50% increase in minimum pension contributions, but of course, Higher investment also means that some consumption will fall, and so here the government must play a really important role in determining whose consumption that is. For example, who's paying which taxes, something that Lindsay will be addressing in our next session on inequality. So in sum, this growth strategy forms the first pillar of an economic strategy for the UK. Get it right, we can harness our strengths, invest in our businesses and infrastructure, and set the UK up for a more sustainable and prosperous future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily, for setting out the key recommendations so clearly. Um, Swati, over to you to talk a little bit more about the role of a trade strategy and a growth strategy. Perfect. Um, great. So, Austin's already called you a high productivity audience. I should also add from the faces that I can see from here, a very illustrious audience. And I should explain, we're just entering the quiet period, so my comments have been already published and are available for if you want to see further. So my response to the two and a half years of Economy 2030 inquiry today is going to be about what a trade strategy that delivers economic growth should look like. And this is not a new question. There's a long tradition of work. In fact, the building that we're all based in at the Center for Economic Performance at LSE has recently, this year, been named the Sir Arthur Lewis Building. In his 1970s Nobel-winning work, what Sir Arthur Lewis did was to think about what a trade strategy, how, how a trade strategy can be a part of a broader economic strategy to drive economic growth. So this is, you know, in that tradition of work, and since that time in the 1970s when he was writing about it, of course, what's happened is that for the first time in half a century, UK has been tasked with setting its own trade strategy. And what does this strategy mean? It's very important because what it does is it gives families and firms, it shapes what they can buy from abroad, what must be produced domestically, what therefore happens to the content of jobs, productivity, and ultimately living standards in the economy. And more importantly, it sets the plank for, it's a major plank of how Britain interacts with the rest of the world, what our international policy is at a time when there is heightened geopolitical tensions. So after Brexit, our UK trade policy response was very prompt. We signed trade agreements with over 90 countries that covers about 60% of trade. And since then, because the emphasis was on speed of negotiations, we relied on using tools, free trade agreements that are readily available. But free trade agreements are really about goods. 
and it doesn't really build on services, which is the key comparative advantage of the UK. So the UK is a services superpower. I'm not saying that lightly. We're the second largest exporter of services in the world, and services are valued at 400 billion, over 400 billion pounds in 2022. And services exports have been growing, as Emily's just shown, faster than goods exports for almost a decade. So the question then is, you know, are standard templates of trade agreements going to work? And our argument in the inquiry trading up report is that these standard templates for trade agreements don't really offer very material services liberalization, largely because what that needs is regulatory cooperation internationally, which typically has, been, has taken much longer to accomplish. So as an example, even in the new deep agreement that we have with the European Union, there are many, many trade and investment restrictions that have come into place for many services items. And if we look at what happens to the exports of those services items to the EU versus the non-EU, there's been a 7% drop in that. So broadly, my key point is that we can make some policy improvements on that, on that front, but actually the big gains are going to be for the EU and other new trade partners to want to negotiate beyond this boilerplate access that standard trade agreements offer. And our optimistic view is that the UK is, as a global, lead, global leader in services, well-placed to innovate both on the method as well as on the content of signing these sorts of trade, so services trade agreements. So what should that provide us? The main message that we come up with is that there should be a regulatory framework that is set out for international cooperation and services. This is not just words, they're concrete ideas in the report ranging from prototypes, including some that uh, Emily has mentioned, so the prototypes such as digital services agreement with Singapore, or the much more long-standing regulatory cooperation council that the Canada-US relationship has. And because of this regulatory nature of how services trade agreements and international trade and services is done, what we also need to remember is that there'll have to be joined up policy making across government departments to ensure that the strategy that's formulated is consistent internally as well as fits in with the broader strategy for the economy. I'll sort of say one more point which is about goods trade. I think we just have to recognize that that's where the initial impact of Brexit has been most visible. And one of the longer term outcomes of frictions with goods, uh, frictions in goods trade with the EU could be that high value added manufacturing cars and chemicals that Emily showed could see somewhat of a reduction, largely because they're very reliant on European supply chains and a bit of a boost to traditional low productivity manufacturing, which now faces less competition from abroad. So that being said, we think that there are some sort of positives there in terms of thinking about very ambitious options like extending the Northern Ireland Protocol to a UK protocol, which would put, make it much more likely to be put on the EU negotiating agenda. There's also sort of interlinkages that would arise with industrial policy, magnifying the growth impacts of that, as well as being able to secure ac easier access to systemically important supply chains, such as in microchips, food products, that being said, I'm going to quickly summarize by saying that there have been developments in geopolitics as well as industrial policies across the world. What, therefore, it's become even more important to have a coherent trade strategy that's become vital for enhancing economic growth as well as boosting living standards. And as a small open economy, we don't have quite the deep pockets that large trading blocks have, and therefore what's really important now is to be able to do it through policy design to offer a regulatory comparative advantage to businesses, investors, and trade partners. Thank you. Thank you, Swati. Over to you, Tom, to talk about the role of cities in getting growth up. Thanks, Anna, and um, really welcome the report. It's very consistent with the report that we just produced as the uh, big cities of the UK with the RSA that Anna helped us with. Um, showing that there's a £100 billion dividend if we can get those cities up to the um, even the European average. And um, I read 
the presentation this morning has been basically a failure of the most centralised state in the Western world. And anything that comes next has got to address that issue. The, um, not only are we the most centralised state, but we don't really have a coherent plan that brings together industrial strategy, infrastructure and the inequality issues. The only place you can do that really, you can't do it from Whitehall. Um, you've got to do it at the macro level, at that regional level, um, and a strong local level. And, and in, by focusing on cities, that's the way that you can make the biggest difference. Um, the plan needs to be, to me, a, a shared one where the national state backs cities in a way they've never done before. Um, and it recognises the differences between them and the assets that they can bring to the table in the, um, the agenda that Torsten and, Col and Emily and others have set out. Um, that means focusing on the strengths of, of London as the world financial capital. I think we can't have a debate about productivity without focusing on London. And the London issue is mainly about housing and how we can make that happen and do it in a way where the, the strengths of the rest of the country complement what London has got. So the fact that we have Channel 4, um, Bank of England, UKIB, um, Burberry Sky based in Leeds, all of whom are based in London is a really big um, strength that we have together with um, our southern colleagues. We've got to make more of that and, and collaboration between the national, the regional, the local and between the public and the private sectors with academia has got to be the future because that's where the real sweet spot is in, in what's been talked about um, this morning. So whether it's Sheffield's great strength in advanced manufacturing built on the steel city um, and the uh, metal cutting techniques in the academics in Sheffield University and Boeing and McLaren and others coming behind that, whether that's graphene in Manchester, whether it's the NHS being based in Leeds, where we've done work with Boston, MIT in Boston, Sydney, Oslo, and they've said to us, why doesn't the UK make more of the fact that the NHS is based in Leeds and you've got the most data, health data scientists in Europe there? That's the sort of thing where we've got to have a shared common ambition and a shared agenda where resources as well realign behind those plans. So at the moment, um, th we don't really have a productivity puzzle in the north, I've got to say. Um, imagine London with um, Leeds and Manchester, same distance as one end of the central line to the other. Imagine London with one road and one um, tube line to get across from east to west. That's what we're dealing with at the moment, and we just have got to put that right, and we need a long-term infrastructure plan that doesn't involve us safeguarding 700 football pitches of land in the middle of our city centre um, for a project that we didn't ask for but isn't delivered and is, the mind is changed about it halfway through. We just need a long-term plan. We've st it's a miracle, actually, that the cities of the north have been able to provide the job generation and the, uh, the economic growth that they have in the last decade in the context of that. We st we've built 3,000 homes a year in Leeds because we have a plan-led system. As Emily said, that's what you need. The other thing that's happening and that I need to talk about is the crisis in local government at the moment because a quarter of our major cities have, uh, have got commissioners in at the moment and the, the chief execs spend more time talking to those commissars um, than they do global investors. And any productivity plan needs planners, it needs highway engineers, it needs licensing officers. And the local state can't take the strain of the local welfare state anymore unless you're going to get more and more councils toppling over. So there's got to be a realignment between where the money is held and where the capacity is. And I've got to say, during a devolutionary period, Whitehall has expanded quite considerably, and that's got to change as well. The, th the final thing I would say is that devolution is the, cru is the crux of this, and I am not possibly as optimistic and confident as Torsten that fiscal devolution is going to flow in the next few years because people are so scared of the postcode lottery. I've got to say, by the way, anyone who's scared of the postcode lottery, there is a postcode lottery. It means that where you're born um, dictates often your life chances. 
which um, income bracket you're in dictates your life chances. So I'd rather have a postcard lottery based on democracy than I would one based on the accident of, of birth. But nevertheless, um, um, devolution is needed. The mayors need to get double-downed powers and support and resources around transport, around infrastructure. We need infrastructure plans. Most people oppose housing because they're not confident the economic and social infrastructure is in place. Um, and that needs to change. And we could change that through a really integrated plan at that regional level. But we also need local growth plans in every part of the country, in every city. Yes, the bigger ones need um, that realignment of investment around infrastructure. But whether it's the Red Castile plant closing its furnace or the one about to go in Scunthorpe, or whether it's the middle of Leeds, Manchester or Birmingham um, or London, you've got to have a plan for each of those areas. And um, at the moment, I'll, I'll say one thing finally. Despite all of this devolution we've had over the last decade, we still need as cities to write to the Secretary of State to put a roundabout in. That is the reality of this country, how centralised it is, and it's got to change. Thank you very much, Tom. Over to you, Sharon. Let's hear about the business view on business investment. Thank you very much. And uh, I have to say, it's, it's, it's fantastic to be here and also fantastic to see lots of um, friends and familiar faces in the audience. I think um, both the quality but the timeliness of uh, this piece of work is just completely spot on. Um, I think probably the main message I want to give in terms of uh, what really matters for business is really about sort of greater consistency and less caprice, uh, really in terms of the environment for, for business. So the, the sort of necessary, if not sufficient, condition for business is obviously uh, sort of long-term predictability in policy making. And we've heard a bit about this in the context of Leeds. I think it's very striking we have both um, Jeremy Hunt and Keir today because ideally we want to take the sort of political cycle out of long-term decisions be that on housing or planning on infrastructure and actually I think a lot of the conversation for me today is about actually how do we create some of those sort of longer term sort of institutions that enable less volatility and less predictability um, I mean, if it's not sort of heretical as, as somebody who used to be involved in budget processes, but even having fewer fiscal events. So for a business, knowing that twice a year, big changes in, your, in the sort of business taxation in terms of the fiscal environment is the sort of antithesis of being able to plan longer term for, for investment. So um, for business, boring is good. Um, and unpredictability is bad, and I think that's the, the main message I want, would want to give. We, we haven't talked very much, and the report doesn't talk a huge amount about sort of regulation and, and the competition framework, and actually it's interesting that the conversation to the day on regulation sort of touched on, um, uh, on s global services regulation. If you talk to many businesses, and obviously retail is the, is the biggest business by, um, by employment still in the country, the, the balance that we have in the UK between sort of a regulatory framework that supports growth alongside the consumer interest is something that I think is becoming uh, super critical. And we saw that a little bit with the government statement last week uh, supporting, uh, supporting growth. So the number of businesses, myself included, that are concerned about consolidations or partnerships or M&A activity in the UK because it is seen that we've got perhaps a, um, a less open, less balanced, less pragmatic attitude to growth versus a very strong short-term consumer interest, I think is hugely important, particularly in connection with really attracting sort of investment and foreign flows into the UK. So for me, predictability, how we can you know, get a commitment somehow with an election year over the next 12 months whereby big issues around housing and infrastructure, we can get more of a cross-party and cross-party policy-making process, hopefully spurred by today's excellent report. 
And as I say, I think we need more focus on the sort of competition and regulatory regime and whether we've really got the right balance between supporting investment, consolidation at times, where that's the sort of, you know, really improving the sort of commerciality of businesses in the medium term alongside the short-term consumer interest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharon. Um, so over to Diane to talk across the piece. How, how can we improve productivity? So the penalty for speaking last is that lots of really great points have already been made. Um, so I'm going to start by telling you that I hate shopping. And so... Sorry, Sharon. Or, <laughs> that might explain a few things. Um, so I, I wear clothes until the fabric get, gets thin, and there comes a point when it can't take it anymore, and it tears. And I think the UK is at that point, and we're not talking about it enough. Also, although I'd like the Chancellor's positivity and agree that there needs to be some kind of positive story to get Britain going again, um, I do think we need a more honest conversation about our starting point. And what to do about that isn't entirely a mystery. Um, there are lots of great ideas in the report. We've heard many more this morning. Um, last week was National Productivity Week and the Productivity Institute, including work by Anna, focused on a sort of narrower area, but there was a lot of overlap in the kinds of things that we can think of to boost growth again, which is important to raise people's living standards because they, they haven't gone up since um, at least the mid-2000s. Now, the reason that we're poorer than we think and it's, uh, in a danger, the social fabric is in danger of tearing is that we haven't invested enough and we haven't invested enough for decades. Recently, the Productivity Institute put out a note showing this going back to the 1990s. Uh, it probably went back even further than that. It's public and private. It's investment in education and health. It's any kind of investment that you can think about. We haven't been doing enough of it. So clearly, the public sector's got to invest more. As Tom says, there is an absolute postcode lottery at the moment already in terms of your access to infrastructure, depending on where you live. And so this week, the Bennett Institute's putting out a document on uh, calling for universal basic infrastructure, a minimum offer to everybody in terms of transport and broadband, but also health services and amenities, no matter which part of the country you're living in, because that's what gives people the opportunities to find good jobs, to get access to training, and means that businesses and uh, employees can connect with each other. Uh, so there's the public sector. On the private sector investment, I mean, absolutely, the instability means that there's a risk premium for private investors wanting, thinking about putting their money in this country. Um, I think taxes have to go up to get the tax-to-GDP ratio to come down. Um, uh, even in areas where we think we're terrific, I mean, the Chancellor is focusing on AI and, and software, even in AI or even in finance, the proportion of investment in those sectors relative to their own sectoral GVA is lower than um, comparator economies. So even on our leading, uh, most growth uh, uh, promising sectors, we're under investing. And the political economy problem is at the heart of this, I think. Um, the UK is uniquely worse than its comparators in a couple of dimensions. One is the policy instability, which we've already heard about. Um, the other is the lack of policy coordination, which does link to the devolution point. The lack of coordination between different levels of government, the inability of central government to take advantage of local know-how, to assign transport planning to the right spatial level is just appalling. And there's also a lack of coordination of different, across different kinds of government policy. So if you take AI, for example, we're not really at the frontier in AI. We've got one fantastic company that bears most of the burden, DeepMind, and its center of gravity is now moving to Silicon Valley. Uh, across uh, the rest of the AI frontier, we're not there. And to be there, we need um, people to be able to uh, migrate into this country from elsewhere. And you need to join up uh, uh, higher education policy and student debt policy and AI policy to get that all working together. So um, if universities can't, ha can't have foreign students, they need a different financial model because we lose money on educating UK students. So joining up, or another example would be the creative industries. If you hammer the BBC in public service broadcasting, you're not going to have a thriving creative industry sector because they provide advanced market guarantees and training 
uh, and so on for that sector. So um, uh, I'm, I'm not going to carry on because um, it pains repeating points that other people have made really well. But that political economy question, what are the right institutions? How do we uh, have a longer term approach that has some cross party agreement? And how do we get the kind of coordination we need to grow a modern economy across trade policy, competition policy, regulatory policy, and industrial policy? Um, so let's have an honest conversation about the scale of the challenge. Thank you. Right, well, we, we have less than 10 minutes for questions. So um, people on Slido, we might have time for one question there. It's hashtag ending stagnation. Um, we'd like to take a few in the room. Um, I just wanted to ask one thing, just with brief answers if possible, because um, everyone's talked about the role of coordination. Emily mentioned we suggest a national growth board in the report last week. We developed those proposals. What would a growth institution look like? So perhaps for our external speakers, um, do you think a new institution on growth and productivity policies would be good? Do we need a new kind of specified growth and industrial strategy for the UK on those comparative advantage areas, on green technologies, etc.? Tom, maybe first. I'm, I'm tempted to say only if it was based in Leeds, but I'm, I won't. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think it's, a, it's another national solution to what is, is a, a problem that needs to be of the regions and of localities. So... I'd be worried, actually, that it would lead to another passing of the ball to another set of people who, um, who wouldn't actually be invested and, and driven by that um, bottom-up as well as top-down. So, yeah, I, I'd be sceptical, but as, unless it was made up of mayors, leaders, you know, central government people as well. We need a, a massively strong new partnership between the national and the local for me. Thank you. Sharon, what are your views? I mean, I still come back to the cross-party point, and I think it's not necessarily a fantasy area. So on areas of security or foreign policy, actually the parties do join up. And if we regard this as a, I, mean, I hate to use the word sort of national emergency on growth and productivity, but my hope would be that the policy makers, and maybe this is post-election, do start to form cross-party uh, sort of decision making that essentially takes us beyond the five even ten year term of a new government whether that's a sort of mixed party growth commission I, I mean I'm always wary of new institutions that take five years to, to set up and then um, you know you're arguing about pay and rations but I do think there are um, there is a, an enormously strong intersection which I think Torsten and this work has shown cross-party where actually the, there's a huge amount of consensus about the policy ideas, the issues are all for me about execution and political economy. Thank you. And Diane? Uh, to be facetious, yes, let's put it in Manchester, but make the connection to Leeds work properly. So I, I think yes, but I, I do think that it's absolutely right that it has to include localities as well. Great. Okay, let's open up to the floor. Um, try and keep your questions brief if you can. Um, this gentleman at the front, please. Thank you. Uh, Chris Giles from the Financial Times. Um, everyone on the panel has called for more investment, as did Torsten and the report earlier. Given our current account deficit, it's also quite clear that means less consumption and more domestic savings. Could the panel give us their view on how they would sell that to the British population? Great. <laughs> Any more questions? We'll take three together. Um, oh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Will Hutton. Yes, good morning. Uh, great report. Um, I just wonder if you've uh, slightly missed a trick. Maybe you haven't missed a trick. I was, want to pick up on a fantastic presentation by Emily on block holders and the relationship between shareholder structure and the very high rates of return that British companies get for paltry levels of investment. I mean, isn't there a kind of a in the matrix of potential pension fund reform around which a lot of discussion, a kind of way of incentivizing our companies or the savings institutions to take a, a bigger block holder position, wouldn't that have a much more radical impact on kind of target rates of return and investment levels than even full expensing of corporation tax? I don't see it in the report so far. I wonder if you've got any thoughts on that. 
there is a lot on pensions in the report, but let's take the other question. Um, maybe over here. Hi, Anthony Breach, Centre for Cities. The report calls a lot for increasing public investment. Is it more important that we increase public investment by local or central government? Great. So um, would anyone like to take any of those questions given we're so short on time? Tom, do you want to start? I, I think I was careful in saying realignment of money, actually. I, I realised that we've got too, too big a, you know, uh, generally if you were go to go across and listen to the major parties at the moment, there's not a lot of... Um, Let's just raise taxes. So I, I, I think there is money in the system. I think it's badly used. I think there's lots of pepper potting of large numbers of funds which add up to quite a lot of money that could be redirected and commissioned in a way that would be different, that would get a better longer term return. And coming back to Sharon's point about what the private sector needs, and I think this is a bit linked into Will's point as well, um, the plan-led approach does actually achieve results. We, we've done it in in Leeds where we've, to, to achieve 3,000 homes a year, we have to have 110 live sites in the city every day. And to do that, you've got to have the private sector on side right the way through from big to small. But once they see a plan and they know that you're gonna deliver behind it, they'll invest, they'll, they'll start forming small teams, they'll, they'll then develop behind that. So I, I think it is about a longer term approach. I think it is about using the money we've got in the system more effectively and maybe linking up the pension funds um, and others with, the, with that longer term approach so they can take a risk based approach to spatially making sure that they uh, hit the whole country not just London and the South East. Thank you. Emily, do you want to talk a little bit about you know, how we're going to pay for this, how, we, how people can sell that to voters and maybe just at a high level some of the pension reforms that we talk through in the report? Uh, yes, um, I think the key point on the, um, on the fact that we need to raise investment is a couple of things. Firstly, you know, we have, it, it's where micro and macro policy are really pointing in the same direction. So you have the fact that we've just gone through a cost of living crisis. We can see that people without savings were really clobbered by the fact that they didn't have savings. Um, and that was particularly um, because people at the lower end of the income distribution. So it's not necessarily the, the kind of more wealthy people that whose, uh, whose wealth actually raised during the pandemic. It's the people in the lower end of the income distribution. So what was key there is actually raising household savings so that people are able to withstand the shocks that unfortunately seem to, seem to be coming time and time again um, at the moment. But also it points in the same direction for our macro policy. And that's because, you know, we've had this current account deficit for, for a long time now. Um, you know, maybe that's okay, but actually if we are going through a lot of macroeconomic shocks, maybe it is a little bit better to, to look to equalize that a bit more. And we know that, you know, having more savings going into investment is actually, um, there is actually home bias. So if you have a British pension fund, that uh, it's much more likely to be investing in British companies. And you can see that with kind of the Canadian system, as well as with some of the kind of US uh, pension funds as well. Uh, in terms of the pension reforms, obviously, it's a very kind of distributed landscape. I think the main kind of top level point is that we need far fewer funds rather than, um, you know, tons and tons of tiny little funds uh, where you've got a penny in each of them. And so consolidating that across kind of the local government schemes, but also the, the DB pension funds and the D DC pension funds um, is really key there. Great, thank you. Um, Diane, did you have any views on Anthony's question about where, where should that public investment be happening in cities at the local government level or national government level? Well, given how centralised we are, it's all happening at the national level because that's where the money gets doled out. But um, uh, there needs to be much more careful thought about the right spatial level for regional transport planning versus local bus services. So the answer is going to be all of those, and it will depend on the kind of infrastructure that we're talking about. Great, thank you. And Sharon, did you have any thoughts about this engaged ownership? How can, how can we have more pressure on managers from owners, shareholders, to think about long-term value rather than short-term returns? I mean, Will's obviously written extensively on so I think there's, an, I mean, obviously from a, from a business where our 74,000 employees, partners own the business, we're obviously not a, on many levels, we're not a conventional 
business at the John Lewis Partnership because the business is given in trust, trust to the people who, who work on the counter, work, work at the checkout. And I do wonder whether part of the answer is also thinking about the, the structure of our business models and how, how the, the heart of the business is actually incentivized to think beyond quarterly, um, quarterly shareholder value, which inevitably take, causes you to take some very, very short-term decisions, not least in terms of restructurings and, and costs and investments. So I think that's a, alongside the, the pension question and consolidation of pension funds, I think there's still is again a question about whether the structure of our uh, capitalism in this country, I guess if you put it that broadly, um, is, is, is set up actually to think sufficiently long term. Thank you. So we're at 12.16, so I think we probably need to finish right now. So I just want to thank everyone. We could have obviously talked about this for much longer. Thank you to all our wonderful panellists and to you, the audience. Great, there's lots of food for thought there. But as I was saying to you earlier, we've obviously now got growth up. That's all done. We've worked out the kind of economy we are. We've started actually investing in the future rather than living off the past. If we just do that, it is not job done. Because as I showed you at the beginning, that means a more unequal society, not a less unequal. So now we're going to move from growth swiftly into how we get inequality down. And you've got another scarily great panel who are going to give us their views, chaired by Gavin Kelly. So I'm going to stop filling the time because he's now got to the chair and hand over to Gavin. Just give him a clap. Right, let's get going. Uh, we are going to be talking about getting inequality down, which is quite bold because I can see out there what I might call inequality pessimist, i.e. pessimist about our capacity to do this. Uh, I've worked with some of you. Um, and, and that isn't surprising because it is a hard, uh, it is a hard task, as you've heard earlier. Uh, our view is that under current policy settings, if we manage to boost growth, that all else equal would be likely uh, to increase inequality if we don't do anything else. And that is why, as you heard from Torsten earlier, uh, we have proposed a raft of things on pre-distribution, uh, higher employment, good jobs, increased skills, as well as redistribution, a welfare state that doesn't leave uh, some groups, some people behind as the economy grows, and a tax system that shares burdens fairly. Uh, and that is what we are going to be uh, discussing in the next 45 minutes or so. We have a great panel, another great panel. Uh, uh, they, they could all, each of them individually, fill the entire session with their, but uh, I'm not going to let them. Uh, and, and so we're going to try and keep to time. They have promised me they will do so, which is great, because I'd really like, if we at all can, to hear from some of you too. Um, in terms of our speakers, uh, you, I, they probably don't need this introduction, but I'll do this very briefly. Very, very briefly, we've got Mark Drakeford, uh, First Minister of Wales. Uh, since 20... Uh, we've got a cheer. <laughs> the Welsh contingent. Yeah, yeah. Did you bring this, uh, Miss Craig? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 you did. You brought your fans. I like that. I hope you all brought your own fans. Uh, uh, Mark has been First Minister since 2018, which in the current era, I think... Uh, uh, well, that means you've, you've basically seen off four prime ministers and counting, and uh, uh, you probably deserve a prize for longevity or something. So uh, we're really, really grateful to have you here today, Mark. Uh, thank you. And then we're going to hear from Christina McInay, who is the General Secretary of uh, our largest trade union, Unison. Really pleased that you're here. Thank you. Um, and then we're going to hear from Andy Haldane, Chief Executive of the RSA, uh, Government Czar on all matters levelling up, um, and former Chief Economist at the Bank of England. Um, but to kick us off, we're going to hear from Lindsay Judge, who is a research director at the Resolution Foundation, has, done, has led lots of the important work in this inquiry, and Lindsay is going to succinctly set out uh, some of our key proposals when it comes to reducing inequality. Mm -hmm. Lindsay. Thanks, Gavin. Um, so Emily um, set out the Economy 2030 agenda for growth very cogently in the last session, but as Torsten said and Gavin has just repeated, we know that growth on its own does not address the second major problem we face as a country, which is sky-high inequality. And in fact, our modelling has shown that growth alone will drive up inequality over time in the absence of policy interventions that are pre 
or redistributive. So what do we need to do if we don't want to look like the US? We don't want to be an economy that's high growth, high inequality. What does policy need to do in order to tackle inequality? The first objective that policymakers must focus on is raising employment. And that would be inequality reducing, because as my first chart shows, if we, if the, as you get employment gains, they tend to be bottom heavy. So this is showing you the change in working age employment rates um, by income deciles in the decade leading up to the pandemic. And as you can see, that the gains from growth fundamentally accrue to those at the bottom. And in terms of policy, we need to be thinking about three key groups in the next decade. We need to be thinking about what more can we do for working parents. We've obviously had some progress in recent months on the childcare um, offer, and of course, childcare is an area that's devolved as well, so interesting developments in the different nations. But we need to do better. We need to rationalise our childcare system and move towards increasingly a universal offer. We need to do a lot more to help those who are disconnected from the labour market because of ill health. The Chancellor talked about that already this morning. And in particular, we can learn from the example of what we've done with maternity and maintain the links for people who are falling out of work with ill health with their employers. And finally, we need to think about older workers. We need to reduce the incentives for older workers to leave the workplace. Currently, our pensions, rules, and regulations are permissive when it comes to early retirement and then punitive when it comes to going back into the labor market. We need to make changes on that score too. But of course, it's not just about employment. It's also very much about the gains from employment. And one of the big things, of course, is that we know how to do this in the UK. We have form when it comes to redistributing through earnings in the form of the minimum wage. Very sensibly introduced cautiously, ramped up recently. We think there's distance to go when it comes to the minimum wage, which is why we're proposing in our report today that we set it on a trajectory heading towards 73% of average earnings. Now, as the bike goes up of the minimum wage, we know that's tough. We know that's tough but we think that's a worthwhile strategy. But we also think that a good work strategy has to go beyond the minimum wage. And that's for a really simple reason. When Torsten talked this morning, he showed you a chart showing declining satisfaction in the workplace over time, particularly for low earners. Our workplaces are increasingly characterized by precarity. And this chart really speaks to this. This is showing you the level of anxiety that workers say they have about um, unexpected changes to their hours of work. So across the nation, 25% of employees say that they're worried about changes to their hours of work, unexpected changes. But when we look at the lowest two income quintiles, that rises to third. A third of workers and the poorest workers are worried their wages are going to change. What can we do about that? Well, we think you could have a right to a contract reflecting your actual hours. That would help the 1.2 million zero-hours contract workers in this country, for example. We think we should require employers to give two weeks' notice of shifts, and they should be penalised if they change them subsequently. And also, of course, a key way that people see their hours change, as many of us experienced during the pandemic, is if they get sick. We need to increase sick pay to 65% of usual earnings and extend it critically to the lowest earners. But we also think that higher national standards are not enough on their own, and that there has to be institutional innovation. Here I'm showing you some particular problem sectors in the economy. Let me just talk about the top one, social care. Our research has shown, and of course unions have shown this time and time again too, that there's huge issues, complex issues in our social care sector and indeed in others. But in social care in particular, we've noted, for example, that unpaid travel time is leading to a really high risk of underpayment of the minimum wage. There's huge issues around lack of pay progression, lack of training, and no surprise that we have such a profound crisis when it comes to recruitment and retention in the social care sector. What do we need to do about this? Well, we think that for problem sectors, we need to move to something called good work agreements. We need to get employers and employee representatives together, and they need to think hard and work out a program of action for the sector specifics. But we also think, across the totality of the labour market, that we've got to do better when it comes to enforcing our labour market rules. We currently have six agencies and local authorities implementing and enforcing labour market rules in the UK, reporting into seven different government departments. We need to rationalise this system and move towards a single enforcement body on labour market rights. 
Now, I've talked a lot about the labour market, but of course we mustn't forget that there are 11 million working age individuals in the UK who get less than half of their income through earnings. And for them, the benefit system is a huge lifeline. The problem there, of course, is that the value of working age benefits has been on a steady downward slide over time. And this chart really brings that home. This is showing you the real value of unemployment benefits as a proportion of average weekly earnings. And in 1970, that stood at 30%. Today, it's less than half than that. If we don't do something about the value of our working age benefits, those families are on that perpetual decline, disconnected from the experience of the majority. So what do we need to do? We're making a bold statement in the Economy 2030 inquiry by saying that we need to increase working age benefits in line with earnings in the future. We need to reconnect the fortunes of those, the poorest citizens in the UK, with those who are in work. That's expensive. We're really clear about that. That is not a cheap option. But we know that if you uprated the state pension on the same basis in line with earnings, then that could cover half of the cost of that. And we also need to remove some of the sharpest edges in the benefits system. The two-child limit is a perfect case in point. So, earnings, benefits, incomes. What about costs? Well, the number one cost that we know causes major problems and acts as a headwind against living standards is housing. And there's a number of reasons why we have a housing crisis in the UK today. But one of the key ones, of course, is that we haven't built at scale. And this chart points to that. This is showing you housing stock per thousand inhabitants for various OECD countries. Here, no surprise, the UK is languishing at the bottom of the pack. And not just in terms of the ratio of housing stock that we have today, but also how we've failed to build over time. What do we need to do? Well, no surprises, we need to be building at scale, and especially in cities, which, as the previous panel mentioned, which should be our economic powerhouses in the UK, and that's where real pressure points will come when it comes to housing costs. We need to build an adequate share of sub-market housing for those who the market doesn't deliver. And we also need effective support with housing costs via the benefit system, which is why we were so pleased to see the Chancellor announce two weeks ago at Autumn Statement that he was repegging local housing allowance with local rents. We would have been even more enthusiastic enthusiastic if he was doing it in perpetuity and not just for one year. I talked about sharing the gains. Let me talk finally about sharing the pain. Um, we know that we need to be a higher tax economy. We know that there are structural reasons for that. There's demography. There's the transition to net zero. There's the desperate need for public investment <coughs> that Emily talked about previously. And, but if we're going to be a higher tax economy, we also need to be a better and fairer tax economy too. Now, I'm not going to take you through the minutiae of our tax programme in our final report. I commend you to the, to the actual document. But let me talk about three key principles that we highlight. The first is we must work hard towards equal treatment for different sources of income. We currently tax earnings from employment, earnings from self-employment, rents and capital gains in very different ways. We need to start moving and making changes so that that situation changes. The second thing we need to do is um, tax wealth better. Wealth in the 1980s was the equivalent of three times of national income. Today it stands at over seven times national income. But our take of tax take from wealth has barely gone up as a proportion of GDP over that time. There's so much more we could do. And this isn't just about snazzy new wealth taxes. We just need to sort out some of the wealth taxes we currently have, council tax and inheritance tax, for example. And finally, we need to make sure that the sacrifices are fairly shared. So we know, for example, that higher income households are rapidly moving towards electric vehicles, which are tax privileged currently. And that means the exchequer is losing revenue and lower income families are bearing the brunt of motoring taxes. So one of the suggestions we make in the Economy 2030 final report is to introduce a simple per mile road duty for electric vehicles. Our tax package overall reduces the very highest tax rates but raises an additional 1.3% of GDP by the end of the next decade. So, with a good work agenda, reconnecting benefits <coughs> to the value of earnings, tackling housing costs, fairer taxes, that's our agenda for reducing inequality in the Economy 2030 inquiry, and I really look forward to hearing from the panel and from you about it. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Uh, admirably concise. Um, Lindsay had another 20 slides that she could have uh, showed you and obviously uh, didn't for obvious reasons. Um, 
There's lots of other stuff. It's chapter six and seven of the report for the super keen. We could have talked about an apprenticeship guarantee, uh, the major expansion of provision at sub-degree level of training and support for FE, and a huge amount, there's a huge amount in there on tax reform. There really is quite an ambitious agenda of tax, uh, tax cuts as well as tax rises, although net, they, as Lindsay said, they raise more money. So do look at the report. Right, no more ado. Mark, over to you for your perspective. Thank you. Uh, well, Gavin, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, Flanda. Uh, apologies uh, at the beginning. I am going to be rattling a huge amount of stuff past you very quickly, and we'll probably end up speaking in headlines quite a lot of uh, the time, but I want to try and cover as much ground as I can. Uh, I thought I'd begin with two of the propositions in the report, one of which I definitely agree with, the other of which I want to just add a small caveat to. Uh, so the first proposition is that we must be as hard-headed about lower e inequality as higher growth, and I hope that the practical things that I will talk about this afternoon demonstrate uh, that these are not remote possibilities, but things that are actually happening today in that hard-headed way. Uh, the second proposition that the report uh, offers us is that governments have been deeply unserious about what it might take to improve things. And uh, here's a line I, I know line where this is I, going. I enjoyed. Uh, <laughs> we are short term to the core. Mm. Uh, well, I just wanted to uh, put a footnote in there because I won't come back to it otherwise. Uh, but in Wales, we have this thing called the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, which is probably the single most radical piece of legislation passed in the whole of the devolution era. Uh, it places a legal obligation on ministers, and not just ministers, but other public sector mm -hmm. organizations, that when you are making decisions, you have to ask yourself, not simply what impact will this have on people today, but what impact will it have on those generations that come after us. Uh, and in the seven goals of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, the most radical of the goals is that we must work towards a more equal Wales. Now, I'm not saying this because I think the report is an e the, that the act is an easy drag and drop. You would need something different, I'm sure, in different contexts. But what it does do, uh, and I can you know, tell you this from uh, doing it all the time, it does change the culture of decision making. It does act as a powerful counterweight simply to thinking about the here and now when every time you make a decision, <clears throat> you're confronted with a question about what impact it will have on those who come uh, beyond us. Uh, with that out of the way, I'm going to try uh, to respond to the challenge set out in the report, which is to provide confidence that a better future is possible, uh, or to quote that famous uh, Welsh socialist Raymond Williams, uh, that to attempt the genuinely radical thing is to make hope possible rather than despair convincing. Uh, and if there is a recipe for what I think government is about, it is about trying to live up uh, to that ambition. Uh, and in doing so, I'm going to offer you four things, four strands in how we do make hope possible. Uh, and here they are. Uh, I think we have to use the power of a reformed state. Uh, we need to recognize that while inequality is more than money for the poorest uh, in our society, it's money that matters the most. Uh, that when it comes to dealing with in-work poverty, we have to put to work the potency of social partnership. And finally, that in thinking about inequality, we must strive for policy innovation as well as trying to re-equip the policies of the past for contemporary conditions. So there we are, those are my four uh, themes. Uh, the first is about using the power of a reformed state. And uh, you know, I, sometimes when I used to teach these things in universities, I used to get blank looks from students when I would say that uh, in Wales we believe uh, that good government is good for you, uh, as though this was an entirely taken for granted proposition. But of course, we know that there are many people uh, who believe that government does best when government 
does least, and the government should just get out of the way and allow the system to operate effectively. We've never taken that view uh, in Wales. Uh, we believe that when we take <coughs> collective action to tackle common problems, then, and crucially for this session, those solutions reach deepest into the lives of those who need them the most. And I'm just going to offer you two very quick examples of what I mean by that, and they're absolutely contemporary uh, examples. Some of you uh, may have read that we now have a default 20 mile per hour speed limit in all built up residential areas uh, in Wales. There are many reasons for it, but it is an inequality measure in itself. Accidents don't happen accidentally. If you are a child living <coughs> in a disadvantaged family or a disadvantaged community, you are much more likely to be involved in an accident. That accident is much more likely to leave that child seriously injured. The risks are clustered by individuals and by area, and our policy of requiring a 20 mile an hour speed limit in all residential areas is an inequality measure as much as it is anything else. And at the same time, we're consulting at the moment on reforming the school year to bring it into line with the way that people live their lives uh, today. And we do that because we know that learning loss, learning loss is greatest in those families and for those children who arrive at the school gate with the impact of inequality already imprinted on them. But when schools have done the fantastic job they do in investing in those young people over the school year, you come to July, those children are now the beneficiaries of everything that has been done, and they go away. And six weeks later, they have not seen a book. They have not uh, been helped to retain what they've learnt in terms of uh, numeracy. For many of them, they have been hungry uh, during uh, that period. For far too many of them, they face that problem as well. And we will reform the school uh, year in order to help those children the most. Now, I said that this was about a reformed state and using the power of a reformed state. There's a lot in the report itself. You need to set it alongside the Gordon Brown report in order to have a formula to deal with a suffocating weight of entrenched and chronic economic centralization in the United uh, Kingdom. Renewing Labour's devolution project for the middle of the 21st century is, I think, uh, essential if we are going to have governance arrangements in place in order for us to make those economic and social policies actually operate in the lives of the whole of the United Kingdom. I said my second point uh, was that while all those other things are important, if you're in the four million people who live in destitution in contemporary uh, United Kingdom, then money is the answer uh, to your uh, problem. Uh, there's an urgent need to recreate a union of solidarity in the United Kingdom by rebuilding our system of social security so that it does what it originally said it would do. It would give you a guarantee of protection against those things that can go wrong in the lives of any one of us. It will be a slow process, of course, but there are things that can be done not just by central government but by regional governments as well. In Wales, we've retained the council tax uh, benefit, we've retained and bolstered the social fund, and we've done those things that one of my political heroes, Barbara Castle, used to talk about the social wage, mm -hmm. those policies that leave money in the pockets of people who need the money the most. So to give you just three examples in the field of education alone, we have free breakfasts in our primary schools, we have universal free school meals in primary schools, and we've just raised uh, the level of the education maintenance allowance, which we retained in Wales, having been abolished uh, elsewhere. My third point was about in-work uh, poverty, and I'm just for a moment going to highlight the recipe that's there in the report itself, a focus on skills, 
public investment alongside private investment, a willingness to do more to help those nascent injury uh, industries of the future. But the very best examples uh, in Wales, whether it's aerospace in the north, uh, east, or whether it's Japanese investment in the south, east, they share those qualities that you see in companies in other parts of the world. They regard their workers as an asset uh, in creating a successful future. And in Wales, we have the Social Partnership Act, which puts that social partnership model, bringing the trade unions, employers, public and private, the Welsh Government around the same table. We've put the force of law underneath that because those difficult conversations, and they are challenging conversations, are the place where you can craft a landing spot where everybody is prepared to put their collective effort. The work we do through the Social Partnership Council on social care, for example, to take Lindsay's other earlier example, is all about not just pay, but the things that go alongside it, terms and conditions, how people are treated in the workplace, how we get that profession to be better recognised. Social partnership, I think, lies at the heart of a recipe for dealing with that in-work poverty challenge. Finally, uh, to a policy innovation, because while a lot of the report is absolutely about recreating things that have worked in the past in contemporary conditions, we need to think more widely than that as well. And I'll leave you just with this one example. Uh, Lindsay talked about the precariat. Is there any more precarious group <coughs> in our society than those young people who leave the public mm. care system? Is there any group to whom uh, a greater duty is owned uh, by the public, given that the public has taken over the parentage uh, of those young people? Uh, we have a two-year experiment of offering a universal basic income to every child who leaves public care in Wales. It's set at the level of the real living wage. It is unconditional. Those young people get an income that they can absolutely rely upon and a worker to help them to navigate that future. Who knows? You know, we will uh, evaluate it in a rigorous way and have to be open to the fact it may not deliver on what we hope. But the early signs are really encouraging. That those young people offer that guarantee, make decisions which are not about taking a job here and now because you've got to get through the week, finding somewhere to sleep tonight because you don't know where you will be tomorrow. They use the money to invest in things that create a pathway for them to a future in which they can be contributing citizens of the United Kingdom. And different ways of thinking, ways in which add to the repertoire of how we can do what Raymond Williams said, and I'll close with a quotation from another Williams. So uh, this is uh, Archbishop... Uh, Williams, uh, and he was asked in a wreath lecture recently about how he would uh, conceptualize the proper purpose of politics. And he said that it was the patient progress made in pursuit of the common good. And I think uh, I'd live uh, with that. This is a long journey. The report is clear about that. But if we're prepared to set out on it with patience or with progress, in mind and knowing that the common good is the lodestar that guides us on that journey, then I think we can have the optimism that the report asks for. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mark. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, patience and perseverance is what uh, we are all about here. Um, Christina, a trade union perspective. Thank you, uh, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. And um, uh, there's so much in this report that uh, certainly my union would support. And uh, I want to thank Mark because I think what they're doing in Wales is an inspiration for what we could be doing in other parts of the UK. Um, so I just wanted to focus on a few quick areas, um, uh, and certainly in terms of us. You won't be surprised to hear from Unison's point of view as the biggest union and the biggest public sector union that we think investing in public services is absolutely essential if you want to break down equalities, uh, uh, inequalities in this, in this country. We've had a government that for the past 13 years hasn't seen any value in investing in public services. And 
we've seen the damage that has caused to both growth, to the economy, uh, and indeed um, to uh, equalities in this country. The consequences of structural uh, inequality are, are very apparent. We see, and this isn't just the past 13 years, so I'm not just blaming the Conservative government, this is something that's been going for many years, uh, is that undervaluing of the skills that many people have, particularly women, uh, it bring to the labour market are just not valued. Um, you know, we pay the people who um, who manage the ticket barriers at stations and and, uh, and the underground. They get paid more than uh, than the people who work in care homes. If you look at the people who look after animals <coughs> in a zoo, will get paid more than people who look after your children, my children, when they went to nursery or a childminder, because we don't place a value on what are seen as women's skills, whether that's caring, cleaning, catering, um, and uh, um, you know, administration, a myriad of other, other skills that, that they bring to the workplace. And that needs to fundamentally change. And part of that is structural. I'm going to mention something that I know everybody eyes glaze over, but job evaluation, a big issue in the public sector. Um, and actually, this is really important because it's how you boost <coughs> pay is by getting recognition for the work that people do. I, we have a, a broken social care system in this country, and until that's fixed, that impacts on all of us, whether you're a worker in that sector or whether you're someone whose family and relatives and loved ones depend on it. And that also impacts on whether people can go out to work. Until you've got the social care sector sorted, that will not happen. And I also want to mention, um, I, I've, I've talked about early years workers, but early years, investing in early years, there's been evidence has been around for years and years. I remember when Gordon Brown introduced um, uh, Sure Start, the evidence was all there that investing in early years pays off in the long run because it has such an impact on disadvantaged children and Im impacts on their whole life as they go forward. And as I say, evidence has been there for years and years on this. So that is an investment that actually benefits the whole of society. Um, Taxation, of course, is, is a massive issue for us because that's how I'm constantly being asked how you're going to fund all these things that you want in the public sector. I won't go into it in detail, I think, just to say lots of support from Unison in terms of moving towards a more progressive taxation system, particularly things like um, uh, capital gains tax, where if you, make your, if you make your living through renting out property, you're probably paying less in tax than the tenants that may be working in the care home down the road. And that cannot possibly be right. Um, and um, also, uh, uh, for us, one of the key issues is making work better and making work pay better uh, and making people more productive through paying them more money. Um, and what do we need for that? We need a legal framework that penalises poor working practices, whether that's insecure work, uh, compulsory zero hours, the kind of the gig economy and the fake... Um, uh, self-employment that we, we see people being forced into. And what we need is a, a, a framework that encourages good practice, so better enforcement of employment and, I would say, trade union rights. Reform of sick pay, which you've already covered. Um, uh, uh, and w uh, one of the other key things is, is making it easier to bring cases of discrimination. So the burden of proof in race discrimination, of disability discrimination is still very high, very difficult. I'm being told I've got one minute, I'm gonna to have to speed up. Um, making equal pay much easier, particularly for group claims. And um, one of the key things will be uh, introducing fair pay agreements in, in certain sectors. And I very much welcome Labour's commitment to making the care sector the first one that they will actually introduce that. That will have significant impact on low paid workers in those sectors. But it's not just about pay, it also has to be about recognition of the skills they bring, the fact that these are not low skilled jobs, they may be low paid, they're not necessarily low skilled, and that has to be recognised and those skills need to be paid for. Um, and I have to apologise, as you know, I, I have to leave because You've the been the summoned onto the world the at one. There's a government announcement <laughs> on something mad that I have to go and speak on. <laughs> <laughs> Another one, I should As an <laughs> occupational hazard. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. Um,
Thank you very much, Christina. A, a bunch of great <laughs> points. Um, and thank you for your time if you need to slip away. Uh, over to you, Andy, inequality between places. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, a massive congrats to you and the resolution team for this fantastic report. I couldn't take issue with any of the diagnosis or indeed much of the prescription, including around the tax and benefit stuff that Lindsay set out so clearly. Um, but given where we are, we need real boldness. So let me drop a few bold suggestions Great. into the pot to get the conversation going. So um, the most powerful thing that a powerful person can do is to give away power. Um, Gordon Brown demonstrated that on his first day in office. Uh, his signature initiative then was to cede power to of monetary policy to the Bank of England. Uh, audacious and bold move, but it worked. And in some ways it was the signature of his long chancellorship. And I think we need similar degrees of boldness and audacity now uh, from the new chancellor, whoever she or he uh, might be. Um, now is the time uh, for the new chancellor not to play the role of magician conjuring up new fiscal rabbits from the hat, but rather to play the role of the magician's assistant by cutting themselves in two and the institution over which they preside. What do I mean by that? First, we should consider the separation of, of the Treasury's finance and economy functions the conflation of which I think has blighted UK growth policy over many decades for the entirely understandable reason that the fiscal first inclinations of the Treasury tend to take preeminence. Now, an economy ministry would be something standalone with its own minister and Whitehall department, except I wouldn't put them in Whitehall. I would put the new economy ministry instead in Darlington, in what is currently uh, the Treasury's alternative campus. What better signal of growth intent and of spatially rebalancing our economy than to do that? Now, those of you in the audience will think, we've heard all this before, Andy. Hasn't this been tried? Do you not read the George Brown story or indeed the Michael Heseltine story or the Vince Cable story? That all withered on the vine uh, of the Treasury. And that is right, there's no chance this could work without buy-in from numbers 10 and 11. So my suggestion would be that overseeing this national growth strategy is that triumvirate of PM, finance minister, and new economy minister, supported by a common secretariat, a new, if you like, Council of Economic Advisors, US style, providing analytical and policy support probably overseen by someone brilliant uh, like Gavin or Torsten. Um, God help us. Uh, new job for you. Yeah. Um, accompanying that, and at the local level, we do need a much fuller-throated and whole hearted approach to Devo than the debate we have even had so far. And that means Devo not just of spending powers, but crucially of fiscal powers as well on both fronts, we remain, in my mind, too timid. That would mean redrawing the Devo contract, not just for the English regions, but for Wales, for Scotland, and in time for Northern Ireland as well. Crucially, crucially, in terms set not by central government, but by uh, local leaders. And because no good deed goes unpunished, and to bridge what could be, I think, a gap bordering into a chasm between new powers and responsibilities, I would augment that with a standing second chamber of citizens' assemblies to keep local leaders' feet to the flames and fully attuned with the public's need. And the third point, Gavin, yep. is we need a new institutional ecology for the financing of local areas. The current one simply does not work. For me, one means of doing that is to create the equivalent of what many other countries have, which is a national development bank, albeit operating on a deeply decentralized basis. That would comprise a centralized spine of pooled expertise 
to enable local areas to serve up a portfolio of local projects. Right now, those local projects carry an enormous risk premium relative to London projects. One way of beating that premium back is by drawing upon the central pool of expertise. On augmenting that with a consolidated pool of capital to finance those projects, a pool that would come from the consolidation of existing pension pots discussed in the previous panel, but augmenting that with a consolidation of existing quasi-public institutions, namely the British Business Bank mm. and the National uh, Infrastructure uh, Bank. Now, I'm not naive enough to think that merely shifting governance and powers in institutions would be sufficient to take the UK from that stagnating state to that super highway. A lot more is needed, a lot more suggested uh, in today's report. Nonetheless, I do think that those governance shifts of the type I have outlined are absolutely necessary, if not sufficient conditions for springboarding growth. Local strategies, growth strategies, pursued by emboldened and empowered local leaders are the national growth strategy this country needs. We've had separate panels, Gavin, mm. on national growth yes. and growth and balance. In fact, it's the self-same diagnosis and will be the self-same set of solutions. Growth built from the bottom up, doing some of the things I've discussed today and some of the stuff here in the report. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, thank you, all of you. Uh, time is racing on. Um, we've, had, we've had hundreds of questions on Slido. Uh, there's people firing them in. I'm not going to do justice to them all. I'm going to bounce off um, various ones to pose one quick question, which you're going to answer in a, in a minute each, if you can. Um, and they'll be, they're quite crunchy ones. Um, so, Andy, I'll start with you. Uh, we have heard this morning about the need to grow... Uh, particularly England's second cities, and to develop more high-value, high-paying jobs in those cities. This panel is about reducing inequality. Yep. Uh, if you follow the prognosis set out, we've heard this morning, will you not get higher levels of inequality inside some regions, even if that means lower levels of inequality between regions, and would that be a good thing, or is that a problem? Yep. So the UK stands out, distinguishes itself for all the wrong reasons, because it's, it's wide and widening degree of inter-regional inequality. Yep. Um, so investing uh, in our superstar sectors to drive those um, higher wage, high school jobs is crucial for closing those gaps. If you like, the £100 billion dividend that would come from investing at scale uh, in the UK's second cities. Might that have as a side effect some widening of intra regional yep. equality? Possibly. But with a bigger pie to play with, yep. there's every chance then we can invest in the intra regional connectivity and intra regional safety net and intra regional skills that will then help lift wider boats in the city region. I'm thinking in particular of satellite and some stranded towns. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Uh, Mark, now, there's a whole agenda here on tax, um, and there's a whole proposal on reforming council tax uh, in England. Uh, lots of people laugh at you when you propose that. Uh, I worked on it 20 years ago, and I got laughed at by some <laughs> senior cabinet ministers. It's very hard, and that leads to a kind of fatalism, which, which is nuts. You have had a revaluation in Wales, <clears throat> and you're about to have another one, I think. Um, what is your lessons for us here about the viability of taking on this horribly iniquitous tax, which causes a fair chunk of some of the problems we're talking about today? Not all of them, but some of them. Well, uh, first of all, it is really hard, uh, because you will undoubtedly hear from uh, all the people who will be asked to pay more, and yep. you'll hear very little from the much larger number of people who will be paying a little bit uh, less. But if you're serious about inequality, then you just have to grasp uh, this nettle. You know, the council tax is the, the most regressive tax uh, we have. You pay a much higher proportion of your income on council tax if you live in a band A property than if you live in a band uh, I property. 
We will revalue again in Wales. We're the only part of the United Kingdom that has 40 years to have a revaluation. We'll do it again, and we will make the tax within its limits more progressive than it is uh, currently. The message is, you know, you don't get many chances at this. You've got to be bold. If it's the right thing to do, you've got to be prepared to see it through. Our consultation has the unique, uh, I think, um, current uh, attributions of being praised both by the IFS and the Taxpayers Alliance. Well, there you go. Uh, Not every day. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Not every day you pull that off. Uh, when's this going to happen by, just so we can...? Uh, the consultation is asking people how quickly they want to see reform and how far they want reform to okay. go. Okay. Uh, Lindsay, we've had... So we're in this fine document setting out, and you, you, you said it, I just want to say it again, to link social security benefits for working age people to earnings growth. That is a big deal. Uh, we've had, I've, I've had lots of, whenever I've talked about this, I'm like, and see some of it online, various versions of, are you mad? Are you killing work incentives? As well as like, we can't afford it. But there's, that, there's a kind of a genuine question about what does this do to employment and the incentive to work? Uh, what's, what's your answer? Well, I suppose the first thing to say is reducing the value of benefits indefinitely is, is neither moral nor a sustainable um, way of increasing work incentives. I mean, on the specifics of linking working age benefits to the value of earnings, of course, that doesn't do anything to work incentives. It basically just freezes them at the current, um, at the current level. But I think also our proposal has to really be seen in the round. So it has to be seen alongside the other things that I pointed out, the, the rising um, minimum wage, value of the minimum wage, um, better good work agenda. And those are, those are positive things that increase work incentives. One of the things we heard in again and again in some of our qualitative research in the inquiry was that work is so unpleasant for so many people these days that they withdraw from it as much as they can. You know, people will work as many hours as they need to pay the bills, and that's it. That's not a, that's not a satisfactory situation. We need to do better on the good work side as well to increase work incentives. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, I'm conscious that I'm stood between 500 people and their lunch. Uh, so I think, and I'm really sad to do this because there's so many of you here, but I think, I think I'm getting a look. Yeah, I think we're going to call it um, time now. So would you help me thank our panellists? Um, Thanks to all of you. Lunch is downstairs. Uh, we are serious about getting inequality down. It can be done, so thank you.
And you've all gone quiet about 90 seconds too early. <laughs> so if you could just gently, don't start getting too chatty with each other. I'm giving you 60 seconds because otherwise the good people of the British broadcast will be very angry if we don't start at 2.15. I'll tell you, I'm not going to do that today. We're going to start on budget and on time. <laughs> so give us, another t give us another minute. Chat, then go immediately quiet. Right. The, um, yeah, see, I told you, just a top audience. Uh, thank you all for coming back from lunch. Now, this morning we talked about investing for the future, and we talked about making a fairer country. And you guys have invested your time with us today, for which we're grateful. We've invested in your lunch, and everybody got someone, because that is what equality looks like in modern uh, Britain. Now, we have published a book about economic policy, but it turns out that it's actually easier running think tanks than it is running the country, because you have to do them. Yeah. And you heard some of that in the lines on Jeremy Hunt's face this morning. Morzani asked him some very mean questions. The, um, uh, but you're now going to hear from another person who would like to be a doer for economic policy, from Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party. He's going to give you a speech, and then we're going to have some more mean questions, I reckon, um, from Zani, who's going to come and join us on the stage after that. And then we'll have time for questions for all of you. So can you all welcome the leader of the Labour Party, Keir Starmer. Uh, thank you, Torsten. It is a real privilege to speak at an event like this, dedicated to the biggest question in British politics. And on behalf of an organisation that always shines an unsparing light on what working people need, the economic security that is essential for their hopes, their aspiration, their future, the purpose which drives everything my Labour Party seeks to achieve. So I want to start by thanking you, Torsten, all the commissioners on the Economy 2030 inquiry, and everyone here at the Resolution Foundation for all the vital work you do guiding that mission. I know it's been a busy year, and I'm sorry I can't promise that next year will be any easier. Now, I suspect that this is a room that likes a graph, uh, and not in the way the Lib Dems do. <laughs> so I'd like to start by drawing your attention to a chart published by
by the Resolution Foundation following the autumn statement. Some of you will have seen it before. It's truly shocking because what it shows is that this parliament is on track to be the first in modern history where living standards in this country have actually contracted. Household income growth down by 3.1%. Britain worse off. Now, over the last 13 years, we may have become a little desensitised to findings like this. But these aren't the concerns of the past. This isn't living standards rising too slowly or unequal contractions and concentrations of wealth and opportunity. This is Britain going backwards. Decline. Not just diagnosed subjectively by politicians. A decline that can be measured and experienced in the homes, the pockets, the aspirations and anxieties of millions of people across Britain. Now, I'm not here today to hit you over the head with the statistics that flow from that. That's Torsten's job. <laughs> but what this does to a country, the cultural trauma, this needs to be understood. I go back to the 1970s, growing up in an ordinary working class household, a decade where we had our fair share of cost of living crises. I know what this feels like. I know when you're struggling to make ends meet, and we were, that the natural response of working people to work harder and harder can feel like you're running faster and faster into a brick wall. That rising prices create this kind of what next anxiety, a fear and it really is that, of going to the shops because of the decisions you might have to make. And yet, that graph shows unequivocally that this is worse than the 1970s, worse than the recessions of the 1980s and 1990s, worse even than the global crash of 2008. And before anyone ventures the pandemic and the war in Ukraine as explanations, big shocks, Undoubtedly, I point to the evidence the Economy 2030 inquiry has set out at length that our productivity failings, the root cause, predate those shocks. And that other countries, comparable countries, have dealt with those same challenges much more effectively. So we are in a hole, no doubt about it. And what this feels like is a, a clouding over, a, a loss of the future. Because what my parents felt in the 1970s was that whilst day-to-day -day life was often tough, the future would be a happier place. Britain would be better for your children. Hard work in the end, in the long run, would be rewarded. Uh, and that was actually a comfort to them, a security blanket, if you like but one which for working people in Britain now, sadly, no longer exists. That is the upshot of that graph. A political consensus that if you work hard and play by the rules, you'll get on, which is a glue that binds British society together, has become nothing short of a lie for millions. It's a well from which so many political horrors can spring. But I say to all of you, if we are privileged enough to be elected next year, the quack diagnosis, the search for distractions and excuses, all of that ends. Because the defining purpose of the next Labour government, the mission that stands above all others, will be raising Britain's productivity growth, a goal that for my Labour Party will become an obsession and that's a big change for us. Having wealth creation as your number one priority, that's not always been the Labour Party's comfort zone. Trust me. But that's the change I knew was necessary. That's the change I've delivered. And my party is united behind it. We see clearly the country before us. But I do want to be clear. It's not the case 
that any growth will do. We can't be agnostic about the sort of growth we pursue. The growth we need must better serve working people and must raise living standards in every community. Now, I know that this is a room that will know exactly how hard a mission like that is. We all know the headwinds, the revolutions in energy, science, technology, the rising geopolitical temperature, terrorism, climate change, securing our borders, an age of insecurity. We see all of that. And yet the truth is, even before so many of these threats, it wasn't exactly a golden age for living standards, equality or productivity, was it? And even during the last time we were in government, even when we enjoyed the most sustained period of redistribution in British history, did it redistribute dignity and respect to working people? Or was that glue for too many places starting to come a little unstuck? Now, the truth is, despite all the headwinds, despite the inheritance being stored up for us, this is a new era. And we must establish, as other politicians have in the past, a new economic consensus with a different model of growth, a different set of values, and a different analysis of the state and its role in the economy. Now, some people have called this modern supply-side theory because it recognises that the unchanging fundamental, that growth comes from the supply-side expansion, now needs a new toolkit. Others have called it productivism, acknowledging the obsession with raising productivity that is now required. They're both good, but for me, the best description comes from my favourite economist, who calls it securonomics, which is not easy to say. <laughs> but nonetheless, Rachel Reeves' description is perfect, because in a single word, it captures all the insights that will shape this era and our approach. First, that the stability we enjoyed during the Great Moderation, that period of calm before the financial crash, and the conditions it provided for hyper-globalisation, that era is over. Cooperation and trade must now respect a mutual need for security. Second, that broad-based growth, economic security for every community, is now the only way to a stable politics and national unity. In short, we have to deliver on levelling up. We have to provide a more secure foundation for working people to get on, with cheaper bills, more home ownership, and stronger worker rights. But most of all, we have to provide sustained economic stability. This isn't just rhetoric. When politics keeps lurching, when you lose control of the economy, as this government has done, that loads political insecurity onto the backs of working people and family finances take the hit. Third insight, a sticking plaster approach to public investment, seen again in recent cuts to capital investment, is bad for business investment, bad for living standards, bad for growth, and in the end, bad for the public finances as well. Fourth, that the old laissez-faire complacency on industrial policy will not deliver the long-term stability that investors need in this era. And fifth, that in a world where the likes of Putin will weaponise key supply chains, outsourcing critical industrial capacity is damaging not just for economic security, but also for national security. Now, if you fail to act on these five principles, the end result is an economy more vulnerable to the shocks of our age of insecurity. And at the level of ideas, that, in a nutshell, is the economic story of Britain over the past 13 years. 
The Tories have been waiting around for the genteel conditions of the great moderation to return, rather than letting go of a failed ideology. They have refused to reassess the role of government as the careful steward in tough times for security, growth, and economic stability. Because government can and must set the mission. Government can and must shape markets, not just submit to them. Government can and must reform our economic institutions rather than just mop up after the event with the state's big checkbook. And above all, government can and must hold out the hand of partnership to business, build shared institutions like a national wealth fund, like an industrial strategy council, like a joint undertaking on skills, a new architecture for growth, a new foundation for security, security from tyrants, security from global headwinds, security for working people and businesses. That's securonomics. And no matter what is stored up for us, it will remain our North Star. But look, of course, we can't ignore our financial situation. So while I welcome some of the individual measures in the autumn statement, tax cuts for working people are a good thing. It was also a budget for growth that ended up downgrading growth and a budget for tax cuts that confirmed the highest tax burden since the war. A fiscal sleight of hand that showed the government is quite prepared to salt the earth of British prosperity in pursuit of its political strategy. Now, I don't think any of you expect me to announce Labour's spending envelope on this stage here today. And I won't. <laughs> Nonetheless, it's already clear that the decisions the government are taking, not to mention their record of over the last 13 years, will constrain what a future Labour government can do. I mean, sometimes you have to laugh when they talk about that note in 2010. Because the comparison between 2010 and today is instructive. Compared with 2010, now, Debt is much higher, interest rates much higher, growth stagnant, British standing diminished, public services on their knees, inflationary pressure, pressure serious, taxes higher than at any time since the war. None of that was true in 2010. Seriously, never before has a British government asked its people to pay so much for so little. And that's why growth is everything. It's not just the quickest way out of this. It's the only way. The path to public service investment and keeping taxes competitive. It will be a hard road to walk. No doubt about it. And anyone who expects an incoming Labour government to quickly turn on the spending taps is going to be disappointed. Inflation, debt, taxes are now huge constraints. Of course, we will make different choices on the non-DOM tax status invested in cutting NHS waiting lists, on removing private school tax breaks invested in high quality teaching and our children's mental health. But at the same time, we will be ruthless when it comes to spending every pound wisely. I ran a public service in the days of austerity. I know how hard it can be, but I also know you can always find ways to improve delivery, change your practice, your behaviour, reform your approach. And when times are tough like they are now, that is the least that people expect. Put it like this, there are millions of people in this country right now who wake up in the morning and know every day will bring a fight for every penny, just like the last day. My sister is one of them. I will say to her, let's go to the pub for lunch. And she will say straight away, I'll make sandwiches. So I've said to every member of my shadow cabinet, when they're drawing up their plans for our manifesto, think carefully. 
about how precious every pound is for the people that we must serve. Hold them in your mind's eye and approach the public finances, spending decisions, like it's their money. Because at the end of the day, it is. But look, this is a council of realism, not despair. The UK has huge assets, flexible product and finance markets, a highly educated population, world-class universities, this city, an economic giant, a global economy that is hungry for the services and sectors where Britain excels, life sciences, the creative industries, technology, clean energy, financial services, advertising. And then there's the potential of the places that have been ignored, passed over, disregarded as a source of growth and dynamism. A potential that I believe is routinely underestimated. And so with Securonomics as our guide, there are big steps we can take quickly that will get British growth moving. One, we can get Britain building again. We're the only country in the G7 where land development per head has decreased in the past century. The dream of home ownership, ever more distant, working people shelling out more of their income to chase it. Less security and opportunity. So yes, we must bulldoze through the restrictive planning laws. We must remove the blockages that choke the supply side of our economy. Stop us building the warehouses, train lines, grid connection, wind farms, laboratories and homes our country needs. Step two, we can back British business with political stability and certainty. With a competitive tax regime, we've shown our determination on that front. A new direction on skills, reform of the apprenticeship levy to give business more flexibility and incentivise investment. Technical excellence colleges, specialising in the high growth, high shortage skills that we need. But above all, with that new partnership, a proper industrial strategy drawn up with business and a national wealth fund that can de-risk and crowd in major private investment because we believe that is our job. Not to shower taxpayers' cash on favoured companies, picking winners. This isn't the old dogma. But in this global economy, it is negligent not to take a view on which sectors can compete and even more negligent not to use the power of government to back them properly. Now, this is mission critical, because we will never arrest our decline unless we become a high investment nation. Finally, three, we can make work pay. You know, even now, in the face of the ample evidence on the good work provided by this inquiry, some people still see flexibility in our labour market as one-sided. The growth comes not from a labour market that asks, how can we make workers more productive, but from driving down wages, rights and conditions. Mark my words, we will consign that argument to history. And I say this to business as well. This is a Labour Party more committed to working with private enterprise than ever before. But a partnership must have a purpose, and the returns of private enterprise must be better shared. Your country needs higher investment. Your workers need a fairer return, and both will be good for your productivity. So we will broker a new deal with increased mental health support, a fully funded plan to cut NHS waiting lists, an end to zero hour contracts, no more fire and rehire, a bold new act to stamp out racial injustice and a real living wage. So reforming our labour market, reforming the institutions that drive business investment, reforming planning and infrastructure delivery, three significant steps we can take quickly three significant departures from the current British growth model, and all three laser-focused 
on clear challenges for our productivity and three clear divides on growth that will shape the general election. Sorry, I do have to mention it. Because it is a big election. Tory decline has been a disaster for the British people. Labour will offer a new deal for the public. Stronger growth, rising incomes, creating the wealth we need to fund our public services. That's the direction we need. That's my ambition for Britain. A chance to turn the page on a miserable chapter of decline. And with a new economic plan, with a new determination, with growth that will deliver the security working people need, we will walk down the hard road towards national renewal. A Britain building again, growing again, believing again that we will get our future back. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, that was very clear. And uh, you have said raising productivity will be an obsession for a Labour government, that it will be the defining purpose of the next Labour government which is, uh, frankly, music to the ears of this room. Um, and, let's... and very unusual for the Labour Party. <laughs> so let's, let's figure out how you're going to get to this, make this obsession work. And let's start with investment, because it's very, very clear from this report here and, and indeed from all the work that everyone does on productivity that investment is key. And let's start with public investment, because you describe the government's approach as sticking plaster economics on, on public investment. Yep. Now, I want to know what your approach is, because... As I understand it, what, it was September 21 that the Shadow Chancellor promised an additional 28 billion of capital investment each year to support the transition to net zero. That was your flagship policy. It's all we all wrote about. This year, you repeated it, but without the word additional. I think it did, wasn't really mentioned at the party conference, and unless I missed it, you literally didn't mention that number today. What has happened to the 28 billion? Are you still committed to increasing public capital investment, and will you hit it within the next parliament? Well, look, firstly, I'm not going to shy away from the challenge that we face when it comes to investment. And um, we need to create the conditions for both public and private investment. And that goes to the 28 billion uh, as well. And I'll come directly to your um, question. Um, what we want to do is have investment that triggers, and Rachel Reeves has set this out, a sort of three to one ratio of public investment triggering private investment by a ratio of three to one. That isn't happening at the moment. It hasn't happened for a very, very long time um, because we haven't created the conditions for it. The conditions for it, and I've spoken, I don't know to how many investors and businesses about this, is um, a conversation that is always along the same lines that says we've got the money to invest, but we're not investing at the moment because the conditions, there's too much chopping and changing. There isn't any strategy. There isn't any long-term thinking. So we've got to set those conditions um, we've got to remove the barriers as well. That's why I talked about um, planning, about the grid, about an industrial council. On the 28 billion, the first thing to be absolutely clear is what is the purpose of the money? Because um, the, I intend to have a mission-driven Labour government with only five missions. The main mission is growth, economic growth, as I've set out. Um, the other missions, only four of them, clean power, 2030 is one of them, are to ladder up to that mission. The 28 billion... Uh, we will ramp up to that in the second half of the um, Parliament um, and it will be used to trigger that other investment from the private sector. And we'll ramp up. It's not a question of the investment not starting until the middle of the next Parliament. It will be ramped up to that point. It is, of course, subject to our fiscal rules, but I am confident that if we turbocharge the growth that we need, that we'll be able to achieve the investment we need within the fiscal rules. But if you are ramping up in the second part of the parliament, just to be clear, that probably means that you are overseeing a net decline in public investment for much of your tenure. Well, we will be ramping up in the second half but, of the parliament. But will you be overseeing parliament. a decline, at least at the beginning, in public well, investment? Look, I mean, the, the figures we're going to inherit are, are, are pretty awful figures. I have yeah, to but you have choices. That. Once you're in government, you can start, decide, you could say... We need to invest in public investment is essential for growing this economy. That's, in fact, what this report yeah. suggests. And we're therefore going to borrow to invest. But you're now saying you will not do that. Well, 
we will borrow to invest subject to our fiscal rules. That's what the 28 billion ramp in the second half of the parliament is all about. But I do think it's a mistake to think that is all that you need to do to trigger growth because if we don't create the conditions of stability, we won't be able to trigger growth. If we don't, I mean, when I talk to investors and say, what's the biggest problem with investment? They say, your planning laws, your regulations. Um, if they're in the energy sector, they will say within the first few sentences, the grid is too slow. Um, I've got a conversation seared on my memory about um, wind turbines and had the conversation with a CEO of an energy company, how quickly can you build me um, a wind turbine factory? The answer was two years. I said, oh, that's good. And he said, it'll take 13 years before you actually get energy out of it because I'm going to lose five years to planning. And even when I get there, I'm going to lose six years before the grid then crawls towards me. So I accept the challenge on investment. I do not accept that that is the only question that we are confronting here because we can change planning without money. We can change the approach to the grid without money. We can look at the regulators and align the regulators without money. We can reform our public services without money. I run a public service. If you put more money in the top, you tend to get a product, better product out. But if you want a really better product, you've got to reform it. So there are other things we can do. And I think sometimes all of us get into this habit. And it's a habit the Labour Party's had for a long time which is thinking that the lever that is spend investment is the only lever that can ever be pulled. I don't accept that. Um, I think there are other levers that need to be pulled. And I, I can honestly say, with most businesses I'm talking to, the, the question of how much are you investing is way down the line compared with are you prepared to take the tough decisions that will create the, the conditions in which we can uh, come up alongside you and share your ambition. Do you know, listening to you, I'm sure most people in this room would agree and frankly, the Chancellor said something very similar this morning. And he was talking about planning reform. He was talking about all of his 110 uh, growth-enhancing uh, things that he had in his autumn statement. When I listen to you, you've scaled back your, your public investment. You want to make it affordable. You're focusing on planning reform. You're focusing on all of these other things, which are also there and the Tories want to do too. Just tell me, what, is, what are the big differences now between what you're proposing and what they're proposing in order to enhance growth? Well, the first thing I'd say is they've had 13 years to yeah, do these things. Yeah, yeah, but let's look forward. A, but no, no, well, sure, but I mean, you can't, we are in this hot, the, the defining feature of the last 13 years has been pretty well stagnant growth. It's the root cause of pretty well all the problems that we have. So to come along 13 years down the line and say, we're now gonna do the things we could have done 13 years ago, it does lack a certain plausibility. When it comes to planning, um, it was this government that in 2015, I think, pretty well put the kibosh on onshore wind farms deliberately. That was their strategy and their policy. It's this government that took down the targets for house building. That will mean, by the way, very few houses being built. Everybody knows that. Um, the Prime Minister knows that. So there is a plausibility problem. But what we've got is a strategy. We've got a mission-led government. We've got clarity about what we're trying to achieve. And we are creating the partnership that we're going to need with business. We're, I mean, the, the fact we're having much more business engagement is, is much discussed um, uh, across the media in politics. This isn't just you know, coffee and croissants around the usual breakfast table saying the same thing over and over again, which drives me nuts. Um, it's actually quite detailed discussions now with business about how we're going to hit the ground running in a year's time quite granular discussions about how quickly we can achieve things. So we've gone well beyond the how are you, what's your name, what are you doing, to a really constructive set of engagements that mean that I don't want any conversation had by my shadow cabinet in the first 100 days of an incoming Labour government, if we get that far, that they could have had now. And that's the mindset we're in. So let's talk about, I've got so many questions in only about three minutes, but um, you talk, you said that you're now focused obsessively on productivity. You also said that Wealth creation is your number one priority, yep. something I think Margaret Thatcher would have agreed with. Um, have you therefore given up on dis redistribution? No, of course not. Um, but I think it's very important to, to recast the way redistribution should work. I mean, there, there's a model of growth that we could put forward, which would be to say London and the South East is a power engine of growth, which it is, and that's a good thing. And therefore, redistribution can be the sort of one-word answer for the rest of the country. That's not good enough. That's the mistake we've made in the past. And that, that lacks the basic dignity and respect that working people 
want, they want their economy to grow where they are. They want their place to be part of the wealth creation. They don't just want their place to wither and somehow they're propped up by redistribution from growth elsewhere. This is a, it's a fundamentally new chapter of Labour's um, political thinking. And it comes very much from my, my you know, I talk about my parents more than I did before I was a politician. But um, for my dad, who worked in a factory of his life, the dignity and respect of earning his own wage in a sector that was working was really important to him. And it's, it's really important for working people across the country. So I've got nothing against redistribution. But I think that the idea of a model that requires us to say growth is there in some other place, what you get is a bit of the fruits with a bit of luck um, to keep you going, is a model that I don't think we can any longer countenance. I think it, if, you, if you look at the last 13 years, look at the divisions, the inequality, the whole concept of levelling up is built on an understanding that we can't go on any longer, turbocharging some parts of the country, some sectors, some communities, and leaving others falling by the wayside with just about enough to get by. That is, I fundamentally reject that model. I think it's the wrong model. I don't think it's a progressive model. Um, and it's not the model an incoming Labour government will come. Now, I know that makes life harder. And I know that in this room, and Torsten will be you know, looking quizzically at me as to how you're going to do that. And I accept that challenge. Um, and it means we need to do more. But I'm not prepared to shy away from that challenge. I, I think it's... I find it... I just... I guess I find it quite hard to understand what the there 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 is in this. Because you are... You know, you say it's fundamentally different. And for a couple of years, it seemed that the biggest difference was that you really, really wanted to borrow to invest in the green transition, which was, you know, you can argue about whether we could afford it, but it was a perfectly plausible big difference. You've now really given up on that. You talk about an industrial strategy. It's not quite clear what that industrial strategy adds up to. You said you must hand, hold out the hand of partnership to business. It's, it's supply side stuff because you don't want to do unnecessary spending. But what actually is it? Well, take industrial strategy. Um, every, when I say in my conversations to investors and businesses, we want an industrial strategy, we want a council that sits around it and we're going to put it on statutory footing, they say that's music to my ears. And one or two of them have pointed out to me, if you, if you Google, if you go to the government website and put in industrial strategy, there is literally the words written across it, archived. <laughs> archived. I promise you not, but I do it, have a look. That is a massive difference between us and the government. And that is, an industrial strategy obviously what operates first and foremost at the national level. What is it you're trying to achieve? What are your five missions, Kia? The reason I've set the missions out before an election is because I want those that I'm inviting to go in this partnership to look at the missions, put their fingerprints on them, to test them and to make sure that they're the right missions. Um, but also, in addition to the... You know, national strategy. We need a strategy in each of the sectors. Up in Aberdeen just two or three weeks ago look, with the oil and gas um, sector, looking at the transition that's needed there, the challenges that they want, what they want from government um, is different to life sciences where a, separate, a, a different strategy is going to be needed. Um, and that is the sort of understanding and partnership that we need to drive forward. There's all, but there is plan. I mean, planning's been a problem. No, it, saying planning's a problem is not a slightly eureka moment. Um, everybody's known that for a really, really long time. Nobody's done anything about it. Knowing that the grid takes forever to actually connect up anybody who wants to supply power is not a new problem. It's not just a problem here either. It's a problem in other countries. But the question is, are we actually coming up with the solutions to those problems and actually got the wherewithal to do something um, about it and to take the tough decisions that are going to be needed uh, in order to get this over the line? And to do it in a way which is true to a model of growth that does mean living standards rise everywhere across the country because I do not want to perpetuate the increasing inequality that we have in this country um, for a moment longer than is necessary. And as soon as um, we get the chance, if we're privileged enough to come into power, that inequality alongside our growth strategy will be absolutely um, in our sights. One last question for me because I know you want to take some more questions from the, from the rest of the media. Another um, phrase, words, that you didn't mention today were the EU. At least I don't think you did. Um, uh, not once. And you wrote in the Telegraph at the weekend, and I can't resist asking you this, you said the Tories have, quote, failed to realise the possibilities of Brexit. What exactly are those possibilities and, and uh, what um, opportunities would you grab? Well, look, uh, 
firstly, what I was talking about in my speech was the lack of growth in the last 13 years. And it is a mistake to think that um, uh, all of our economic problems are somehow the cause of Brexit. We've had flatlining on growth for 13 years, way before Brexit was a word, uh, way before there was a vote, and certainly way before we left. So it's a mistake to think that um, you know, the EU is, is, is a silver bullet. What can we do now that we weren't able to do before? Look, it's not a panacea. I'm not going to pretend that it is. There are things. I mean, I've just come back from um, Dubai at COP28, talking to, obviously, um, world leaders, but also businesses. Um, we can have a more agile, a quicker discussion about what we can do. There are certainly discussions in life sciences about some of the things that we can do. There are areas where we can move at speed with an agility that we probably didn't have um, before, and I think we need to make the most of that. Um, and you know that doesn't mean um, you know we pretend that um, you know there's that being outside the EU is is the absolute silver bullet that's now going to unleash growth because I don't think uh, anybody believes that to be true. Nor is it to pretend that the deal we've got is good enough because it's not good enough. We need a better deal than the one we've got. We need a closer economic relationship with the EU, our main trading. Partners. Now, that doesn't mean going back into the EU, and in all the discussions I'm having with international leaders, nobody's saying you've got to rejoin, but they are interested in what does a closer relationship actually look like. This report talks about a UK protocol based on the Northern Ireland protocol. Is that something you'd be in favour of, a UK-wide one? Uh, well, I do think that, I mean, the, the protocol actually was a big step in the right direction. Um, this was when our Prime Minister was beginning to look like with some, he was, was concerned and bothered by international relations and wanted to act with sort of in good faith. He, he sort of drifted away from that with the Greek Prime Minister and, and sort of breezing into, uh, into COP for a few minutes before he left again. Um, but um, the protocol was a step in the right direction. We said we'd vote for it as soon as we saw it because we thought it was. Now, whether that works across the whole of the United Kingdom, I, I don't know. But I do know that there's a better deal to be had um, if we do the hard yards of um, negotiating in good faith. Well, on that note, you must go and answer some more questions from other people. Thank you very much. Thank you. I've got a, uh, I've got a number of media questions that I know uh, various journalists are, are waiting to ask. So let me go through those. I think, Beth, I've got you down first. So, Beth Rigby from Sky. Um, Keir Starmer, you keep saying public services are on their knees, and yet now you're saying beyond small amounts of money Labour have already committed, a Labour government won't be turning on the spending taps after a general election. You know it will be a huge disappointment to many of your supporters. I have a really simple question for you. Can you at least reassure them that you won't be cutting any departmental budgets after a general election, or are some spending cuts still on the table? Well, but uh, let me take that in two parts. Firstly, on public services, look, I'm a massive believer in public services. I gave up five years of my life out of practice as a lawyer in order to run a public service, um, which was the Crown Prosecution Service. So I do care about, I believe in public services, um, and I know a thing or two about the constraints of delivering in public service, and I'm certainly not in the business uh, of, of cutting the funding, which is why the focus is so much on growth. What I would say, though, uh, is that we must never forget um, that our public services need reform. Um, I saw that for myself. Um, in criminal justice, which was my old field, it is perfectly true you can put more money in the top of your public services and you probably get a slightly speedier product, but you don't materially change it. You have to reform. The same is true now of the health service. The health service, uh, 75 years or so in, is facing very different uh, challenges to the health service when it was created. If it's to last another 75 years, and I want it to, I believe in it, and I'm determined that it will, then it's got to change. It's got to become preventative. It's got to be closer to people in their um, communities. Um, we've got to make much more use of, of data and AI. So um, on public services, yes, there's the question of how much money you put in, but there is equally the question of whether you've got the wherewithal to carry out the reform that is desperately needed. And for that to happen, Beth, just get this, because this, if that reform is to happen, we've got to break out of the silos of delivery and government. One of my biggest frustrations in criminal justice is that um, if you wanted to improve and to prevent crime, reduce crime rates, you had to deal with health, education, um, you know, 
uh, the uh, situations in which people were living. But that was all outside of the criminal justice silo, and therefore it never really got done. So we've got to do a different way of delivering. It is about money, but it's not just about money. Thank you, Beth. Can I go to uh, Dashini um, at the BBC? Thank you. Uh, just following up from Beth's point, really, because there is another chart which was circulated widely after the autumn statement, which showed that uh, some departments could be facing spending cuts once you take into account population growth and inflation of the greater size since the last period of austerity 10 years ago. Now, we can say we can spend money more wisely in the public sector, but you'll be very aware that many services are under much more pressure. They're already much leaner. So what assurances can you give people that in reality they are not facing a new age of austerity, that the level of services they're seeing at the moment will be maintained? Well, look, um, if you look at the record of Labour in government, what you see is a record of investing in our public services. We are, as a, you know, the, the austerity is something of this government. That is uh, the road down which they want. Um, we are a, a, a party that always invests in our public services. Of course, we're going to inherit a very difficult situation. There's no point in me pretending otherwise. It is obvious that the government is doing everything it can to salt the earth to make it even more difficult for whoever might come after them. By the way, that's not in the national interest. This reduction of government from the national interest into party interests is so bad for the economy and so bad for the country. Not thinking what's the best thing for the economy in two or three or four years' time, but how do I make my life, how do I make the life of Keir Starmer more difficult? They actually briefed out that the King's speech was all about making my life difficult. I don't care which political party you support. Government should never be reduced to that. Now, we need to reform. We need to grow our economy. But the record of Labour governments is always to look after our public services. Thank you very much. I've got Peter from The Guardian, I think. Peter. Um, Keir, I think if a voter was to read through the speech you just gave, they might very easily recognise your description of where the country is now. But when it came to reading the bits about how things are going to improve under a uh, Labour government, they might potentially find it a bit woolly in long term, things like supply side reforms, banking it all on uh, economic growth. Um, one of the things we've heard earlier from this uh, stage is that politics is about offering hope to people. If one of these hypothetical voters was to listen to the speech now, in, say, a sentence or less, how would you sum up how their lives are going to be better under two years of a Labour government? Higher living standards felt across the country, giving people hope, a sense that we have a direction as a country, a sense that we've got a government that wants to bring people together and has got a clear idea of where it's going, a sense that we need economic growth which is living standards raised, a sense that the change we need to make for energy, the transition, is not just an obligation, a millstone around our neck, but a huge opportunity to get ahead for lower bills, for security, for the next generation of jobs. A sense that the health service, which most people are really anxious about, will it last any longer, is in good hands and is going to be there for decades to come. A sense that young people have opportunities under a Labour government that they don't have at the moment. When you know, looking at the statistics to see that most working class children are going to be held back by the salary or income of their parents rather than their own talent is something I will never accept. And people knowing they've got a safe place that they can uh, work and play. These are, every time I test out our missions on anybody, almost everybody says, I want some of that. I want to go in that direction. And that's why we characterised it at our conference as the difference between 13 years of decline and a decade of national renewal. And Peter, I'll say one other thing that I do think is important going forward. The decade of national renewal is important. I accept your challenge. Beth put it to me at the beginning of the year, I think, when I did my New Year's speech. It's a challenge which always comes, which is, now that's all very well, but that's going to take five years. Uh, when am I going, what about this Christmas? What about this January? Why can't you do it by then? Um, and we have this with the waiting, with the NHS. Every year we have an NHS winter crisis. It's coming. It comes every year. Every year, the only thing we know is it's going to be worse than the year before. And in about January or February, watch for it this year, there'll be a bit of sticking plaster that's put on that gets the NHS through to about April, May, June when it gets warmer. 
and then we go into another winter crisis the next year. We can't go on with that sticking plaster politics. It's the lack of the fundamentals. Yes, some of these things take time. The home insulation scheme that was running, it started about 15 years ago, which would have massively reduced the energy needed to heat homes. That was cut 10 years ago by David Cameron, who said, cut the green crap. And we've lost 10 years because of that. So yes, some of these things will take time. But if all you ever do is say, I'm only prepared to do things um, that are relevant for the next six months, we will continue with decline for a very, very long time. We have to fix the fundamentals. Um, now, it doesn't mean we can't do anything straight away. I accept the challenge. We've got to help people with their energy bills now. I accept the challenge. We've got to reduce NHS waiting lists now. But we've also got to think in the long term. And frankly, the sticking plaster politics, the chopping and changing over the last 13 years has been the single most um, important um, reason that we're in the terrible state we're in. And I think most people across the country now think that nothing is really working. There's a reason for that. That's because we've done everything too short term. We've never been prepared to say these are the changes we need over a period of time. It's going to take time. The national bit of the renewal is to say to everybody, and this was something in my Telegraph article, which is to say, this shouldn't be tribally labour. If you want to fix your country and take it forward in renewal, if you believe in that project for your country, that national project, you can be part of that, whoever you might normally vote for. And I think there are many, many people who say, if you're prepared to fix and take forward and have an inclusive project for the country, I want to be part of that. Thank you, Peter. I'm sorry that was a bit of a long answer. Uh, Nick of The Telegraph. Uh, thank you, Keir. Um, I just wanted to come back to the answer you just gave then on the, um, the 28 billion green investment. Um, you said it's subject to the fiscal rules and uh, dependent on growth. So if, if growth is, is slower than expected, are you saying that that 28 billion figure is a target that you would like to achieve, but you will be sticking to those rules and therefore you might never actually reach it? Um, and just ever so quickly on the speech, in response to... To, um, to Beth, you said you're not in the business of cutting funding. Uh, after five years of a Labour government, will the state be larger as a proportion of GDP? Thank you. Um, uh, Nick, on the uh, 28 billion, we will ramp up to that um, and get to that in the second half of the Parliament. It is, of course, subject to our fiscal rules. That's not special to the 28 billion. Every, and talk to Rachel Reeves about this. Everything we do is going to be subject to the fiscal rules. They are the most important foundational stone. And not, this is not just about you know, going into an election. They're fundamental, and they're fundamental for a reason. Last year, we tried the experiment of unfunded commitments that would not be consistent with our fiscal rules. We tried it with Liz Truss as a country. And it didn't land well, did it? It caused huge economic harm. And who's paying the price? Whose mortgages gone up? Who's struggling with their energy bills? Who's struggling at the supermarket? Working people. I'm not prepared to let that happen ever again. And therefore, those fiscal rules are the foundation upon which we build everything. They're not a straitjacket for the 28 billion. They're a foundational stone for everything that we should do. Um, on, uh, and by the way, I'm confident, I'm really confident that we can make the investment that we need to within our fiscal rules because I'm confident that we're doing the work on growth that we need to do, um, which you would expect to have from a responsible opposition that doesn't know whether it's going to win the election, but knows that if we do win the election, we would be unforgiven if we hadn't done the planning well in advance. On your second question, look... There are at least two fiscal events before the election, I think, maybe one more before the election. And therefore, you know, for me to say what may or may not be the position in, in five years, I think, is, is pretty unrealistic at this stage. Thank you, Nick. Um, I think I've got Jack from The Times. Jack. Thanks, Keir. Um, over the weekend, you sung the praises of, of Margaret Thatcher. And I think some people in the room here would say that the policy remedy put forward here is, is slightly different to her economic strategy. I'm just wondering what aspect of her economic strategy you, you uh, aspire to the most. Yeah, what I was doing at the weekend in the article I wrote for the Sunday Telegraph 
was distinguishing between particularly post-war leaders, those leaders, those prime ministers, who had a driving sense of purpose, a mission, a plan to deliver, and those that drifted. And that's why I picked Attlee, who, of course, had um, a new Jerusalem as his mission, his plan, and, you know, and put in the foundations for the next 70 years or more. Um, Thatcher, of course, now it doesn't mean I agree with what she did, but you don't have to agree with someone to recognise they had a mission and a plan, in her particular case, about entrepreneurship. Equally with Tony Blair, a mission to change the Labour Party and put it in a position to seize the opportunities um, or, or, of the era as the turn of the century. And I want a mission-driven Labour government. I want this sense of driving purpose that withstands the inevitable sidewinds that any government gets and is clear and consistent over a five or ten year period um, because I think it's the only way we can deliver. I think it's the only way, realistically, other people are going to come alongside and invest in us because unless there's that clarity, it won't be there. So I was giving Margaret Thatcher as an example of the sort of leader um, who had that mission and plan. That's obviously different to saying I agree with everything that she did, but it is, I think, and it, I'll just finish it by saying, if you, what we've had in the last 13 years is, is the complete lack of leadership, complete drift, real drift. Where's, can anybody in this room def, define the mission of the last 13 years? What was it? What is it? Even now the government struggles to say what they want 13 years down the line. There's no sense of mission or direction. Um, and so I was using it in that way, and obviously that's provoked a certain uh, reaction in a number of places. Uh, thank you, Jack. And I've got Noah, I think, from The Sun. Thanks, Keir. You've spoken today and quite often about how um, crippling the cost of living crisis has been to so many families and, and people you know well. Um, so with that in mind, would you step in to stop the BBC licence fee being raised by 9% or by any percent at all? Uh, well, no, thank you for that question. I think this particular problem really is the government's um, in the sense that this is a decision that uh, Lucy Fraser, I heard her this morning, says she's about to take in the imminent future. So it is one for them. They've obviously, you know, they set out the approach they were going to take with freezing and then increasing. Um, and the anxiety is that they're going to break um, the promise that they've made. So that is one for them. Well, we will, I mean, you know, we, we will set that out as we get to the election. We're going to have to see what the government does um, first. Um, and, you know, like all things, it'll have to be set out in detail before the election. I'm going to wait to see what Lucy Fraser actually does, wait to see what may or may not be in a budget if we get to a budget um, early next year. Um, but I think in that particular case, this is a problem of the government's making and one that they're going to have to solve um, sooner rather than later. Thank you all very much. I think we've probably overrun our um, stretch, but thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Right. I hope you've all uh, enjoyed that. You know what the next five years may or may not look like now. One of the things that Keir Starmer would like, dear, apart from you beautiful audience, uh, he would like some political change. But that is a choice the country gets to take over the next year. But the country doesn't get to choose whether or not it has economic change. So that is where we are going to turn to next with our final panel. So if our panellists can come up, and David Willits is going to chair you through a great panel to talk about how should an economic strategy bring economic change back centre stage, given that it always, uh, it always will be there. And then after that, you're going to have a closing words, and then you get a last cup of coffee, and then you do get to go home, because it's a free country. Right. Great. Good. Well, welcome to the uh, final panel session of this conference on steering economic change. Uh, in some ways, I think the most important insight with which we began this whole inquiry was that 
contrary to all the stuff about how everything was changing all the time and all this pressures for instability, deep down, the structure of the British economy was not changing very much. If anything, changing less than in previous decades. That's why we called our interim report stagnation. And behind all the political change, the endless sh shifts in government, the changes in industrial strategy that we're hearing about on a, on a previous panel, the paradox is that the politics may be turbulent, but the underlying economic structure is surprisingly stuck. There might even be a link between those two phenomena. Who knows? Well, we're going to investigate that with our panel now. We are going to hear in a moment from Gregory Thwaites, who is the research director at the Resolution Foundation. And we have a fantastic panel. Uh, we've got, of course, Martin Wolf, who is chief economics commentator of the Financial Times. He's written an excellent book, The Crisis of Democratic Capitalism, which was going to be the title of our report, actually, until he nabbed it, and we had to settle for Economic Inquiry 2013 instead. Um, we've also got Professor David Edgerton, Professor of History at King's College in London, and Stephanie Flanders, Head of Economics and Politics at Bloomberg. Um, Greg, let's start with your okay. presentation. Over to you. Okay. Uh, so thanks very much, David. And thank you all for uh, making it this far. Um, you know, seven hours of charts is uh, pretty tough, but then on the other hand, like at this time of the year, when can you go seven hours without once hearing Mariah Carey? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to change that now. Right? So that was definitely some benefits. So Torsten showed you a little bit of ankle earlier, didn't he? About economic change. So, so we talked about getting growth up. Everyone knows what that means. Uh, that doesn't mean it's easy, but everyone knows what it means. We talked about getting inequality down. Again, that's very difficult, but everyone knows what it means. Now we're going to talk about steering change. So what does steering change mean? I'm going to give you the kind of the, the what of economic change. Then I'm going to give you the why of economic change. And then I'm going to give you the how, how of economic change. So economic change is industrial sectors of the economy uh, growing or shrinking, or it's firms growing or shrinking, or it's people, workers changing jobs. So you can think about it at the level of the sector, the level of the firm, and the level of the worker. And the first thing we need to do, now we've defined our terms, is get our facts straight. People talk a lot about economic change having accelerated, but in fact, that's not what's been happening. So I'm going to show you this chart. This chart, you can see time on the x-axis, and on the y-axis is like the fraction of workers moving from one industry to another every year, roughly speaking. And you can see that however you measure industries, we're, we're at a, a multi-decade low. So there's less change, not more, going on in the economy. And that's the first thing we need to remember. I could also show you a chart about change at the level of firms. So I could show you that the, the rate at which firms are growing and shrinking has slowed down. People call that business dynamism. It's about a quarter down since the uh, global financial crisis. And I could also show you a chart at the worker level. So I could show you that workers are switching jobs less quickly than they used to. So however you think about it, change is slowing. But, but why do we care about that? The reason is that change is where growth comes from, by and large. Innovation, the growing of large firms, people starting new jobs, people starting new careers. That's where growth comes from. And it's good, by and large. It can be traumatic, but it's good. Let me give you one example here, one piece of evidence. You can see here uh, that lack of change is going to have real costs to, to people. At the bottom, you've got the, the average pay increase of all workers. And then you can see how much bigger your pay increase is if you change jobs. It's even bigger still if you change jobs and sectors or jobs and regions. So this is just one of several things I could show you to explain why change is important. OK, so we've done the what and we've done the why. Now let's do the how. So the first thing we're going to need to do is reshape the industrial composition of our economy in the right direction. This chart on the x-axis, uh, the, the, the width of the bars is, is how many people work in each of these sectors. And the height of the bars is how productive they are, and that tends to be where all the money is as well in terms of pay, um, how productive they are uh, relative to the average. And you can see here that we've got some uh, really brilliant manufacturing, scientific and technical, ICT sectors, financial services, of course, um, on the right-hand side. 
And then we've got some very low productivity sectors, especially accommodation and food services, on, on the left-hand side. And the plan, basically, is we want to raise the average by shrinking those bars on the left and growing those bars on the right. That's going to bring the average up, right? How are we going to do that? First thing we talked about was effective large cities. So services happen in cities. Torsten told you that this morning. We need to power our cities up to get more space for this, more capacity for this, um, these, these bars on the right. Second thing, we need to have the right train strategy, which means um, finding a solution for our advanced manufacturing and then also taking the huge opportunities that we have from our um, services powerhouse status, world's second largest exporter of services, um, and using that to grow our export in services. So new services trade agreements. Last but not least, we're going to need to support investment. Um, in order to grow these sectors on the right, firms are going to have to grow, and that means investment. They're going to need the right skills, and that's going to mean investment in human capital, amongst other things. Okay, so I've, I've explained where the space is going to come for, from on the right-hand side. How are we going to get the resources out of the lower bars on the left-hand side? Not all of them, but some. There are some low-paid sectors, for example, like social care, which we really don't think should shrink. They probably need to grow. So this is another chart that Torsten showed you earlier today. And what these are, each dot is a country. And then on the x-axis, you've got how expensive leisure and hospitality is in that country. And on the y-axis, you've got how much of it we buy. And you can see you know, we're in the, the top left here. And, and, but the point is, as they become more expensive, people are going to consume less of them, right? So, so what we're going to do, what we're going to do is we're going to improve uh, in the strategy. It's about improving terms and conditions, uh, pay minima, um, and uh, as a result, possibly raising the relative price of some of these sectors like um, leisure and hospitality. And, you know, when we've been talking about the success of the minimum wage, we've been saying, well, how much of a cost of that can we bear? But what, what we should do is we should not think of that as a bug, but as a feature, right? So what we're doing is we're making these things more expensive, not only to improve the conditions for the workers in, in those areas, but, but, but also to create capacity for the economy to grow in, in, in better sectors, more productive sectors. So making them more expensive is, isn't just going to make the economy bigger. We think it's going to make the economy fairer as well. So what this chart shows you is different quintiles of the income distribution. So we've got the lowest income on the left-hand side and the highest income on the right. The red bars is like how much of this stuff people spend their money on. And you can see those bars are going up. So the richer you get, the more that you spend on retail, leisure, and hospitality. I'm sure that accords with everybody's con conventional wisdom. And then again, the, the richer you are, the less you get your money from, from that sector. So if we make the thing more expensive, we'll be doing um, more for the incomes of the people on the left-hand side, and that money will be coming in part from more expensive services that the, the people on the right-hand side buy. So not only will it be good for the economy in terms of growth, it's, it's about sharing that growth as well. So that's sectors. Let me talk about firms. We're going to need to see faster change at the level of firms as well. What does that mean in, in this case? Um, that means firms growing and shrinking. In particular, productive firms growing and small firms shrinking. That's what we need to see. This chart shows you why we need to see that. This chart, the height of the bars is how productive firms are at different points in the distribution within a given sector. So I've chosen ho wholesale and retail trade here. So you've got very productive uh, retailers, let's say uh, Aldi or, or, or Asda on, in the, on the right-hand side, and you've got less productive retailers on the left-hand side. And we need to see the less one productive ones shrink, the more productive ones grow. That means more dynamism. How are we going to get that? We need to have more competitive uh, pressure from a more open economy. So that means lowering trade costs, especially with the European Union again, and these services trade agreements. It means uh, more investment uh, and you know, the business environment getting tougher for poor, for poor performers. It means planning reform so that um, bigger firms can grow. They've got the land as well as the labor to grow. It means halving stamp duty, not just for workers and, and, and residential stamp duty, but also for firms, because stamp duty is a tax on assets changing hands, and therefore it's a tax on dynamism. We don't want to tax dynamism as much. Last but not least, the mantra needs to change from supporting small firms through lower taxes, for example, lower corporation taxes, 
um, lower uh, business rates to supporting young and growing firms. So there are some small firms which are going to be great firms or really valuable ones. And, and then there are other small firms that don't really deserve special support from the government. So we want to go young, not small. Last but certainly not least, I'm not going to show you a chart. I'm going to show you some words. So we don't just do, um, we don't just crunch numbers at RF um, and on the Economy 2030 inquiry. We also listen to people. And what we've heard from people, we've asked them, why aren't you changing jobs more? You know, there are better jobs out there. Why aren't you changing jobs more? And you get a different picture at different points in the labor market. So we've asked people towards the bottom of the labor market. And they're really worried that if they move jobs, the, 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 the capital that they have with their um, employer to give them a little bit of flexibility on their hours or the, maybe a few more hours is going to be destroyed when they move jobs. So we want to give them the courage to move the ability to move by raising those minima. So we've done really well on the minimum wage. We need to raise the minimum of other things like sick pay uh, and so on. Right? At the top of the labor market, you get a very different story indeed because we've seen that these people tend to have um, more humane uh, hours and conditions and so on. What they're really worried about is the downside. There's, because they're closer to the top, they're worried about how far they can fall. And so we need to have a new system of unemployment insurance in this country um, to give uh, workers um, a, a larger fraction of their earnings if they become un un involuntarily unemployed for a bit longer than the very low replacement rates we see at the moment. And you can see here from this quote that that's what's going to be um, a thing that's going to get the labour market moving at the top. So different things at the bottom and different things at the top. So let me just wrap up. Um, it's time now that we need, to, we need to start worrying about there having been too little change, not too much. And I hope you know what, what we mean by that now. So our task is to raise the capacity um, for highly productivity, so fatter bars at the right-hand side, um, alongside relative price changes that lean against lower productive sectors, so more expensive things at the bottom to create capacity at the top. We need to remove barriers to change for firms, like I said, for example, start halving stamp duty. Um, and then we also need more empowered workers willing and able to take risks, because flexibility is not the same as dynamism. We've focused too much so far on flexibility. What we need to see is more dynamism and more change, not less. And that's, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Craig. You can see in the Resolution Foundation, we've got a bit of a thing about the hospitality sector. <laughs> Sorry about that, but it is a um, sector that always appears in our analysis of what change should mean. Now, we've got three fantastic uh, panellists now to comment on this, and I'm also hoping, so do keep the questions coming, to take one or two of questions from our online participants on Slido. But Martin, let's start with you. Martin Wolf, your observations. Okay. Um, I've only got five minutes, and um, that's obviously ridiculous. And the, Terribly unfair. And the... And so I'm going to make basically two completely different points, so they are related. The first, I don't want to discuss in detail the uh, Resolution Foundation's st basic strategy, uh, because I intend to write a couple of columns on that. But, <laughs> but it is really important to understand what it is and what it, how, how stripped down to its most basic. It is... Um, People in businesses like consulting, uh, accountancy, financial services, and so forth, will expand dramatically to supply the world market, and in the process, supply us with all the foreign exchange we need uh, to live off. And these will, of course, be populated and run and by entirely high-skilled graduates they pretend they'll, some of them will be living in Manchester and Leeds, they won't. Uh, and, and these people will be taxed to the hilt and, uh, and both directly by the government and indirectly by pushing up dramatically the cost of labour-intensive services will be reduced by the unskilled people who will no longer have any participation directly or indirectly in international trade. And it is actually a model of the economy that you can imagine. I personally am deeply skeptical that it works for nearly 70 million people. But that, that's really what I want to say on that central issue. It has one other very big problem, 
which is those labor intensive, high skill labor centers, I'm looking forward to the reply on this, have the basic characteristic, they have next to no economies of scale, and you don't invest much in them because the, um, the basic capital employed in these businesses is human capital. So you do invest in human capital, but otherwise, who the hell cares? It's not machine intensive. Now, it could become machine intensive, but then it becomes AI driven. And in that case, it's a commodity and it ceases to be a relevant sector from our future. That's my first point. And the second point is when I thought about what I meant by change, not what the Resolution Foundation means by change, I mean, and now I start off, well, we want faster economic growth, less inequality among households, less inequality among regions, and we want a green transition. And we want all these things to happen pretty damn quickly. And to do this, and this is more or less rephrasing, we promote high productivity and high productivity growth sectors. We pro promote high productivity and high productivity growth firms. We increase relative wages for low wage people. We increase investment very substantially, both public and private. We increase savings because at the moment we already have a massive great current account deficit and how big can it get, um, which means less consumption, by the way. Uh, we increase innovation within and across sectors and, of course, we increase the supply of skilled people. And to do all that, over any moderately, moderately brief ten, um, um, time frame, which is, say, 10 years, we have to change almost every policy system you can imagine. That's the truth, in my view. Um, and that then gets to the question, how do we steer this? I have absolutely no idea, but certainly not with the political and governmental system we have. And that's where the, the crucial point about the policy debate. I didn't hear Mr. Starmer, and this is my very last one, I didn't hear Mr. Starmer, but I think I have a pretty good guess of what, he's going, what he said. And the one thing I can say with absolute certainty is that what will happen under him will make no appreciable difference on the many fundamental issues that I've just raised, because we're not talking about small change, we're talking about really big changes. And the, uh, the system we run as politically, in terms of government, and I won't even go into the corporate sector and all the rest of it, is just not capable of this. And that's obvious. And if we don't recognize that reality, we're not going to get any sort of change, steered or otherwise. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Martin. <laughs> um, we, uh, we look forward to the column, perhaps. <laughs> uh, I would just it's say... A terrific analysis. <laughs> By the well, way, the analysis is absolutely superb, and that's what makes it clear how big the cliff is yeah, that we have to climb. It is a very big challenge. Though I have to say, the analysis also tackles some of the issues you identify. I mean, I do if know. you look at what we show in our growth sectors that we do think, oh, well, we've got a comparative advantage, the evidence is that's where pay rises across the entire skills range. We've got a chart showing that. We even have a chart showing what happens to the price of hairdressing, and that shows how thorough we are at Resolution Foundation. But if you go to figure 58, you'll find some of part of the answer to Martin's very telling challenges. Now we're going to hear from... So because these people buy all those services. Uh, yeah, indeed, indeed. Yeah, indeed. Absolutely. Uh, now, we're going to hear from Professor Edgerton. Of course, David has written The Rise and Fall of the British Nation. Before that, he's written on, I think, an incredibly astute analysis of the changing shape of the British state, the warfare state, uh, from 1920 to 1970, and perhaps most relevant to our theme today, uh, a book with a brilliant title, The Shock of the Old, reminding us how much some of these old structures and arrangements hang around. So, David, we're very interested in your observations. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let, let me start by saying that I, I, I agree with, uh, with Martin that the, the, the changes that, uh, that, that are implied are really radical. Uh, but those, those changes sometimes do happen, even in British history. And uh, they particularly happened in, in the years 
1945 to the mid-1970s, years which conventionally regarded as, as years of uh, poor performance, even of uh, decline. But these are the years of the highest ever rates of economic growth in British history, the highest ever rates of productivity growth in British history. They are years of uh, increasing equality uh, between uh, incomes, between uh, levels of wealth, and between uh, regions. It's an extraordinary uh, success story. Uh, perhaps we should think about um, emulating that success. Uh, we also had higher R&D spend. We had an extraordinarily successful uh, energy uh, transition as well. What's not to like? Well, we don't like it at all. These are the years of uh, stupor we heard yesterday. Yeah? These are the years when um, the Labour Party was uh, in office for a long time. And supposedly this Labour Party was interested in taxing and spending. Well, actually, the Labour Party was a productivist party. It liked nothing better than uh, transforming the supply side of the uh, economy. Uh, and in fact, it finds echoes in, in what we've heard uh, today. In the 1960s, there was something called the Selective Employment Tax which was about taking people out of low productivity services and encouraging their deployment in high productivity um, uh, uh, manufacturing. There was also um, great interest in making uh, changes between jobs easier. Redundancy Payments Act, 1965. Hardly anyone knows about this, but extremely important. Yeah? Uh, so the uh, so, so these years were years of real change, and uh, Gregory showed us the, the structural change um, uh, uh, data. Extraordinary structural change uh, between the 30s and 1950. Uh, reasonably strong in, in the 50s and 60s. The 1970s, that decade we all love to hate. Extraordinary rates of structural change uh, long before uh, Margaret uh, Thatcher. So, um, back to the future. Uh, perhaps back to um, uh, taking taking our, our, our past a, a little more uh, uh, more uh, seriously. Um, what are the implications of, of that that point? Well, I think we need a, a richer, uh, more honest conversation. To quote somebody from uh, uh, earlier uh, today about what has happened since, and what has happened since is a, a decrease. <laughs> in all the things that we want to increase, including rates of economic growth. And I think we need to take that very seriously. Now, it's not the case that um, uh, we're simply uh, in, in, a, in a changed overall world. <coughs> the UK's position uh, in, in productivity relative to France and Germany, as a wonderful chart uh, shows, if I've read it, uh, or, uh, eyeballed it, uh, correctly. If you take the worst years of the 1970s, um, uh, uh, not the best one, the worst years of the 1970s in terms of relatively low British productivity, uh, essentially the story has remained the same in terms of comparative productivity to this day, with the exception of a period in the early noughties, which I think was a bit exceptional. In other words, there is absolutely no reversal of the British decline uh, compared to France and Germany, and of, and of course, uh, there never, was never going to be any chance of reversing the decline compared to China and India, indeed, to the rest of, um, of, the, of, the, of the world. So we need to understand what has happened to the British uh, uh, economy. Now, a very common way of thinking about what has happened is to say uh, uh, short-termism, uh, sticking plaster politics. I think this is very inadequate. Um, it's true that, it, well, it, 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 it is certainly the case that in the years from 1945 to the 70s, there was a lot of long-termism, building new coal mines, motorways, railways, electricity generation systems, and so on. But since 1979, we've also had an extraordinary long-termist set of programs. It's just that we, many people, and perhaps the majority in this room, didn't like them. Yeah? 
But we've had the deliberate pushing down of the replacement ratios of unemployment benefits. It didn't happen by accident or by people short term. They said, no, no, we're, we're going to take it down from 30 to 15%. Um, uh, there's been a deliberate pushing down of public investment. Again, it didn't, and there's been a bit of volatility recently, but the trend is, is very clear. And that's, that was a long, long term program. Uh, and uh, Brexit. Uh, that wasn't a quick fix for anything. That was a very long-term program which people devoted many, many years of their, uh, their, their lives to and, and are pushing through. So what we've got to think about is the actual policies uh, and how they've impacted over, over time and to uh, stop thinking in cliches. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, one, I have to say, this is a, a, a wonderful uh, report uh, both for what is in it and what is not in it. And I'll, I'll end on, 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 on this point. It's so pleasing to see a report that doesn't go on and on about manufacturing, that it doesn't go on and on about the UK being an innovation science uh, superpower, that we need more small uh, uh, businesses, that we need AI, that, um, that, we, that we really you know, are going to uh, be the innovation hub of uh, the world. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. There's a real recognition here that the UK is not a superpower by any measure at all, except perhaps legal services, uh, uh, libel services perhaps. Uh, uh, it, it represents 2% of world R&D, very roughly 2% of manufacturing. Yeah. That's not insignificant, but it's not superpower stuff. There's a wonderful recognition, therefore. That's not the way forward, and I think that is a major change from the, from the discourse both of the Labour Party and, indeed, of the Conservative uh, uh, Party. And there's a very welcome emphasis on, effectively, imitation uh, on catch-up. Yeah? It's an invitation, which I think we should all uh, take up wholeheartedly, for modesty, for recognising that the great number of our fellow citizens are having a miserable time and that we need a politics of improvement rather than a politics of grandi grandiloquence. But I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much uh, indeed, David. And that's a very interesting contrast, a reminder that indeed it is about catching up with um, some of com some comparator countries. Now, Stephanie, Stephanie Flanders, head of economics and government at Bloomberg, has been a shrewd observer of this changing <laughs> scene for a long time, including when she was at the BBC. Stephanie, your take on all this? Uh, well, I was kind of struck. I thought this panel was a really good idea because you've had all of these kind of highfalutin theory about how to make things, how to make change, you know, how, what needs to happen. And then there was going to be the nuts and bolts of forcing change on the ground, uh, with no disrespect to my colleagues, from two economic commentators and a historian. So I'm not sure whether, as Martin said, I'm not sure we really know how to force change um, on the ground. But I share, obviously, Martin's, since I have been around for so long, as David points out, I share that... Uh, <laughs> um, I share the sort of deep understanding of the path dependence of these things. And mm -hmm. it is also interesting to yeah. remember the 70s. And I was quite struck, actually, at the investment summit. Rishi Sunak's very much um, talked about for at least half an hour. Uh, investment summit last week, you, had work, you did have uh, global business leaders, of very high caliber, all in London, all praising the UK all day. But I promise you, all they praised all day were the same three things, the time zone, the language, and English common law. Mm -hmm. So those are still the things that we've got, yeah. and thank goodness they are still massive advantages. We still have a lot of people wanting to come to Britain, but if that is path dependency for you, I mean, we've had those for quite a long time. Um, and even you could say that rule of law has been a little bit you know, challenged at various times recently. Um, we spent all day talking about investment. How do you force investment you know, I think we've got some quite practical ideas about that. Um, I like just in passing an idea of in, about protecting investment the way you protect the NHS, and I think that speaks to sort of having a conversation 
and having some slogans around investment. But I do think you also, we would then have to be honest about what most of that investment is. It's maintenance. It's not actually exciting investment in new things, public investment. It's stopping mm. things from falling down and getting rid of holes in things. And I think that actually might concentrate minds and make people support it a bit more. Um, the focus on dynamism and the lack of it is obviously really um, important. And within that, certainly what's come through in a lot of productivity research, as we know, in the UK, is this lack of diffusion. And you see it a lot in, in the report, you know, the wide range, you know, just getting people even not necessarily even to best practice, but just halfway to best practice could have this enormous um, difference. How, I'm not sure we have, even the distinguished people in the audience, I'm not sure that we've got that many great examples of increasing diffusion when you've kind of set out to do it. Um, but I think probably just reducing barriers to dynamism. If you can't change what Britain is and you can't really change the whole structure of government, just reducing what's holding people back is probably a good start. And I would certainly endorse many of the things in the report, sort of basic things that I thought, I feel like I would learn when I was at the Institute for Fiscal Studies many years ago in 1992. <laughs> Uh, that was it that long ago something like that um, you know you don't want to have a tax code that actually encourages small not very successful businesses to remain mm. unsuccessful and small and yet we're still sort of doing that and choosing to do that a lot so I think that's a that's an important uh, point around that um, another big obstacle post Brexit is Brexit for a lot of these businesses and I enjoyed the engage the sort of just Danny's question to the leader of the opposition about seizing the opportunities of Brexit. Of course, one opportunity you have after you've left the EU that you didn't have before is to really bring quite a lot of advantages to the economy by getting a much better deal with Europe than you had mm -hmm. before. Um, and I sort of, I don't think you have to read very far between the lines in this report to see a sort of Theresa May's backstop, anyone? Mm -hmm. um, that the Labour Party didn't vote for, for probably lots of good reasons, but that's kind of what you're talking about when you talk about a much closer arrangement that effectively gives up some sovereignty with the good sector, but reduces some of those obstacles. <clears throat> and it's interesting that that wouldn't violate any of the promises not to go into a customs union and not to go into a single market, at least not technically violate those things. Um, and finally, um, and the thing that I do know a bit about, having worked with um, some city leaders uh, on these issues, is, you know, I think one, one, way to, one way to sort of feel our way on some of this, whether it's about spreading innovation or just being, being more dynamic, helping change happen, um, is by being really serious about that place-based strategy and the city's sort of mission for cities. And that isn't just about sort of focusing on the mayors or having Andy Burnham on the Today program more often. Um, I actually, I sort of basically agree with um, Tom, Tom Riordan, who was uh, speaking in the earlier panel, um, who said, you know, this can't be done from Whitehall. I think the only amendment I have to say to that is that you can't be done without Whitehall. You know, this can't be about just decentralising a bit of discrete power to cities. It's about what Jim O'Neill used to talk about many years ago, sort of having Team Birmingham, Team Manchester, sitting in Whitehall. I don't even agree with Andy Holday that it should be in Darlington. I think you need a much closer, um, and I don't know what that would look like, I don't think it's necessarily a separate minister or a separate ministry, but having teams in Whitehall who are th working with cities, their own city, thinking about getting to know what's going on in that city and thinking about what the kind of unexpected obstacles are that come from lots of different policies operating together. And it may not even be the sort of traditional growth policies that they don't have very much control over. You know, the 70 funding streams that actually are operating in relation to growth policies in, say, Manchester or, or Birmingham. I was talking to a, um, the leader of a, of a northern, uh, one of the larger northern councils the other day, and discovered something I didn't know, which they, ha they increasingly get a lot of very troubled children sent to them from the southeast who cost upwards of one million pounds to look after. 
and they're sent up from, from London because obviously it's, you know, they don't have the resources or it's too expensive to have this very kind of labour intensive support for these individual, this is not disabled children, this is, this is children who need constant safeguarding and mental support and other things. They sometimes have a team of four or five people working for them almost round the clock. Um, and those are, there's a lot of set of incentives that have encouraged that to happen and are in, putting an enormous burden on those councils. And I don't think anyone in Whitehall quite realises it's happening. And it's taking up a lot of their mental capacity as well. And I just think it's a sort of random example, but something like that, which doesn't even necessarily affect growth, is affecting the ability of those people in that council to focus on helping businesses, helping workers. So whatever we can do, I thought I cooked up with Tom Rawdon earlier, we could maybe, I think one of the things you could do is have much more interplay. None of us could think of a senior local government official who is now working mm. in Whitehall. Someone who's had a senior job running a city, actually maybe forcing them to then spend a year in Whitehall. There's my little plan, a little, you know, I'm sorry, Tom, you want to stop mm. being chief executive of Leeds, mm. you're going to have to spend a year <laughs> in, in Westminster, or, or at least have, or have a sort of mentor schemes, but something along those lines to just begin on that road that Martin talked about, of like changing the way we think about policy. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I must say, alongside all the, the wonderful resolution analysis we've had during the conference today, Tom's point that he needed to get Whitehall clearance to build a roundabout, it was, I thought, one of the most vivid facts that brought home some of the problems we face. And look, we have been trying in our report to be absolutely realistic. We're analysing revealed comparative advantage. We're not inventing things we think we're good at. We're trying to discern from all the evidence what the evidence suggests we're already good at. And your points about the English language and time zones and everything, absolutely time with that. So I think there's, the, I've just been looking at the Slido questions, and there's a, there's a Slido question that has come up from, at several points during the day, which <coughs> is about uh, where, exactly where the, green, the climate emergency and green growth fits into this. It was a point on which, of course, Keir Starmer was challenged because of the 28 billion. There are some people who are putting in questions just saying, how does this tie in with the overwhelming challenge of uh, the, the state of the environment? So I don't know um, whether, Greg, you want to make a comment on how that ties in with our analysis, please. I, I think uh, net zero runs throughout the report. Uh, and what we're saying on net zero is that it's, it's a necessary thing, but it's not going to be a drag on the economy. Uh, on the contrary, it should help, but it, nor will it be kind of transformatively good for the economy. Um, uh, where it fits into change is uh, that I don't expect it, uh, outside of a few um, sectors, to make sectors grow or, or shrink a great deal. What will happen is that some firms and will grow and others will shrink. Um, if you think about um, uh, car mechanics, for example, so electric cars just go, they don't break as much as... Uh, petrol cars, so that we're going to need to have fewer car mechanics and their, their training is going to have to be different. Um, in terms of construction, of course, people are going to have to learn to use new materials and techniques, uh, but I don't expect it to lead to transformative change um, beyond, beyond those sectors, however necessary it is. Um, there may be also some changes in economic geography, so um, you know, if we have a, a better offshore wind industry than we do now, perhaps a more domestic one, um, you know, there are, there are some places uh, in the country that can benefit from that. Uh, Martin? Yeah, I largely agree with that from my reading on this. It's something I follow quite closely. But there is one pretty important caveat, um, which is, is going to take a hell of a lot of investment uh, in the uh, medium term. Um, just to give one example, which is a pretty obvious one, which we have tried not to think about, is the retrofitting of our entire housing stock with a different heating system. Mm -hmm. This will be disruptive and expensive. So the way to think about it is, is I think that whatever its long-term growth effects are, will be, I suspect, pretty close to zero over a long term, from what I've seen, it's going to re require very substantial long-term increases in investment over something like a decade at the least. 
First of all, it's going to be fantastically unpopular. We haven't even begun to think how unpopular it will be. I've been thinking about what it will mean for my own home and trying to persuade my beloved wife to accept the complete destruction of the interior decoration to allow it. Uh, it's, but the more important point is we are, a, as I've made, the one thing we don't want to, we are a colossally saving short economy. Average savings rate is 13% of GDP. We have a with structural current account deficit are about 4 or 5% of GDP. If we're going to raise investment rates, let's say just by one or two percentage points of GDP, that increases the external deficit by 50%. Where are we, how are we going to fund this? Uh, and the, this basic refusal in any of our discussions to face absolutely binding macroeconomic constraints, or at least I think they're binding, is very dispiriting, and it applies here too. We are going to have to pay for this yeah. Yeah. in the medium term. It is absolutely a high investment and also high savings strategy. And I don't know if, if Stephanie wants to comment, and then, and then David. I mean, Mar Martin's made the, r the right points. I think it's... But there is a bit of a debate about this, about the politics of it, that, you know... As in these kind of circles, we tend to say, you know, you have to make clear it's not about it's it, you're going to increase investment and that means reduce consumption. You shouldn't sort of kid people that there's going to be lots of growth coming out of this. I sort of wonder you probably do need to kid people a bit on that front. <laughs> and and actually, that's why it's really important, this thing about it's about jobs. I mean... I, Ed Miliband has actually focused on this yeah. in a good way, the proportion of jobs in our renewable sector that are actually all just people making wind farms abroad, and then you have a few people who ferry them out, and then there's a very nice, you know, it has produced a lot of jobs, the servicing of the off offshore things. I've met some of those people, but, you know, I think that is what, if you're going to have that slight deceit or at least, you know, being economical with that aspect of, like, we're going to shift from a really high consumption to much less consumption, which I think is fine not to talk about that much, um, you have to at least be making yeah. sure that there are domestic jobs, and that's where you get into the retrofitting yeah, yeah. again. And David, do you, want, do you want to comment on this? Because, of course, it was interesting with your historical perspective that the, you know, the three leaders that Keir Starmer was citing, um, Attlee and Margaret Thatcher, certainly both of them got elected, and for the first few years of Margaret Thatcher and a lot of Clement Attlee's time, on a message about sacrifice, pain, necessary to go through this in order to achieve something better. And you've just been talking about um, previous long-term patient strategies. Do you think they are possible? Oh, yes. Um, but the question is, the sacrifice for whom? Isn't it? Uh, and those, uh, those two, two leaders had very different groups uh, uh, in, 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 in mind. Uh, and they also both had a, a message not just about uh, who they were in favour of, but who they were against. Um, I mean, Attlee was very much against selfish individualism, for, uh, uh, for example, and for the national interest. But these changes are, are, are possible. But the, the thing I'd add to the, the, uh, what's, what's been said about, about climate change is that it's not just a question of money, it's also a question of planning and, <coughs> and political consent. Uh, and local authorities and central government will have to have a, a, a serious plan. And we're a long way from thinking about that. And that as, a, as a substitute for that, we have this, this sense that what needs to be done is to, is to, is to create a new manufacturing industry and, and new innovations. The reality is that we're going to be uh, insulating houses with very old technology. We'll be installing heat pumps, which have been themselves around for, for a very long time. We are not going to be... Um, uh, 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 generating huge quantities of uh, carbon neutral jet fuel and uh, 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 nor are we going to generating lots of nuclear electricity and we're certainly not going to be building many British wind turbines between now and uh, and, 20, and 2030 so the, the, the focus needs to be on um, on on the domestic on on on, on services of one of one sort or, or or the other and just getting basic things done properly. Um, and I, I do fear that, uh, as, in, as has been the case for, for, for a long time, an emphasis on innovation is an excuse, actually, for, for doing nothing. Thank you very much indeed. I'm now just going to end this panel session with what may be the final resolution foundation chart of the day. Um, and this is 
Um, this, I think, is why the strategy is credible. You've heard already we're not trying to invent a different world. We're trying to understand what Britain is good at. We're also trying to shape a catch-up strategy. And what this slide is about is just what it would mean if we caught up with Australia, Canada, France, Germany, the Netherlands. First of all, if we just match their economic performance in terms of uh, achieving their levels of growth. Secondly, if, they, if we match their pattern of income distribution, uh, which would show then a group of losers at the high end of the income scale in the UK. Uh, and I sometimes think one reason why this radical debate doesn't quite happen, as way that our panelists have called for, is that when the top 10 or 20% of your income range are protected from the consequences <coughs> of being an underperforming economy, by enjoying living standards that match those of France and Germany, mm -hmm. and all the adjustment borne by the less affluent half, that does also skew your political debate as well. Mm -hmm. So the, the middle slide, the middle part of the slide is about what happened if you just shifted to the kind of income distribution they have, and the, th and the third part is what happens if you achieve both. So we are simply saying, ma imagine that we achieve the economic performance and the pattern of income distribution of those countries, uh, and it shows that there are uh, significant gains, obviously above all for the less affluent half of the population, but actually for all of us, by a pure catch-up strategy, simply saying we've got to match what other countries we're very familiar with achieve already. So I'm very grateful to our panel for their wise observations, and we all look forward to Martin's columns. <laughs> Thank you very much. And now, uh, right, up you come, Clive. That's all I was going to say anyway. So come up up here. Final words, and then we're going to promise you we are actually going to let you go home because it's not a hostage situation. Although I'm sure for some of you it's felt that way because we've been sat here since 9.30 this morning. Uh, and as Torsten says, we're hoping some of you don't have to dash straight off but will join us downstairs for coffee. We'd love to get your comments straight off the cuff. It's often the freshest, most helpful. Uh, this is a 290-page report. There's 100 pages more we could write, I think, based on some of the observations that we've had today and, indeed, some of the challenges that Martin and others have made here today as well. I'm just going to ask you to indulge me just for 10 minutes whilst we run through 10 key points that I think have emerged in the course of the day. 290 pages is almost impossible to showcase in the course even of the few hours we've had today uh, together. Uh, and uh, not everyone in this room, I think, will have the courage to tackle the whole report. Um, for those of you uh, that uh, declined to do so over your Christmas break, um, you will find in the agenda that we gave you today a summary of the 10 key points. And I'm just going to touch on them and give you my perspective of how a little bit of my own thinking about them has changed, actually, in the course of listening very carefully to the people who've given us commentary in the course of the day. I think I have no choice but to start with the problem. I know when I stood up this morning at 9.30, I said we wanted to move past the problem and towards solutions. I hope in the course of the day we've done so. But the reality is the problem's big, it's large, it's right in front of us, and ignoring it wouldn't be appropriate. So let me start just by restating what we meant when we set out two and a half years ago to have an economic strategy for the 2020s leading to, to, to 2030 and what we called a decisive uh, decade. We have to start with this comment. Britain has huge strengths. We're a rich country, uh, but we are in relative decline. We're becoming poorer compared to other countries that matter to us. We're now 15 years into that relative decline. We have seen half the productivity growth of many other advanced economies. Let me restate that. Too many statistics today. We have seen, over that 15 years, half the productivity growth. Productivity is what drives wages. That's the first point. The very first chart, I think, that Torsten put up on the uh, screen today showed what that meant to somebody who's living in what I would call a resolution foundation household. You know what we're here for. We're here for the living standards of the low to medium earners. That's what we've been after since 2005 when we were formed. For those people, a simple economic stat, like half the productivity growth of other countries, means 10,000 700 pounds a year not coming into their house. Later on, we'll touch on what's happened to some of those poorest people uh, in terms of rising costs. But 10,700 pounds less. That's the first point. It's a sober starting point. Secondly, 
the combination of that slow growth, but then also increasing high inequality, has now become toxic and cannot be tolerated any further. We had a number of different versions of how you might describe Britain's status today. Uh, but the one I liked the most was one of the questions put to Jeremy Hunt. Yes, Mr. Hunt, we do have a broken leg. The country is today in a situation where even normal households are 20% poorer than Germany, 9% poorer than France, and the ones I care about, low-income families, they are now 27% worse off than their counterparts in those countries. That is a broken leg. Number three, we cannot, cannot go on like this. Britain needs a new economic strategy, and it needs to avoid nostalgia and wishful thinking. It's not about standing up and announcing some kind of trickle-down nonsense. It's not also about announcing a return to the factory gate. Neither of those two past extremes of left or right have served us well. Neither are available as credible strategies going forward. Politicians need to get serious. The UK won't automatically become like another country we happen to like more. We are what we are, and we must work from there. Number four, what are we? We are a, su a services superpower. They're not all accountants, Martin. Some of them are hairdressers. Some of them make TV shows, like my daughter does. Others make things that could be sold abroad in terms of creative content. We are a services uh, superpower, and we need to build on that. A very large proportion of those services are delivered in the non-tradable sector. 10.8 million people in the working uh, population today. That's 34% of the working population, another group of Resolution Foundation households today, work in the non-tradable services sector. That, that group there can have, a life, uh, can have an increase in their living standards if we focus on our strengths as a services superpower. Number five. In order to make this come true, we will need to create growth space. Where is that space? Look around you. You're sat in London, one of the most densely populated parts of the United Kingdom. We need two more Londons. We've referred to them as Britain. Uh, sorry, we've referred to them as Birmingham and Manchester. Uh, we've heard a great case for Leeds on the panel earlier. The reality is, is whichever of those countries, and we've put out our own thinking as to why we think great investment should go in on a long-term basis into those two huge metropolises, but whichever whichever of the cities benefit from us allowing growth to happen outside of London, 69% of the UK population live in cities, cities and their hinterlands. Millions will benefit from a focus on investment and growth outside of the crowded southeast. Number six, it's about investment. This is number six, but it's also number one through to ten. It's about investment. You know, over the past four decades the UK has had the lowest investment rate of the G7. I'm going to do it to you again because we've had too many statistics. Please let me say that twice. For 40 years, the UK has had the lowest investment rate in the G7. You know, it's Warren Buffett, that great long-term investor, uh, who said once that when the tide goes out, you can see who's been swimming naked. Well, the tide went out in 2008 in our country, and we realized we'd been swimming naked. Uh, and at exactly that moment in 2010, rather than invest to correct what had been 25 years of underinvestment at that point, one of the greatest acts of economic illiteracy called austerity was launched in this country by a group of people who you would have thought had the nous to read a book written by our greatest British economist, Keynes. And whilst the rest of the world was launching stimulus packages and putting investment in in order to, to foster a recovery, our country literally went the wrong direction. And so in addition to the 40 years in general, we've had a real cut and a real squeeze on investment, and that is why we need to focus on reversing that. We need to find ways to get, generate the savings necessarily. Martin made the point about our low savings rate in this country. We need to unleash the powers of our very large pension schemes in this country in ways that allow that investment to be found and put behind, uh, um, put behind shovel-ready projects that can actually yield a, a return. But investment is the key. When I say it's one to 10, I'm not joking. If you have to only remember one thing from the day, please make it that this needs to be an investment-led recovery. Number seven, in growing the GDP, people must come too. Again, another chart that Torsten put up in our, in our overview. 
You know, low earners today remain precarious, and we need to make certain that they benefit from any economic growth and any recovery of the next decade. A couple of statistics already that emerged in the day that I would just like to remind you of. Did you know that today you can, be, you can dismiss a shift worker with less than a week's notice? This is Britain, by the way, not some Victorian awful smoke-stacked country. This is modern Britain, 2023. You can dismiss a shift worker with less than a week's notice. Did you know that if you get sick in this country, you live on 44 pounds a week? Anyone in this room know how to do that? We need to carry with us working people on this move towards recovery. Some of this is about passing new laws. A lot of it's about enforcing the laws we already have. We have one jobs inspector for every 30,000 employees in this country. How are you going to catch them? How are you going to catch the people who are indulging in wage theft or who's squeezing people through not giving them notice when they change their shifts so that they just can't get childcare? How are you going to catch them? Let's fix that. This is simple stuff. We have to carry workers with us. A decent society, point eight, would not let others fall behind either. Benefit cuts since 2010 have now reduced the incomes of poorer households by nearly £3,000. I just want to go back to it. Working low-income families have suffered a £10,000 missing amount of wages, and people on welfare, welfare are £3,000 a year worse off than when this country uh, uh, engaged, as I said, in an act of economic illiteracy and chose in 2010 uh, to, against the, the direction of all other advanced nations, start cutting rather than investing. And so we need to focus on the fact that shared prosperity means that working age and pensioner benefits need to rise with wages in the future. And part of the democratic construct, part of the shared social contract, is to carry people with you, not just to shoot for growth for the very, very top. Part of that, I'm afraid, will mean a look at the hard, complex area of taxes. We know they're high. We know they're an 80-year high this decade. But they haven't actually been addressed in the way they are levied. And we need to fairly tax sources of income other than just hitting the working family harder and harder again. You know, my favorite quote by J.S. Mill, and forgive the slightly Victorian moralizing tone of this line because this is a man who died in 1873, he said the following. The property owner, let's say the man who has assets, and the welfare recipient are morally equal, for they both derive their living by the sweat of another man's brow. We're here for working people, and working people absolutely need to not get another tax rise, but wealth owners and wealth uh, people who own stores of wealth uh, that, that mean they can go into every year on January the 1st already knowing what their living standards are going to be. Wealth taxes, whether they start with property in the way that it's laid out in the report or move their way into a more generalised way of taxing wealth in the future, are going to need to be addressed. It's one of the answers to the question, where does the money come from? Higher growth and taxes are needed to do three things. First, to raise investment. Secondly, to rescue public services from over a decade and a half of underinvestment. And third, to repair the public finances, because we can't act as if the financial markets don't care what we do with our money. They do care, they are watching, and we will need to be careful. Finally, and I end with really the point that David just put up on the screen, we have huge catch-up potential. And this report soberly has chosen as its target not the full catch-up of the £10,700 that we've talked about in lost wages. Instead, we've shown you what a composite Britain, an economy that's largely formed by Australia, Canada, France, Germany, the Netherlands, all of which, when you're putting together, have got broadly similar characteristics in our model, would see us if we could catch up on their average income and we could lower inequality in our country to their level, allow the typical household to be 8,300, not 10,700, 8,300 pounds better off at the end of this decade. That's 25% better off. It's a huge target, but it's actually one we should commit to. There is no excuse for fatalism. Britain has huge catch-up potential. We are in a decisive decade. This stagnant chapter of British life has gone on long enough. It's now time to turn the page. Thank you for your time today.
and it is time and it is time to drink the coffee. So can, can we just give one last clap, which is to the tens of people in the Resolution Foundation and the London School of Economics that have slaved for the last three years on delivering 70 reports, conferences up and down the country, the conference today. So can we give them all a round of applause for them? And off you go.